uh, April, and welcome to all councillors and staff members, managers, and to the public that may be tuning in, and of course the public in the gallery. Uh, we've got a bit to get through today. We've been asked the question in relation to lunch and dinner, which we envisage to have at appropriate time throughout the morning. So we'll work towards that, encourage our debate through the agenda today. So um, call the meeting officially open and if there's any leave of absence or apologies, I don't believe there is so, apart from manager Susie Jarvis uh, today, but there's no others. We'll continue on with item three, recognition of traditional owners and call on Councillor Duff. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Thank you, Acting Chair. <coughs> I'd, oh, Chair. I'd like to acknowledge country and the traditional owners of the land where we meet this morning, the Waka Waka land, and acknowledge the elders both past, present and emerging. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Item four on the agenda, any declaration of interest? Does any councillors have any declaration of interest through the agenda? at this point in time. If not, I'm sure as we work through the agenda, if something comes up, please notify uh, myself and uh, members if that's the case. We'll move on for confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting, uh, 5.1 on page six. Do we have a mover of that? Councillor Duff, thank you. And a seconder, Councillor Jones, thank you. Uh, have we any conversation or discussions on those minutes? No, no conversation or discussion. Oh, I've got one question I'd like to... That one, if the first one is the uh, veracity of the minutes, if there's any inaccuracies, and then discussion, business arising once you get this one done. Thank you, Mr CEO. All right, so we have the confirmations mover and seconder. All those in favour? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. Number six with notices of motion. 6.1 is on page 33. And that is the notice of motion in relation to the KTP pedestrian visibility and PWD shop access. Do we have a mover for this motion? Councillor Otto, Mayor Otto, a seconder. Councillor Duff, thank you. The notice as it reads, the committee recommends to council, council offers, officers investigate community concerns as to the Kingaroy Transformation Project, green infrastructure causing traffic visibility problems for those using wheelchairs slash mobility devices when entering pedestrian crossings. And dot point two states, council works with shopkeepers in the Kingaroo CBD to investigate options for DPWD access. Uh, Mayor Otto, that's your motion. Would you be prepared to speak on that? Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, look, I've met with a, a senior member of our community, a community leader uh, who is himself uh, uh, a person living with disability and uh, he raised these two issues with me um, in terms of particularly wheelchairs coming into it, entering pedestrians, where the height of the actual greenery is such that, shrubbery is such that motor vehicles can't see people uh, who are in pedestrians, obviously they're lower. Um, so that's creating an issue in terms of visibility, creating some safety concerns for people using uh, wheelchairs and mobility devices, uh, and also uh, indicated that there are still some of the CBD shops, and of course this isn't council's area, but uh, wanting to know whether council could perhaps continue some discussions in relation to some of the shops in Kingaroo where there are still, uh, I suppose, uh, height barriers, ledge barriers, where uh, people with mobility devices or in wheelchairs can't get access to some of those shops. They would like to shop in the CBD, uh, but in some, type, some cases that's not possible. Um, so it was really just to, uh, I suppose, get the support of council to uh, instigate a process of investigation into these matters, uh, hoping that our staff could perhaps work um, with the local community uh, to address uh, some of these issues if it's appropriate. So that's really all I had to say. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor Otto. Do we have any commentary from Manager Mann? Thank you, Ma Manager. Uh, yeah, through the Chair. Uh, the first one definitely um, that the Mayor and I did discuss this a couple of weeks ago, we've commenced cutting down some of those, uh, not cutting down, but lowering. Uh, some of the, the growth in there, and we have met with the Parks and Gardens team to 
look at alternatively um, putting in a, an alternative. They're not the trees, it's the, the actual shrubs or the bushes that have grown a bit high on a couple of the crossings, so that's well underway. Just with the second one, um, the, the only caution I have for, for councillors, James and myself and our team are not qualified to, to provide advice around the alteration of internal access in buildings. Um, so council would have to outsource that if they were to um, provide that advice. Um, just, just the old, yeah, we're not, we're not in that space, unfortunately. We, we wouldn't be able to provide that advice ourselves. So just whether council wanted to outsource, that would be your only, only um, probably avenue to, to deliver that. Um, and yeah, that was probably just my only feedback, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Uh, Councillor Potter. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Look, I don't know whether I'm ready to spend the money to outsource that one, but maybe that's something we could discuss with Mr. Mayor, the um, King Royal Chamber of Commerce, um, whether it's something we can, you know, we can have that discussion with the King Royal Chamber of Commerce and possibly actually take that conversation further to Nanango, to Blackbutt, to, to Wondai and to Mergen because, you know, we're not the only town that has um, businesses that people are unable to get into. So I think it's that conversation that should be had through all of our towns um, with all of our business development associations with regards to people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Councillor Schumacher. Um, thank you, Chair. Just a couple of questions. Just when the KTP project was actually underway in the main CBD, um, it was my understanding that conversations were had with business owners at that point in time around how they may be able to bring their shop front entrances up to standard um, at their own cost. And just would like to, it was some time ago since I was on the street talking with um, shop owners, just would like to refresh my memory. Uh, yeah, through the chair, um, you're right, Council. We did have a discussion with um, businesses around um, altering their access. Not so much technical advice from us of what they had to do. We did, the ones that were done were done by a registered builder. Um, so we did walk through with each of the businesses at the time and just explain to them what we could and couldn't do to help them if they wanted to alter their access. At that time, we could actually lift our ramp slightly for them. Um, so some businesses took that up. I think for a lot of them, it's just a, it's a cost exercise. And what we found in the CBD, which I think most would appreciate, the business owner is not always the building owner, um, which is you know, uh, probably a hurdle that they need to work through to, to get that investment made if they wanted to. But we um, it, we, we always directed them to an out, to a builder for that sort of work. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just in relation to item one around <coughs> the um, green infrastructure, the pruning of the shrubs, it's my understanding, I've actually seen Parks and Gardens crew out, it's my understanding from what you've just said that that, um, has, uh, that request has actually been actioned. Yeah, through the chair, that's right. There's still a couple more to do. Um, we've spoken with the parks team and asked for a couple of those to be to swapped out. There's a there's different shrubs that come at different heights, so we've asked for some of the higher ones on those pedestrian crossings that are closer to the trees to just be cut down in the first instance, and then replaced with uh, or replanted with a lower shrub um, at at the time that they is is yep. best for the tree, I suppose, to, for them to plant. So. Um, I've asked Matty to keep it quite low until there. There is a couple there, I think, near Prices Plus that I went through, which is still a little bit high, um, but they'll follow back to, to clean those up. Yeah, thank you um, <clears throat> for the information. Through you, Chair, I'd probably challenge the relevance of this motion, being that the item has already been actioned and um, being that we've received advice that our staff cannot provide technical advice about how um, shop fronts or guidance or direct them as to how beyond what we did through the KTP project, um, that decision to upgrade the entrances really is sits with the building owner and the shopkeeper. And um, so my concern would be that we're diverting council staff um, to try to organise something that potentially we can't deliver on. And I would rather see our, our resources used more um, in issues and areas where we can actually deliver. So I'm not supportive of this motion. I'd probably call for it to be withdrawn on the fact that it's already been actioned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. I'll go to Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Chair Henshin. Um, yeah, I, I'm supportive. I, I, I'm probably thinking maybe rather than the Council uh, works with shopkeepers in the Kingaroy CBD to investigate options, maybe works with um, talks to the Kingaroy Chamber 
as to options to investigate for PWD access, because I do think it is an issue. It's an issue, as Councillor Potter said, right across our region. I know when we did the Mergen CBD, there was a lot of discussion around what you can and can't do, but obviously council staff, once we've done the, or contractors, once we've done the footpath, you can't really change the levels, but it's then more of an internal alterations, which is always going to be the, at the cost of the um, shop owner. But I still think it's a conversation that needs to happen because there's so many people wanting to be able to get access. And if we don't, if we, as community leaders, we need to drive that because otherwise if um, the mayor's had meetings with some people who have got issues, like I think it's, it's um, not, uh, like it's irresponsible of us just to say, okay, that, let's just drop it and not even put it in, as put it forward. So I'm think that this needs to be given legs. I, I've also had um, concerns raised with me just around the post office there that where the before the wheelchair <coughs> access was in Alfred Street and now it's in Kingaroy Street that it's much more challenging for them to because they're sort of going out into where there's a lot more traffic. So whether that can be is something that can still be looked at, it might be too late. We've already sort of committed to that one, but I have had complaints about it. It's just they liked it better when it was around the corner. So just that kind of stuff. I was going to send that through as, a, as an actual customer request, but I don't know where, where that would land because you've already done it, but I still have had it raised with me. So I think there's still issues. So I'm keen to get this right and to make sure that we keep it alive and actually deal with it rather than just say, let's just, it's, all, it's, a, done, it's a done deal. Because like I said, the mayor's still got people concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Councillor Erkins. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, I think that the trees, it's also the responsibility of the public, the pedestrians or those in um, wheelchairs or, or um, walkers or whatever, you know, it's up to them also to take some responsibility and check to see if there's traffic coming down. You can't just rely on the traffic, on a driver to see them, they have to take some responsibility themselves. And I was under the impression that the whole of that Kingaroy um, area was to make it more pedestrian friendly and the plants, I believe, do that. So, you know, I do think, sure, you know, make sure that they're not um, posing a, a, um, a danger, but I still do think that it is up to pedestrians or street users, those on the street, to make sure that they're... Because I've seen a lot of people in those mobility scooters, they don't look, they just go straight across the road. And, you know, a driver's there looking for other things. You're looking for kids running out. You're looking for all sorts of things. So I think the responsibility lies both ways, not just with the drivers but also with those using the um, street. As to the um, access... You know, some buildings, it is really just about impossible. I'm just thinking of in Nanango, there's a, quite a slope on the streets in Nanango, so without actually coming out onto the footpath, it's pretty difficult to be able to allow access into a building. And to say, to be able to do it into the building, you know, it takes a lot of area then away from a building. And if you're a renter, you would have to get permission from an owner, and some owners would be, if they're charging rent on the square metre, if you're taking area away from them. So, I, you know, I agree with um, Councillor Potter. I think it's something that we should maybe look into, maybe with the different chambers and business groups, but I don't think it's just an easy um, thing to accomplish. Maybe, um, you know, if we worked around that, and maybe some... Um, whether it can be put onto footpaths, I don't know, but that's, for some, that's the only way you're going to be able to do it is come onto um, council footpaths. Thank you, Councillor Erkins, and I'll come to you in a minute, Councillor Potter. I just, a question to Manager Meehan, it was brought to my attention in one of the towns some six months ago about the gradient of certain footpaths and entry into shops with a PWD. Is it correct in saying that a PWD has to actually be level, even though the gradient of the shot of the footpath may, for argument's sake, be four degrees or, or a figure. Is there a regulation around that? Uh, 
uh, through the chair, there is there is standards for the application of, of footpath entrances and um, building entrances. So um, the footpath's a little bit different. It, there's, it's governed by fixed levels within a road and those sort of things. So it, there are um, there are guidelines for that. When it comes to the entrance of a building itself, um, similar to what I put out last week, the building access code applies. So there is enforceable regulations once that building is altered that it must meet those standards. So whether it's level or, or angled, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not across that code of internal works, but um, there is there is a, a very specific code that replies to um, alteration of buildings um, in relation to those. So, Okay, thank you. Councillor Potter. Yeah, thank you. If the, um, the, the mover and the seconder agree, I'd actually like to change the second dot point um, that the South Burnett Regional Council work with South Burnett Business Groups um, to discuss, I'm still not quite, I'm still working on the wording here, to discuss um, PWD access and options of funding, maybe. Um, I'd probably, I'm not 100% sure, but whether this would sit with um, GMMA, whether this would sit with Tonya, our business person, whether that's something she could do or whether... So I'd probably get a bit of direction there from um, GMMA as well, if you don't mind. Yep, thank you, Councillor Potter. And just to add on that, and I, I probably know the answer to this, but is there any possibility that negotiations with the Chamber of Commerce and the facade improvements, that anything could be implemented through that process? And I know then that the people that at the moment aren't eligible for that may feel disadvantaged by that so hence is why I think I've answered my own question but is that a possibility that as Councillor Potter has said to enter into talks with business owners and cap the Chamber of Commerce? Yeah through you Mr Chair um, yeah we don't well, we, we, we could enter into those discussions but as you mean talked about they are obviously individual owners building owners and, and whether that's the actual tenant of the shop or, or the building owner. So there is a conflict between structural changes um, that the tenant may require versus the owner. Um, yeah, the facade improvement, we we'll just need to take that on notice. I think like there is, that is probably changing the scope. That would need a bit of investigation. So I probably wouldn't really want to comment into, into that funding. Um, yeah. But... Yeah, thanks, Manager O'May. Um, Mr Mayor, being the mover of that, would you consider that dot point two that Councillor Potter has uh, suggested there and being your motion, you're happy with that? Yeah, all right, thank you. If there's no more commentary, question? Yeah, Councillor Duff, sorry. Yeah, Councillor Jones. Yes, thank you. Um, as Councillor Shoemaker indicated and General Manager Meehan has, well, in indicated point one has been activated upon so I, I can't see the need for that to be left in there council works with the South Burn business groups uh, fully support that so I'm just wondering whether or not the mover and seconder would consider because it's been actioned upon I can't see the real need for it to be in there and uh, my view on that uh, access to the buildings we've gone through there the people have spoken to the business owners in the main street of Kingaroy in particular where this particular one is uh, has been raised, and I uh, I fully support um, the people that are with disability and all that sort of stuff. And um, with the uh, with Councillor Herkins's comments in regards to yeah, everybody needs to take uh, careful uh, consideration when they're crossing roads. But uh, if you're in a wheelchair or anything like that, and you, your vision is impaired by vegetation or something like that, I think we are committed to making some sort of a change there. So uh, on, as I already said. General managers indicated that uh, that has been actioned and that's already being addressed. So I'd be more than happy to, um, if mover and seconder would consider taking just dropping one out and and uh, working with the business groups, I guess. And owners do need to take responsibility for it. It's it's an access to their own business, and the issue will be between the leasee and the owner on who's responsible for paying it and all that sort of stuff. So yeah. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Just to manager, I may. Yeah, through you, Mr Chair. I just had a question where 
just probably clarification where council works with the business group. So if we we can, I suppose, look for funding, but again, we won't be able to provide advice on, as as GME and said, we won't be able to provide advice on what's required and and that on them. So we just have to be. I suppose it's clear that we're not going to be able to go and give them advice on what they need to do to retrofit their shop. Um, so, yeah, we can look for funding opportunities, but while, while there isn't, if there isn't funding available, I'm just not sure what our team will be able to achieve and going to talk to people about an issue that we haven't got a solution for. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Schumacher. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Councillor Henshin. I absolutely want to see people with disabilities being able to access every storefront in the South Burnett. I think that is fundamental and I do agree with Councillor Duff as community leaders. We do need to raise the bar and I feel the KTP project and others such as what's been done in Mergen, Cumbia and Blackbutt has all definitely tried to improve pedestrian access as much as council can actually invest in those facilities. But right now, we're actually looking to the building owners to make an investment um, in, in fixing up their accesses so that people with disabilities, all people can access um, their storefronts. My concern is that business is doing it really tough. Um, I've had a number of business owners say to me they just can't take one more thing at this point in time. I am concerned that we would be taking valuable resources from already dedicated council programs and council work to go and have conversations with business groups in which we can't deliver any result other than what we've done. I don't feel this is the best use of our time and our resources. As community leaders, I absolutely think we should advocate and we all attend, you can attend a business breakfast or a business meeting in our region nearly every week of the month across the South Burnett. We have an opportunity to raise this at those tables as community leaders. I do not feel and I cannot support taking our staff from dedicated work and, and sending them off to have conversations in which we know we, we cannot make any immediate change. Uh, I think it's a waste of resources. And while I think it's a very important subject and something that we definitely need to advocate for, I don't think it's something that we can actually influence any 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 real change by sending our staff out there to do that work for us. We as community leaders need to be doing that work, um, listening to business. I know through the facade improvement program discussions that I've had with a number of businesses across the region, many of them um, are struggling to find that money to actually invest in their shop fronts. And we also have... Uh, this, the real issue is where we've got a lot of old money in Kingaroy, a lot of people who have owned buildings for decades, for instance, and I only know this because I am the Kingaroy councillor, so I spend quite a lot of time on the street, and I know they're struggling to get the, the leaseholders, the business owners are struggling to get some of that old money to see an opportunity to invest in their buildings. So I, I don't support this motion. I don't support diverting our staff from important work that they're doing to go and try to have more conversations which won't <laughs> land with an outcome. I personally think we as community leaders can do that work. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Quickly, Councillor Erkins. Um, just to draw attention to the fact that a lot of businesses are not actually members of some of those business organisations. So if we're going to, to, to do that, it's a big job. You'd have to um, discuss um, with individual property owners, I believe. Councillor Duff. Oh, uh, thank you, um, um, Chair Henshin. Just thinking maybe then uh, to address, well, I know it's the, the Mayor's um, motion, but I was just thinking perhaps if Council continues to investigate and work with community, to address community concerns, that just sorts the issue that there, it's already happening, but there's still some work to be done. And then we change it to councillors, work with South Burnett business groups to discuss access rather than council. So it's councillors go out and advocate because then, then the motion is still with, we're still, um, still alive and something that we're all going to be conscious of rather than just going, oh, let's just drop it. So uh, that's just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. 
Mayor Otto, just in <coughs> relation to the motion, as Councillor, jo as Councillor Jones has suggested, with dot point one being activated, would you consider uh, that dot point two perhaps stays and dot point one be removed, being activated? Yeah, probably. Well, if we can wrap this one up, um, just by saying that you're happy to take out point one, uh, Mr Chair. Um, on the understanding, though, that if I do have further conversations with people living with disability in our community, after that work's done, and they still feel concerns, I will bring it back to the Chamber, so we will have to deal with it again. Um, but I would like to be satisfied that we have gone back to those people. I'm happy to go back to those people, particularly one person, um, and, and just make sure that they are comfortable with what we've done. Um, I am keen to see us pursue some of those replacement programs, general managers, so that we're not having to go back and create extra work for our parks and gardens team to have to be consistently hedge trimming those shrubs. It's not the trees, it's actually the shrubs. Um, so I think it's, a, it's the choice of plants. So what, these, what the people were really saying was, can we plant something that is just low growing so that we don't have ongoing maintenance issues? But if we're able to maintain them without a lot of work, that's fine. Just wanting to reduce the workload for our parks and gardens staff and make sure that people with, with uh, disability as well as children, you remember some children are only this high, this high, and if there's a plant this high and they can't see a car coming and that child enters onto that pedestrian, the car may not even be able to see them in behind the shrub. And I agree with Councillor Jones. I think, Councillor Rickens, we've got an obligation, surely, a duty of care, to make sure that there is clear visibility for all of those entering our pedestrians. Um, but I'm happy to take point one out because clearly once I've put this notice of motion in, it's activated some work to be done since this was put in, so I'm happy with that. Um, but if we could, and I'm then happy to go back to the A's with the relevant parties, just to make sure they're comfortable with what we've done is, is from their perspective meets their needs, because I think it's easy for us to, stay, to sit here, because we're not people living with disability, so I don't want to speak for them. I think we should allow them to speak as to, as to whether or not they're comfortable with what arrangements we've put in place uh, from their perspective. So but happy with that. Um, in terms of the second point, I'm just wondering, in light of the comments, whether, Mr Chair, we could put there that council rights to South Bennett business groups articulating the strategic priority stated in our corporate plan, uh, articulating the strategic priority in our corporate plan relating to making our town's communities of choice for people living with disability. And encouraging them to engage with their members and CBD businesses as to opportunities for improving PWX, PWD access. Full stop. Thank you, Linnell. Um, I guess, committee, what I'm suggesting there is that rather than creating a lot of work for our council, uh, we've probably got what have we got, um, five or six? We send five or six letters out to the secretaries of those groups and we allow them to have a conversation as a business group as to how they might like to manage it in their own town. Some might like to go and do a walk around, some might like to send letters out, um, some might like to do some social media promotion, but I wonder if we could just leave it to those business groups to do it um, rather than council getting involved. But I think it'd be nice if we could at least articulate to them that this is in our corporate plan Making our region communities of choice for people living with disabilities is something we all signed up for as one of our big rocks for this term of council. Um, and I understand that it's really tough for a small business to find the money to spend on a building, particularly when you don't even own the building. Um, but what I'm hearing from some of the people um, with disability is that, well, we'd actually go and spend money in these shops. For, for example, there's one shop at the moment on the main street that they want to go and buy product from but they're going over to the shopping world to a competitor because they can't get in the front door. So it might actually, over the long term, be a good investment because they might actually get more sales by getting people. And let's face it, we've got a high percentage of people who do live with disability 
in Kingaroy and in the South Burnett, and if it was me, I'd be wanting to give them access because if I, if I get access to my business and they're not buying, pro buying product, I don't think that's a good business decision. So I actually think it could be a win-win for the business um, who would potentially be missing out on a lot of customers at the moment because people just can't get inside their door. So look, I'd, if the committee's happy with that, I'm certainly happy to put that forward if Councillor Duff is comfortable with that change. Um, thanks, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Councillor Duff, you're happy with that? Happy with that, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, and great conversation and appreciate the motion. We are in an ageing um, community here where there will be more and more emphasis on PWDs and people with disabilities in our region. Um, one thing with the gardens, and, and not to harp on it, but I think this whole CBD is only very new and it will start to take form and take, take shape over the next 12 months and it will be a work in progress for not just the council but the community and our parks and garden staff to make sure just what is there and to try and get it right and perhaps to try and improve it. We've got issues in other towns around the Burnet with, with shrubs in places as well. So um, completely understand and appreciate that. Just uh, in wrapping up, Councillor Shoemaker quickly and then we'll go to the vote. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. Certainly supportive of the motion. I'm just wondering, it's probably more of, is it more of an amendment? It's probably a question in terms of process. Are we able to support being that the motion, the original motion was moved and seconded, and this one is quite different to the original motion. I'm just, it's probably a question of process, just making sure. Mr. CEO, your assistance with this um, from where we started to where we've ended up. Thanks, Chair. It, it is a, um, been a, a good discussion to get us to this point. I would probably um, be inclined to let this one go, well, when I say let this one go through, the original was the council works with shopkeepers. Now, that didn't articulate how council was going to work with shopkeepers. If, with, if the meeting is comfortable to accept it and uh, taking out the first dot point, nominally you could have it as a foreshadowed and then vote on the other one and then go through, but if the leave of the meeting is there, but the intention is still to work with shopkeepers. Now, how that's done is what the right motion is now giving, well, how I would read it is now how the motion is giving some guidance to. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Mr. Mayor, you're happy with that comment? And Councillor Shoemaker? Yes, thank you. Happy with that. Thank you. We've had a great discussion on this. Uh, as a recommendation to Council, Council Rochester to South Burnett Business Groups, articulating the strategic priority in our corporate plan relating to making our towns communities of choice for people living with disability and encouraging them to engage with their members and CBD businesses as to the opportunities for improving PWD access. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Item 6.2, page 36 on your agenda is in relation to the Blackbutt footpaths. And Mayor Otto has moved this motion that the committee recommends to council that council scope and cost the following footpath works and begin a bring a report to the standing committee meeting to be held on the 3rd of May 2023 for consideration as to inclusion in council's 23-24 capital budget. Dot point one is the concrete path to link John Street entrance to Scott Haven with the main street and CBD at the corner of Colson and John Streets and concrete path to close the missing link between the railhead and the showgrounds. Do we have a mover? Councillor Otto, thank you. Mayor Otto, seconder. Councillor Potter. Thank you. Comments on this motion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Look, I just um, I was fortunate to be invited to a uh, meeting of the Black Button Banak and Aged Care Association. This was discussed at the meeting and um, they asked me for advice. So I suggested that they send, uh, send a letter formalising their request. Um, so I then forwarded that letter with a um, notice of motion just so we could bring it to the, um, to the committee, give council an opportunity to consider, discuss it, understand what they're looking for here. Um, and I acknowledge that Councillor Jones has also raised this before and been working on this with the Black Butt community. So, look, it's really just to put it out for debate, discussion, see what our thoughts are, and then we can report back to the to the BBC, um, to the BBAC, um, once we've had a chance to do that. So, yep. thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, yeah. Mayor. I don't, any other commentary, conversations, questions? 
Councillor Shoemaker is about to push a button. Councillor Jones. Sorry, Mr Chair, for the confusion. Just got to try and keep up, that's all. Just, uh, <laughs> just, uh, just want to make comment on the fact that, uh, look, it's my division and, of course, I'm going to say, yeah, no worries, but I do believe that it just should be passed through to a com uh, conversation in budgetary discussions. Um, there's a lot of these notices of motion which should end up there, I think, and this is one of them. There's a considerable amount of work, uh, curb and channel down in Blackbutt, that a lot of people would prioritise. Um, yeah, so, look, I'm happy to go through with that just to support it simply because it just... It'll be a discussion in the budgetary conversation whether or not we've got the money to do it. There's a whole list of footpath issues right across our region that I've yeah. always spoken about. Every town has issues and uh, which are the priorities and which ones need to be done first. But uh, I'm happy to support it to go through to a conversation at least in the, in the budgetary discussions and whether or not we can fit it in the cap for the budget. Thank you, Councillor Jones. And it does state there for consideration and in inclusion in the 23-24. Uh, capital Works budget. Councillor Schumacher. Um, thank you. I, I'm probably not as supportive of um, of this process. My concern is what ratepayers were actually putting on hold to deliver this project or this parcel of works, um, and what message we're actually sending to the community and to our ratepayers and our staff if we pro prioritise works this way and. I'm raising this because this seems to happen every single meeting. We're saying, scope this, we're going to consider it in the next budget. Scope this, we're going to consider it in the next budget. The reality is, I know from our Ford CapEx program, there is actually already infrastructure identified um, in that program that will inform the, the actual development of our next Capital Works um, program and what we'll actually fund. So, my worry is, I, I know from my community's perspective that there's a whole range of footpaths that they would like to see done. And I'm not arguing for a second. I do, as a resident who um, used to, uh, as somebody who grew up in Blackbutt, I actually know the John Street area quite well. It's where I lived as a child. I know exactly the, the area that you're talking about. And I don't disagree that this needs to be done. My concern is what projects are we actually putting off? What ratepayers are we putting off? if we fast track this project to the front of the queue? And how do I make a decision as a councillor as to what project is actually highest priority? Getting the information, sending our staff to scope this is a dedicated parcel of work that we know we don't actually have the staff and the resources to deliver on. So we're asking for a scope to make a decision about whether we, we put this in next year's capital works program, knowing very well that there's asset data that says there's a whole range of projects already racked up there to be um, to be considered in our next program. So, I'm very concerned about um, expectations. I'm concerned about the message this is sending to our community that this is how we get things on council's agenda. While I do agree that the project is a good project. I don't think sending our staff over this next month to scope it up, to bring it back for capital works discussions, is a very good use of our time and our resources. I probably have a question as to whether this project has actually ever been scoped. You've said, Councillor Jones, you've brought it forward before. Has it been <coughs> scoped? Is it recognised in a footpath program before? So that's probably my question to the general Man, um, to General Manager Meehan, has this project been recognised or scoped before? Is it in our current um, program for consideration? Is this additional works and do you have the resources to deliver on this? Yeah, thanks, Councillor Schumacher. Manager Meehan? Oh, uh, yeah, through the Chair. We'd have to take uh, that on notice, Councillor. I'm not sure we'd have to go to check the PPT whether it's in there or not. So. Um, whether it's been pre pre work done before, not 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 sure. Without having to go back and have a look. Thank you, Manager Me and Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Henshin. Yeah, I just um, 100% agree that these projects do need to come forward. I I don't agree with um, Councillor Shoemaker because I think that how do you, I've always thought how how are councillors meant to articulate what the community's priorities are? I mean, it's okay to say, well, is it it may not be already scoped, but if the community is asking for that, 
at least like we don't have to just because we're getting it scoped doesn't mean we're actually going it's going to be the, the priority but like I raised the Krebs Street one, it's a dis it's disgraceful. But it wasn't like it's ha ha unless I say, well, you know, we need to get in Mergen that that needs to get done. Like the community saying, why isn't that being done? So I've put it forward as a notice of motion and got that through that, that they looked at. That's what councillors do. We're on the ground. We're out there with the community, saying to us like this. This is something we we want to be put forward. So what's wrong with having those? discussions and having an opportunity to say, well, is that footpath more of a priority or is, should we put, you know, just because it isn't already in there doesn't mean it's not the community priority. Like for us, that's what our, that's our core business is to, is to talk to the community and ask them what, and, and listen to them to what their priorities are. It's not about us just going, oh, well, we're just, because it happens to already have been in some asset management thing. But the community is saying, well, why the hell aren't you doing that one instead of this one? So I think that we have a role to play and that, that, is a, a, that these notices of motion are our opportunity to actually get what the community's priorities are onto the council table. So that's, to me, this needs to happen, the actual process. Thank you, Councillor Duffin. Just a question that um, Manager Meehan or Manager Darcy, we're talking 120 to 50 metres. Would it be fair to say across the Burnet there might be two or three different stages of doing footpaths and that would all hinge on, I guess, what uh, infrastructure is under the ground, where it is and the, and the lay of the land, but 120, 50 metres would not be that major to scope? It would, is that a fair question? Uh, through the Chair, what we're doing with these ones is we're putting a price across them at a, just a, a very, very preliminary stage. Um, as far as how much they actually cost, um, detailed design is, is probably our biggest indication. As we've seen in the past, it, um, we do need to do a bit of work on, on some projects. So these ones that are coming through, what we would do with this is we would um, add it to the, the capital project list, which councils had a copy of before, the, the large, thicker ones. Um, and we would put a very, very preliminary price across that um, for assessment. Um, and then basically, if council wants to build something in its detailed program, it either puts it into detailed design or detailed, put it into its in its forward budget for delivery, um, and then that would inform pricing a lot more confidently, as that's what we've learned in recent times. Yeah, thank you, Manager Man. And I guess the thing that we as a council need to keep in consideration is it states consideration. Uh, the costing for these can be done today and be totally irrelevant in three or six months' time. That's the big fear in every one of our towns and villages. Somewhere wants some curbing, channeling or footpaths. So yeah, happy to take it on board. If we don't get these motions and the community's input into it, we've got to start somewhere. So um, that being said, uh, if there's no further... Sorry, Councillor Potter's left the room. It was noted. Um, Councillor Shoemaker? I don't disagree with the sentiment at all. I absolutely believe it is our role to bring projects forward. My concern is that we have to be realistic. And my concern is that we only have finite resources. If we say we're going to add this one to our, our long list of projects, um, I want to understand when it comes to considering the 23-24 budget, what we won't be doing to deliver on this project. That's what I'm asking. Because I'm being realistic here with the people that I represent. I took an oath to represent this community impartially and in the best interests of our community. The best interests of our community aren't telling the community you can have everything that you want. It's actually getting real with our community, having real honest conversations and saying, yes, that's a very important project. Yes, we need to um, consider and put it in, into our scope and our long-term view. But in terms of funding it next year, 23-24, there's a whole range of projects already sitting there for consideration. I'm not in disagreement with scoping this up. I too want to see it done. My concern is, are we being realistic? And by putting preliminary costs on things, if I've learned anything in the past, by the time it comes to delivering the project, if we set a capital works project, if this comes back and says it's going to be $100,000, well, it's possibly going to be a whole lot more. And at the end of the day, it's going to take away from somebody else who has already advocated 
another set of ratepayers who have also advocated for another project that's on that list too. I guess I'm asking for us to be real with our community and I do believe that real leadership sometimes is about sharing what actually should be said, not necessarily sharing what people want to hear. And the reality is we as a council, we are in a deficit, we are struggling to balance our budget and diverting our resources all of the time to projects like these is taking staff away from critical projects. Mm. We're actually taking staff away from reaper flood works, from road works, from actual critical projects that they're employed to do to continue to scope these projects and put them into a long queue where we know there isn't at the end of the day the money to fund all of them. There are winners and unfortunately there are so many projects mm. that we can't fund. So. I'm supportive, sure. Let's put it on the list um, for consideration. I guess what I'm saying is how are we ever going to make a decision if this is our process where we just put everything on the list? There's no proper prioritisation of this project. It's been discussed in the past, but I have absolutely no further information other than a couple of lines here, one, two, three, four lines and a letter from a community group. We all get letters from community groups every day. Um, we get letters from ratepayers every day. Unfortunately, we as a council have got some very difficult decisions to be made. And I know if we fast track this project, if we put this one to the top of the queue, because it needs to be done, which I'm not disagreeing with, it needs to be done, we're actually saying to other ratepayers, I'm sorry, but your project's going to have to, I know you've waited, but um, your project won't be delivered this year. I think it's sending the wrong message to our staff and it's sending the wrong message to our community. And I am just raising the flag on that. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. And I'll stress again, it says consideration for inclusion. So that's a conversation to have. Councillor Erkins. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chairman. The, um, when I first come into Council, halfway through the term, my concern was we were all talking about roads. And we all thought that in our area we had the worst roads. So we had that trip where we went around and looked at one another's roads so that we were able to appreciate what other councillors were facing in their areas. It's probably a bit the same with footpaths. We all have areas that are bad and maybe as a, as a team we should be looking and saying, well, yes, we can see the priority for well, this footpath in this town, it's not in my town, but I can see that's a priority. But then I have a, a, a footpath that I want, and I've got a motion coming up, the next motion is actually on a footpath in my area. Maybe what we should do is not here in a meeting, but maybe we should be all getting together when we're going to these um, meetings in the towns where we're meeting the community, maybe we should put some time aside afterwards to go around and each of the councillors can take the rest around to have a look so that we can see what areas are a priority so that when we come to our budget that we have a little understanding and we're not just there fighting for our area because it's our area. Let's have a look at which ones are, you know, really ones that should be forward and put them forward on their merit, not on how many people are complaining about it because sometimes only one person will complain, but sometimes it's a very real need. So, you know, I believe that that's probably more what we need to, to be doing is to organising at these council, you know, meet the community, talk to the community, and let's go out and have a look at some of these footpaths. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. And Councillor Schumacher's is right. We have a list as long as our arm with footpaths and curving and channelling that we've talked about for the last two years. You've heard me say in this chamber is that footpaths in Cumbia and a curb and channelling in, in Tingura, and the list goes on. We all have them. Um, your light, Councillor Erkins, have you? Thank you. Mr Mayor, would you care to wrap up being your motion? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, um, Mr Chair. Um, yeah, thanks, everybody, for um, giving us the time to, to discuss this. Uh, look, look um, I think Councillor Erkins' idea is a great one. If we could walk, walk the towns and all get an understanding of each other, um, well, I mean, the whole region's my division, but but for all the councillors to have an understanding of each and everyone's areas, I think that would really help us inform us make these decisions. Nothing like seeing it firsthand. So I'd love to see us do that um, and do more of that. So thanks, Councillor Ogans. I think that's a great idea. Um, look, in terms of the leadership, Councillor Schumacher talked about what's real leadership. 
and not telling people what they want to hear. I absolutely agree with that. But certainly, please, committee, that was never the intention here. Um, what, what, as a council, I'm asking us to do um, is to simply put this on the list for consideration um, and discuss it alongside the other priorities because these people are a credible organisation. It's not just another letter from a person in the community who wants to be on the wish list. These people, I think, have earned the right to put a request to council. I think they've done a lot of heavy lifting in Blackbutt in terms of, and Benarkin, but particularly in Blackbutt in terms of providing aged care um, support for people down there with housing. And I think we should be listening. And these, these are the, the Jeff Connors of the world. I think we should be listening to these people. Um, and I think they're at least entitled to have this on the list. I don't think they would have brought it forward if they didn't think it was a priority for their community. Um, and I'd hope that when I get these requests, I would reply personally a little bit of discretion as to what I do bring to the chamber and what I don't. Because if I think it's just someone wanting to throw something into, into a wish list, I would hope that I would actually look at that and go, well, OK, let's have a discussion about is it something the community really wants. Um, look, as to real leadership, I know it's always challenging here. You know, what's our mindset around real leadership as a council? Um, the Local Government Act, you know, talks about community engagement, talks about acting in the best interest of the community. It's really hard. I guess we've got a different perspective on what that looks like and what it means. For some of, that, for some of us, that means that, you know, we have to... Um, perhaps, you know, uh, make those tough calls based on data, evidence-based data. For some of us, it means we go out and talk to the people and take a more subjective approach, um, a more human feeling approach and having conversations, uh, less of a subject, less of an objective approach. So, you know, I guess as a local council, there's a little bit of movement there in terms of, do we go on the asset management plan? Do we listen to what the community's saying? Do we adjust the asset management plan based on that? So. I think real leadership's probably just having a bit of flexibility around that. Um, certainly, and it was not ever, um, as Councillor, you've said, certainly was not to fast track this or put it to the front of the queue. That is absolutely not the intention here. It was just to get it in the list. And it might end up at the bottom of the list, you know. It was just to give all the council, it was to give the staff an opportunity to have a, to have a look at it, assess it, come back and say to us, look, councillors, here's the list. This is what we think's important. At the end of the day, it's your call you consider where this one fits in with all the other priorities. And I think as the elected body, that's what we have to do as a council. So really all I'm asking here is not to tell the community that they can have everything they want, not to tell these people that they're going to get their footpath. It's just to give us all an opportunity to consider it in amongst the other priorities. And it might end up at number 50. It's certainly not to ask council or to pressure council to fast track it. That's not what these people want. They just ask could we consider it through our due process. And look, Council, if there's another process or another way we can do this in accordance with our standing orders or according with our process, I'm happy to follow that. Um, I'm happy to be informed as to what the proper process is to get community requests for infrastructure into our capital works considerations. If there's another process, Mr CEO, I'm happy to follow whatever Council wants me to do. Uh, but at the moment, for me, process is to bring it to a committee meeting so it can be considered, be discussed, it either gets on the list for consideration or it doesn't. Um, so look, that's really all this was about. Um, and uh, look, really just putting it forward on behalf of the people of the Black Batman Arkin Aged Care Association. Um, and they think it's important. So I'll probably just be seeking the support of the committee just to at least allow the staff to do just a, a basic preliminary scope. Not a lot of effort goes into it, as General Manager Meehan said. An estimated costing, I'd imagine we'd include some CPI contingency in that costing anyway, in terms of concrete price rises over mm. the next 12 months as part of what our engineers do. Um, and, and, and then we can just have a look at it and say, okay, mm. are we happy to support it or not? Or we might have to push it back to later years, but just want to give council opportunity to at least consider it. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just um, for a little bit of useless information, and the managers can probably correct me if I'm wrong, we fought for a long time to get some footpath in Cumbia, which was a very short stretch in a footpath, which was $50,000 some three years, near on three years ago. So um, I could well imagine that whatever you do with this would be greatly appreciated. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. With no further conversation on that, we'll go to a vote that um, the scope and the costing of a footpath works and bring a report to the standing committee meeting held on the 3rd of May for consideration as to the inclusion in Council's 23-24 capital budget, the dot points there, the concrete path, the John Street entrance to Scott Haven with the Main Street and CBD at the corner of Colson and John Streets, 
and the concrete path to close the missing link between the railhead and the showgrounds. We'll go to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Chair, if I may, uh, Linnell, can you just go back up to that? With these, where they recommend to council, because they're going to be bringing a report direct back, if council, with the leave of the meeting, are just going to take the committee recommends to council because it just doubles up the report. And so it's coming straight back to the next standing committee. So we won't run a report to the ordinary, then a report to the to the to the um, standing committee. So uh, it just it doesn't Im uh, impact the resolution at all. Just takes one step out, and we'll just bring it straight back to the standing committee. So any of these that are reports, if everyone's comfortable with that, we'll just bring them straight back to the standing committees. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Moving on to 6.3, page 38 on your agenda is the Drayton Street and Nanango footpath with a motion from Councillor Erkins that the committee recommends to Council that the footpath on Drayton Street to Henry Street to the primary school in Nanango is upgraded. Councillor Erkins, would you like to uh, speak on your motion? Will I move it and get a second of this? Beg your pardon, yeah. Would you like to move your motion? motion. Councillor Erkins, does we have a seconder for that? Councillor Jones, thank you, Councillor Erkins. I'd like to elaborate on your motion. Okay, so I'm probably not really sure of where this goes from here, but I do know that a resident approached me as she had quite a serious injury um, after tripping on that footpath. That's the footpath that goes from the business area down from Henry Street down to the primary school. So, um, it does need some work on it to uh, to um, cover that type of thing. But again, I want to come back to the point that I raised at the earlier one that I would really, I don't know if we can put a um, point in or where I can, whether I can do a, no, a motion off the floor to have it that we do go and look at footpaths across the region when we have these meetings because otherwise I've got another footpath coming up. You know, we're all getting people come. I see other councillors putting in to have their footpaths put into the program. My residents want to see me do the same thing, but I believe the best way is if we organise that meeting. I don't know how to go about that, so I'm probably looking for advice from either Mr CEO or from my fellow councillors? Mr CEO, thank you. Uh, the um, the organiser footpath inspection tour would be its own just um, ancillary to this chair. So once we get through the footpath sections, we can, well, once we get through this one, you could just add it in as a standalone. It wouldn't be part of, of one of these. Okay. Well, in that case, I'd like the, the, that Drayton Street footpath to be added to the program for footpaths for 2023-24. You need to change that, Councillor Erkins and uh, Linnell. Well, well, actually, no, I think, it's, I think it is important that we look at that now, where the lady did have that injury. So I would um, appreciate a report maybe to come back. Okay, so Councillor Erkins, you've stated in your motion that the primary school, uh, from Henry Street to the primary school in Ango is upgraded. Perhaps we go to our managers in relation to that upgraded, covers a fairly broad spectrum of uh, upgraded. Do you have some input into that? Uh, yeah, through the chair. I believe that section of footpath the councillor was talking about was in our budget for this year. Um, and we did withdraw that project at the second quarter review due to, to budget priorities at that time. Um, we did uh, the, the section around near the other school because um, it was a TIDS funded project, but that project is is scoped um, for for delivery. Um, it's just a matter of how it's funded. Councillor Erkins, you're happy with that response in saying that that the that it being scoped. Um, no. Perhaps but, no. So what does that actually mean? It's been scoped, but we don't have the money. To do it, and again, will be one that comes back to council that we will deliberate and discuss, Councillor Erkins. Okay, so so if I can, is it possible to change that wording 
so that it is done as soon as funding is available. But again, um, I think it's just so important that we look and these um, footpaths or projects of any kind are done on a priority basis so that the most important ones are done first and without the support of the whole chamber working towards that, I think we need to do that so as soon as funding is available. Okay, so you've changed your motion of the footpath on Drayton Street to Henry Street to the primary school in Anango is upgraded as soon as funding is available. Is that in this financial year? 22-23 financial year or 23-24? As early as possible. As early as possible. As soon so as, as funding is as funding is available, as soon as possible. Perhaps no, add. No, I think as soon as funding is available, I, say, I think that says it. Happy it's with that. Upgraded as soon as there is some funding available. All right. Yep. Councillor Jones, are you happy with that? Thank you. Um, so Councillor Erkins has moved, and Councillor Jones has seconded that. Do we have any further comment, Councillor Shoemaker? Um, Thank you, Chair. Look, forgive me for making evidence-based decisions, but this is a prime example of what I'm talking about. I've actually got here in front of me our current capital works program and the financial review from the last council meeting that we had, which says for Drayton Street footpath, we had actually allocated $53,000 to do just this. And unfortunately, we are balancing so many priorities that we've had to say, that decision, unfortunately, Councillor Erkins, for your community, that footpath, that is a priority. It has been recognised. It's been scoped. We've done all the work. But unfortunately, we cannot deliver that project this year. That's the reality of what we as a council are facing here every single meeting that we have. And this is the reality of my biggest concern, which is that we are making promises, that we are having conversations with community about projects that we all know we cannot fund and deliver. Now, I do listen to my community. I absolutely do. And I can list off probably five or six footpath projects for Division 4 here in Kingaroy. I know they come at hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so I've, I've had very difficult conversations with residents in my, in my division at their kitchen tables saying, I get it, I absolutely get it, and I absolutely want to see us invest in more cycle and footpath infrastructure because at the moment, when I take my kids for a ride down into town, I ride along the edge of Harris Road, as I do with many other families who live in that area. I also know we have high rates of obesity in the South Burnett. I know we have high rates of mental health, and I know the importance of infrastructure like this. But the reality is I also know the bottom line and I also know how challenging it is as a council to be able to pick and choose what projects we do and don't do. This is a prime example. I agree, Councillor Erkins. I'll support your motion. I absolutely agree. This piece of footpath, it has been prioritised. It's in the budget. It was in the budget. We had to take it out. It needs to be done. Um, unfortunately, we cannot deliver on that. And I apologise to the Nanango community, but that's the realities of what we're facing. So my apologies for making evidence-based decisions and making difficult decisions in the best interests of my community. I guess the reality is I know the facts because I read them, I focus on them, and I spend hours of my time trying to make the best possible decisions for our community. This is a prime example of what I'm talking about. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher, and a good point. And it's a classic example of what we face within these chambers. And you've brought it to everyone's attention. And I hope the community takes that on notice because we do. We have to make some decision, difficult decisions here where we can't get projects done. And Councillor Erkins, I'm sure you appreciate and can take back to your community just that. It's been scoped and hopefully it can be done as your motion states. Funding is available as soon as possible. Well, not as soon as possible, but as soon as it is available. So hopefully that's come to the top of the list or up in the prioritisation in the list in the 23-24 um, deliberations on footpaths. So, Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> um, 
Chair Henshin, I'm absolutely supportive of, of um, Councillor Erkins putting this forward. I'm very appreciative that she has flagged that it's, a, it's an issue that we didn't get the money for it, but it's a priority. I believe that um, we are not making promises to community by actually including their issues and getting them looked at as options and put on a list because over, the, over my term as a councillor, there has been opportunities where there's been a grant funding for a cycleway or something like that. So even if it wasn't the priority, if it's in the mix and it comes up and there's an opportunity for a grant or something, it's there. And the community feels like we've listened to them. We're not making promises. We're just saying, OK, we've listened to you. It's in this list it's, and we, it's, it's up for grabs. So I honestly think that this is council working at its very best, listening to the community, putting forward the projects, listening to Councillor Erkin's passion about, you know, that that lady tripped and going out and having a look. That's what we should be doing as a council and also making sure that we don't miss what the community's priorities are and also even if they, like we, we, we say them, you know, we might, might not be able to fund this, but we are looking at it. So I'm absolutely supportive of this one, all the projects that the council's putting forward, and I think it's council working at its very best. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Councillor Erkins, would you like to have a final comment? Thank you, Councillor and Erkins. I think your suggestion of footpaths would be great, but perhaps we want to organise some mobility scooters for that because I'm sure we've got some kilometres to cover in the South Burnet. Thank you. Councillor Erkins, so the motion reads, it's been changed, of course, the footpath on Drayton Street to Henry Street to the primary school in Nanango upgraded as soon as funding is available. All those in favour? Unanimous, thank you very much. Moving on to 6.4 on the agenda, page 39, Alfred Street, Nanango footpath. And again, Councillor Erkins, your motion is that Council investigates, recommends to Council that they investigate extending the footpath from Chester Street to Cairn Street, Nanango. The rationale there, we've had a lot of events held at Nanango Showgrounds and this would give a better and safer access to residents when travelling to the events held there. Would you like to move this motion? Somebody move this motion. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. We have a seconder. Uh, Mayor Otto, thank you. Uh, commentary? So, um, speaking on this motion, I probably think that this probably comes down to the needs versus wants. And it's probably a wants, um, you know, the residents there have, in that area have contacted me. And it would be nice to have a footpath go from Can, from Can Street down to Chester Street. However, do I think it's a priority? I think there probably are other footpaths or other areas that are more of a priority. But, however, I would like to put it forward onto the list so that when we go through it, it's considered with, along with all the other footpaths because, you know, to some people it's possibly more important than others. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. Uh, Manager Meehan, we have a motion investigates extending the footpath. In previous motions we've had scope and investigate. Uh, do you have a, a comment on investigate? Uh, through the chair, we would apply the same methodology. So we would just do a preliminary cost over the top of it and place it on the list, essentially. Yep, thank you. Any other? Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So with all these discussions this morning, if we were to put these notices of motion through a customer request system, does that go on to the system and, and do you guys pick that up? And do we, do you, uh, if Councillor Erkins was, was to write in here on this particular one, um, the council investigates extending the footpath from Chester Street to Cairns Street in Ango and an approximate costing or something like that in a customer request. Would that be not picked up and you guys would do exactly what you're being asked to do here? Question through you, Chair. Thank you, Manager Man. Um, to be honest, the, the council, council can bring them through and, then, and put them on the list if they wish to, which is, which is what council is doing. Um, if they come through a customer request process, uh, we would generally look to see, um, you know, whether we, we think it is a, a priority issue for us or needed or it's in some sort of plan um, that we might have. Just with the footpath, it is a it is an item that we don't have a lot of forward plans. We've 
the list, of, the wish list is very, very long. I'll be, I'll be quite honest. Uh, the PPT is is tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars. Um, we would just basically put a put a price across it um, on square meterage, um, provide that there was nothing too too outstanding for them. Um, but we would um, we would ultimately probably submit that list to council once a year with the budget and for council's consideration, like the PPT, to say these are the projects that are currently considered in there. Um, and council can make its mind up of what it wishes to fund. So through you again, Chair, yeah. another question. So is that not exactly where this is going to end up? The process will come back, you will do a costing and it will come back to budgetary discussions in the 23-24 budget? Yeah, through the Chair, that's right. So these projects that we're, we're currently um, assessing at the moment, um, Kev will present his draft budget. Um, what we will do is we will price these with a preliminary estimate We'll put a risk factor onto them of what we believe the risk profile of these projects are. So one of the things we will be implementing this year is making council aware of what we do and don't know about a project. Um, they will turn up on the project list, um, with which is, you know, similar to the LRCI list that we provided to council a couple of months ago. It's quite thick. Um, it will be listed in there, and then we'll propose a budget to council, and council can decide what it chooses to add and to subtract for that to be funded. Another question through you, chair. So I've just had a look through all these notices of motion that we have from 6.4 through to 6.15, except for 6.16 where it says council escalates its curb and channeling works on North Street, Kingaroy, in front of the Kingaroy Kindergarten to be completed by the 31st of December 2023. Now the rest of them, we can, all we're going to do is sit around here and we're going to talk for who knows how long and they're all going to be passed through and go to budgetary discussions. Now... I totally agree, Councillor Erkins. If there's, everyone's got issues with footpaths. Councillor Shoemaker said she can think of four. I can think of 10 before I would do John Street in Blackburn. All right, that's the priority. Now, if we were working as a team, the, you know, it would be great. We could go out and everyone would be working together and trying to get that. Totally agree with Councillor Duff. We've got to represent the region and got to represent the people. But I don't think this is good use of Councillor's time discussing this when there's other streamlined processes that can get the same result and they're all going to be passed today. We get, yeah, sure, it's all good. We bring the things to the table and all that sort of stuff and people can see that you're bringing it to the, as a notice of motion, which is great. But seriously, you talk about having... Me personally, where I get my best results is going out in the community and talking to the people on the street and getting their concerns and all that and as the Mayor alluded to, working out with a bit of discretion what's, what's common sense and what is a priority. The council is in footpath in the Nango. I would suggest that we look at the second quarter savings and maybe we can get that done ASAP because it was in the budget. It was already done but we took it out because we'd already overspent on other projects and here we are, exactly what Councillor Shoemaker is saying. We're taking projects away. So all these projects here, I can sit here now and, and give you another example. North um, Morris Street in Blackburn. I brought that to the table ages ago. We had every councillor in Blackbird having a look at a garden. I went and got the staff to cost it up. We had the costing and everything else. Never got done. So now it's going to be brought back here to be discussed in a budgetary discussion. There's going to be another 400000 possibly because of the costs and everything else that when we could have done it and we had all the pricing done, and I quote, the councillors all agreed that it was a priority. It needed to be done. And it never got done when we had that conversation and now all of a sudden it's back on the table because a couple of people in Morris Street have spoken to the Mayor. I've had it all the time. It's a street in Blackbutt. It's the only dirt street left in Blackbutt. You've got one Councillor Henshin in Cumbia, only dirt street that's sort of left down that side as you're going in. We've got issues all over the time. I don't... Happy to sit here and talk. We can be here for hours. But I reckon there's another streamlined process that if it goes through and you put it on the conversation when we're having discussions around our budget, because all these that we're going to discuss again today will be all rehashed when we have the budget, the budget debate on the 3rd of May that it's all indicated. And the amount of time that we as a group of councillors waste because we rehash the same situation over and over again that could be well more used, and we could go and do tours around and spend time together and look at footpaths and all that sort of stuff. The amount of time that these guys are taking up, I know just in the infrastructure and the water, the amount of reports that they have to write, including today, they are not getting out to do the job that they are employed to do 
The gentleman up the back, the manager of roads, I can hardly get him out of his office and it's no fault of his. It's the fact that he's required to write reports. And yes, mm. staff are required to re write reports when we request it, but crazy stuff. There was over 200 and something reports requested out of infrastructure last year and that gentleman only works 260 something a year. Nearly every day he has to write a report where he should be out on the road checking all the work that's getting done, making sure it's getting done and seeing, spending time with all of us. Like seriously, 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 so much time wasted in this council where we could streamline it and I just think that we have an opportunity to address it. I, I'd like to move a motion that out of those next 12, we could bundle them all up and say, let's move them all through to the conversation on the budget because that's where they're all going to end up. We're all going to say, yeah, no worries, we'll do that. And then we're going to go back and rehash them again. Now, whether we're going to be able to afford them, I don't think so. There's, there's a lot of money tied up in those 15 motions right there. And I'm talking millions, not hundreds of thousands. And I tell you what, there's no one more concerned about the budget that we're going to bring down this year than what I am. Because I know three years ago I said that we'd end up here and the, the conversation happening quite regularly in this chamber we're going to have to look at cutting services. You think your community's upset now? You wait until you start cutting community, um, services on your roads and everything else because we haven't done a good mm -hmm. job. Thank you, Councillor Jones. There's some very good topics there and points you've brought across. Part, and correct me if I'm wrong, but part of standing committee meetings is just this, that we're here to thrash some of these things out. I can fully understand wanting to bundle things up into one, but in amongst that I'm pretty sure there'd be some communities want to have conversation about them, or us to have conversation about them as well. And can understand uh, your concern, Councillor Jones. We have agenda items here in front of us that the community expects us to, con to have a conversation about in this chambers, and that's the purpose of standing committees, how we deal with them at the time is how we deal with them. That's a democratic process that we put here to discuss the matters on. can fully understand there might be from 6.4 to 6.15 with one or two out of there. People expect us to have that conversation, whether it takes us half an hour, whether it takes us five minutes. I think we owe the community that and how we get through that um, is, is up to us. If you wanted to move a motion, uh, you're entitled to do so. But um, if you do, I'd ask you to do so now, otherwise we'll move through agenda items as they pre present themselves. All right, all right. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Yep. Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, certainly agree. I, I'm of the view of what precedents we're, what precedents are we actually setting here? Instead of showing leadership, and explaining the process we are nominating to move projects in front of the queue or to add more projects to an already busting list of projects. I believe in these projects. I absolutely agree. Um, the Nenengo Show Society is a prime example of possibly um, one incredible society who holds amazing events. And I do agree. A footpath like this would help create a better and safe environment for residents to actually access the events at the showgrounds. And we all see the hundreds of caravans there. Every, um, every couple of months there seems to be something happening there. But I do believe a project should be evaluated on its merits. And I also believe we only have finite resources. And I know that, I know that firsthand. We shouldn't be making decisions like these. And this is a prime example where we prioritise this one and not do Drayton Street and then scope that one and add it to another list. We shouldn't be making decisions like this because at the end of the day, we have a long list of projects, a long list of people waiting, and we have highest priority needs that have been put. We have that information available to us. And while I agree it is hard, we as councillors, we get many requests like these, and I know we all want to support and get the best outcomes for our community. I know we're listening to our community. I know we want to achieve the best outcomes, but the reality is there's no magic wand. There's no money tree out the back. The reality is that we continue to squabble over what takes higher priority. I can't support this motion, I'm sorry, Councillor Erkins. I wish I could, but the reality is I know that this project 
is is a long way down that list. Um, and I know there are other projects in the Nango, other footpaths that are higher priority needs. And so I don't want to divert our staff from valuable work that they're doing on our roads to go and scope a project like this. We've already added three more reports to their work list just this morning, and it's only quarter past 10. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. This has been, oh, I can, may I ask, yes? Yeah, thanks, Mr Chair, and thanks, colleagues, for those um, sharing your, your views on that. Uh, look, look, I I don't really think what we're doing here does compromise good governance. Uh, I actually think it is part of good governance. Look, absolutely, I understand I support the fact that we've got to have asset management plans and that it needs to be evidence-based and based on data. I think we're going to continue to have these debates um, for some time to come around process unless we can reach an understanding as a council as to what should be the appropriate process. But my understanding is that what this council has done in its term is to take away from closed doors um, portfolio briefings, which I did feel um, we could do better. And thank you to Mr CEO and his team for providing us with a platform um, through a standing committee arrangement where we could have these discussions. Um, the word was used, squabbles. I don't think they're squabbles. I think they're just, that we're doing our job. You know, we're having a debate, we're having a discussion about what are the priorities for our community. And as a divisional councillor, I would applaud you for coming forward and standing up and representing your division. That's why we have divisional councillors. And I think that's what your community in Blackbutt, Councillor Jones, or in Kingaroy, a Kingaroy councillor, is it an Anglo councillor? You know, all of all your councillors. That's what your community wants from you, I believe. They want you to take on board their issues and bring them back and share them with your colleagues. Now, if there's another forum, another mechanism, Councillor Jones, you spoke about um, a streamlined process. If there's a more streamlined process than this, that is democratic, that allows for community engagement, that gets better outcomes than having these conversations in a standing committee, then I'm all ears. And I'd like to have it explained to me if there's a better streamlined process. I put in many customer requests for things that I feel are appropriately dealt with by customer requests. And sometimes um, they get done quickly, other times they don't. And in almost every case, there's a reason for that, because there's conflicting priorities. But sometimes there's an issue that your community is passionate about, and as a councillor, you have to do that. Now, in addition to standing committees, we have community engagement days. Gives people an opportunity to come in and talk with us, a new initiative of this council. In addition to that, we now go out on a regular basis and meet with the community in a local shop or a local cafe. We've done that in recent times. And we all hear from those local communities about what their priorities are. I think that's been another great initiative that probably uh, not to this extent has happened in the past. I think we're doing a lot of good work in community engagement council, and I think we shouldn't be too tough on ourselves. We're doing a lot of good work in community engagement. These committee meetings, you know, pre previous last term had portfolio briefings, whatever one wants to call them. I do think these are productive discussions, because at the end of the day, the staff can only put forward recommendations. We have to make the decision based on what we feel is in the best interests of our community. But if there's a more streamlined process, look, I'm all ears for that. Um, in terms of leadership, look, um, and explaining the process to our community, again, what I've been saying to our community is um, we come out and listen as councillors, we take on board your concerns, and then we make a decision as to what we feel is the appropriate process for attending to that. Do we put it in as a customer request? Probably in 90% of cases, yes. Do we bring it to a committee, have a discussion with a notice of motion put forward? In some cases, yes, we do. Um, look, um, I don't think that we are asking for this to be put as the highest priority. I don't think any of these, and I don't think anyone here is asking for these to be put as the highest priority. I think they're just saying, can we get them on the list this is a mechanism by which we can make sure that this is a conduit through which councillors can feed their community's requests into a budgetary process for consideration by council. And I think that's really all Councillor Urkins is trying to do here, is to get this on the list for consideration. Um, and the other thing is, look, as to the budget, cutting services, look, council, let's be calm about this. Let's not get too alarmist. Um, we've got to make some tough decisions around rates and budgets over coming months. We all know that. We've got a deficit at the moment, uh, unfortunately influenced by bad timing on FAGS grants of around $5 million. 
Okay, now that's going to balance itself out as long as we don't obviously dip into our cash. But yeah, we've got some tough decisions to make. But I don't want to make assumptions about cutting services or alarm the community. I think that you know we've got to look through all of our different options. Um, and uh, look, it's it's never easy. Um, but uh, look, I, I'm comfortable with this as a process, councillors. Until we can find a better one, I'm happy to stick with it. But as I said, if there's a better one. Happy to hear that, but on that basis, I'm happy to support Council Urquhart's here. Yeah, thanks, yep. uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, uh, just to, oh, Councillor Jones. Yeah, quickly. Yeah, just a quick response in and uh, the the Mayor's reference to what I said in regards to a streamlined process. I don't have any issues with serious concerns and all that with notice of the motion, but to the Mayor said, get them on the list. All right, for discussion. We can do that without bringing a notice of motion to the council, I believe. I don't think we have to. We've got to, There's another option to go through and get them on the list, as we just spoke through there. We can put it on the custom request. It goes through there, and if we ask them to add it to their list, I think that's, as councillors, I think we've got an opportunity to speak to our general managers and CEO and all that sort of stuff, just a simple phone call, possibly. That's all I'm saying, that I just think that there's some of these notices of motion that are coming through, Mayor, that could go through in a simplified way just to get through onto the list and discuss around because that's where all these are going to go and the, the community can be assured that if you get them on the list they will be discussed. Mm. They will be discussed through a budgetary thing because none of these notices of motion here today unless they we when we, and they'll be taken through to the third of May when we have our budget discussions. You know, unless we've got money in the account or in the budget or whatever to do them they're going to have to be put on a list of future capital works or however we address them. So that's all I was referring to in the fact that there might be a streamlined option where some of these notices of motions could go through a custom request or a, some sort of other way to get them onto the list that you referred to there. That, that's all I was saying. Thank you, Councillor Jones. And I'm assuming Councillor Shoemaker has got a, an appointment to go to. Is that, is that correct? Anyway, um, Mayor Otto, just quickly, yep. Yeah, Thank you. thanks. Um, yeah, I think I would have liked to see this result. Thanks, Councillor Jones. Yeah. Look, I don't know what the streamlined process is. I know I do put in a lot of custom requests. Um, I don't tend to do that for capital works projects. Um, I have in the past. I, I, certainly, I don't ring or I don't go direct to general managers, to be perfectly honest. I don't. But you did mention that, Councillor Jones. I, I endeavour to comply absolutely 100% with Council's acceptable request guidelines. Um, so if I have an issue and I want information, I will submit through our CEO a request for information. Um, and that normally is responded to fairly promptly by our staff, and thank you, Mr. CEO, for that. That, to me, if I want to get some information, I'll put in an RFI. If I want to get something on a capital works list, I'll bring a notice of motion to a committee meeting to have it discussed as to whether council thinks it's got legs or it's worth putting on the list. What I won't do is send an email to a GM asking them to please put this on a list, because I don't believe that's appropriate. It's not a decision for me to put the GM in that position. I believe it should come here for the council to decide as to whether you think it is warranted to put through to the budget process. If it's not, it doesn't get to the budget process. But um, look, if I don't feel that the custom request system uh, does necessarily serve this space, I find the custom request system is very good for supporting the community and getting operational requests um, completed. Uh, whether that be getting, a, you know, um, a drain fixed or a pothole fixed or whatever it might be, I'm happy to do the custom request thing for that. But when it comes to putting forward um, infrastructure projects to go on a capital works program, at the moment, I'm sorry, I'm still not hearing, is there a better, more appropriate mechanism than bringing notices of motion to a community meeting? If there is, happy to follow it. But at this point in time, I don't believe we've got one. Um, that has worked for me and for the community um, from my experience. So, you know, maybe this is a body of work we have to look at as a council in terms of our process. You know, do we need a process by which capital projects can come forward? I know Councillor Erkins talked about having a community forum to get all the community and ask them, what capital projects do you want us to consider? We talked about doing that a few months ago. I don't know what the best process is. All I know is that I go out in the community all the time, on the streets, in the cafes, as you know, the mobile mayor, I'm out there. I'm out and about all over the region, often with you people where we're sitting there as councillors at coffee shops and people are coming forward with requests for capital 
works. Now, at this point in time, to my understanding, I bring that to a committee meeting for my colleagues to talk about and make a, decision, make a recommendation as to whether you want to get it on the list or not. If there's a bit of process in that, please, again, I'm all ears. But at this stage, that's what I feel is our process. But look, I could be wrong. I'm happy to be corrected. Thanks, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I, uh, and I just would like to reiterate to the councillors that we don't smash our customer request staff with, with this because they're under the pump with a lot of customer requests. I'm sure as councillors you do your best to liaise with a, with a complaint in some shape or form. I know we spend a lot of time out on certain roads and, and issues with people and have that conversation with them um, before I try and impose on any staff member to get something solved before, it, if it can, uh, beforehand. Councillor Erkins, as the mover, would you like to final comment? Yes, thank you. Through you, Mr. Um, Chairman. Um, when I started, when I stood up and said about it, the motion to start with, I said that there were wants and needs, and I, I, I do believe that this is probably more a want than a need. However, my concern is that, and it may be inexperience on my part, but I just was just not aware of how some of these things got into that program. And I see other councillors putting their um, projects forward, and I just want to make sure that my community does not miss out because of my inexperience of knowing how to get these projects on to the um, program. When I'm saying it, it, it's a want. However, I have to also say that the Nenango Show Society put on many, many of a, events. Their monthly market, you know, where they have over 500 stalls and thousands of people attend that market. Probably, I mean, there are many more people go to the Nenango markets and go to any of the festivals that we put in, on in the area. And cars do park all the way down that street and people are up and down the street. So it probably is quite a good project to look at. However, I do understand that there are a lot more important things to go in front of it. So I'm not really looking for, when I say council investigates, probably that's the wrong wording. And what I really mean is that I want it to go on the list for consideration when we're talking about footpaths. So, you know, I would like to, I would like it to be, um, so, yeah, yeah, maybe count, how do you word that? Chair, if I may, just with this one, just for consistency, and it's the same point, again, not getting into the content of it, yeah. but can we remove the committee recommends to council and just have the report come back to the 3rd of May standing committee? Well, I, I, and then that way we can bundle all these back and bring them all back for consideration. As they'll all be assessed with a, it'll be, and fully support General Manager Mia here, this will be a high level assessment of these projects and a rough unit cost. So there'll be, uh, confidence will be low as to what their, what the full detailed cost would be. But if we could just, consistent, we'll just bring them all back in one hit and then they can all be in where they go to from there. Um, can, so investigate is, it gives the investigate. same effect. Yeah, uh, because I've not really. If that, if that assists. I'm not looking for any great money to be spent on investigating. I just want to make sure that it comes forward. When we're talking about footpaths in the next budget, that we're aware it may be thrown into the funnel and sit in the funnel for quite a while before it comes out as a necessity, but I just want it to be there. So I'm looking for support on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. Just on that, on the Motion Council investigates extending the footpath from Chester Street to Cairn Street and Ango, and a report be brought back to the Standing Committee on the 3rd of May as the mover. You're happy with that? And the second, Mayor Otto? Yep. All right. Extended conversation on this. Take it to the vote. Oh, you've got your light on, Councillor Ergen. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, all those in favour? All those against? Councillor Jones, I saw a little movement there. Was that a... F Thank you. That's unanimously carried. Thank you. Mr CEO. Chair, with regards, and, and realise it's morning tea time, but um, our guest in the gallery has... Um,
an item on the agenda at 8.1. I was just wondering, just before we go to morning tea, because he does have quite an important appointment this morning, if we could just um, deal with item, item 8.1 before morning tea to allow the gentleman to get on his way. Yep. Your Thank you, Councillor Duff. Moves a procedural motion that we move on to 8.1 on the agenda, which is page 75, which is. We need a seconder, Councillor Potter. Thank you, Councillor Potter. All those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. So we'll move to 8.1 on page 75 of your agenda in the infrastructure planning works on Birch Road stormwater. In the summary that uh, Council has received a complaint regarding stormwater scouring and proposed works on Birch Road and the recommendation is that the committee recommends to Council that Council note the report and correspondence and that two Council's works managers review and resolve the complaint. Uh, and just in the background of that quickly, Council received a correspondence in relation to scour and protection works on Birch Road as attached. You've all seen that. Council works managers will review the complaint and make contact as a system CRM. So we have a mover on that. Councillor Potter, second to Councillor Duff. Commentary. Councillor uh, Mayor Otto, sorry. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, well, just wonder if we could get an update from the general manager in relation to this matter. Um, we've got a report there with some, with some documentation that I have read, uh, including the, the uh, stat deck from the resident um, concerned would we be able to receive just a, a little bit of an overview, a verbal overview of, of the um, report before we pass that through, if we could, uh, through you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly through the Chair. Um, we had a look at the, the letter last week and the gentleman and I had a long discussion at the front for a short period of time in intermission. Um, yeah, basically, what we'll do um, in relation to this one is that um, Council's Works Manager will review the complaint. We'll look to have an on-site meeting with the gentleman and, and have a discussion around what's required and what's been agreed to and look to resolve it um, one way or the other. Essentially, I think um, an on-site meeting for ourself, for Kevin and, and maybe myself there to, to work through those issues and, and first-hand probably see what the problem is too to, to make sure we can um, work through what's, a, what's an optimum solution for everybody. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks, General Manager. Just um, would we be able to get an indication? I know this has been probably uh, going on for a little while. What sort of time frame um, Council could expect before our staff would meet with the resident uh, on site? Uh, we would look roughly. To, uh, we'd, with the current alignment, we would probably look to, to do it not next week, but probably the week after. Okay, thank you. No further commentary. No. Councillor Schumacher. Um, just a question, it seems. There's a bit of miscommunication. We'd agreed to supply some rock, and then we haven't supplied the rock. Am I reading? Am I reading that correctly? And um, is this sort of a normal process? Where I, I guess I was trying to understand when we um, work with a resident who might raise a complaint like this, and then they they actually say, "Well, yes, I'll help invest in the works." What is what is the process? Yeah. Thank you, Manager. Uh, through to the chair, I, th I think that is the um, the complaint is in, is in relation to how much rock would be supplied by who, um, what sections we would do, and then what sections would be expected by the landowner, um, and that's where I think it'll be a discussion on what what outcomes achieved there of, of what council's contribution is to that. Yeah. Thank you for your efforts. I hope. Um by working together, we can get a good outcome for the resident. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Manager, man, no more commentary. We take that to the vote. All those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. All right. We will adjourn for morning tea. Can I have a mover? Morning tea, Councillor Erkins. Thank you very much. Seconded, Councillor Potter. Uh, if we can be back in here in approximately 10 to 15 minutes, say 5 to 11, be appreciated. Thank you.
Welcome back from morning tea. Thank you. Could we uh, resume with a motion to resume back to the agenda in the meeting? Have a mover of that. We come back into open council. Anybody? Thank you, Councillor Mayor Otto. Seconder, Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you. Well, she was. Yep, yep, that's all good. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. We're on to item 6.5 on the agenda, page 40, with a motion from Mayor Otto that the motion that the committee recommends to Council that Council offers is in relation to Youngman Street, North Kingaroy, and Curb and Channelling. The Council provides a report to the Infrastructure, Environment, and Compliance Standing Committee meeting to be held on the 3rd of May, outlining the estimated cost to complete curb and channelling on Youngman Street, Kingaroy, from emergency entrance to the hospital through to the intersection with Albert Street, and councillors consider the inclusion of these works in the capital budget for 23-24. Have a mover of that. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Sorry, Mr Chair. I just wanted, um, it was my last motion, before we move that, I wonder with your consent, would it be all right if we just perhaps got, got some advice from general manager about this one? Because I don't want to put council through that whole debate process we just went through, if there's already something that might be... Yep, thank you. Is, is that okay? May yeah. auto, manager you. Meehan, do, we, do you have anything you can report or update on this? Uh, through through the chair, it, to be honest, again, simplified, we would do it pre, as per the previous projects, we would put a preliminary cost on it and add it to the PPT for consideration at budget time. That's 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 a straight up answer for it. And, and Mr. Chair, sorry if I could, just one more question for the general manager. Um, so even though this is on that, it's on a DTMR road. This would be a council responsibility because it's part of the footpath, curb and channeling. Would, would that be correct? Yeah, through you, Miss. Uh, through Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, that's right. It, given that we've been seeking an upgrade, count I would be thinking that TMR won't be looking to fund this themselves. That so would be a, a council call. that. That would be our expectation, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Otto. Just, and Mr CEO, is it, would it be fair to say a report? Thanks, Chair. If we uh, drop, Linnell drop committee recommends to council, we'll skip the ordinary and we'll just, uh, uh, council officers provide a report, the rest of it, so it'll be a report to the May Standing Committee. All right. No further speakers on that? Oh, oh did we move? Sorry. Yeah, Mayor Otto's moved it and a seconder was Councillor Potter. Thank you. Speakers, Councillor Schumacher. Um, thank you. Just with oh. this one, I just wondered, when the hospital was actually upgraded, was there any sort of infrastructure agreement undertaken with Council or Department of Main Roads around the footpath works? Is a question to GME? Yeah, management. Uh, three, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, there would have been DA conditions placed on that from the council's DA section. The TMR conditions was in relation to their access onto um, Youngman Street, and given it was a state government project, um, that was actually funded through the state, which we undertook those works on their behalf as a as a contract. Um, in relation to the the footpath works, I'm not sure it would just have to be checked as part of the DA conditions, unless JD knows. I'll just let James answer that for you, Councillor. That's good. Through you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor. Um, I can confirm the footpath was done as part of the hospital works uh, up there. I'm not totally sure whether, whether there was a, a DA, given that it was a, a state project. Um, and that may have been um, the gap associated with why there was no road works done at the same time. I think they did the footpath as part of the, the outcomes of what they wanted with their project, but I don't believe it was anything associated with an approval through Council. So um, the curb and channelling then is a separate, what we're talking about here would be a separate project and parcel of work that council would have to fund, yes? And yes. the reason, has the, you know, change in traffic, change in flows, is there a reason why the curb and channelling from Youngman Street from the emergency exit of the hospital through to the intersection of Albert Street, why that wouldn't have been funded by the Queensland government when they did the hospital or these other works around the entrance? Like, I'm just confused. 
Uh, through, through you, Mr Chairman, um, it wouldn't be a requirement of the hospital conditions at the time to install curb and channel. Um, theirs was in relation to the stormwater and the drain. The open drain was conditioned to be graded through there, which we did um, on their behalf, but there wasn't any condition to upgrade the front edge through there that we're aware of. So, um, Yeah, thank you. All right. Further commentary, Mayor Otto? Yeah, if I could, I'd probably just... Um, yeah, I think probably we're all aware of this section coming into Kingaroy, into town. I really think that um, on the back of what we've done with the KTP, I'm really keen to see council embark on a process where we support our team. I know the work that James is doing, Major James is doing in terms of our entries into Kingaroy, uh, around Walter Road um, and on both the north and southern sides of Youngman Street. Um, so I guess for me this is an opportunity just to perhaps have a look at, the, at one stage of that works that we may be able to do um, because, um, you know, let's face it, there's a, it's a busy road. A lot of people come into Kingaroy that way. And at the moment, it's very difficult for our roads and parks and gardens guys to manage that space without the curb and channelling. Um, so, look, the objective here, Mr Chair, is really just, again, um, to give Council an opportunity in our budget discussions to consider this one, if we can get a bit of a ballpark figure as to what it may cost. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mayor Otto. Any further commentary or for Councillor Schumacher, sorry? Just, just a question, just with the King Street intersection in this area, I know we talked about that quite a lot in terms of the crossing to the um, rail line and the rail trail head. Is there any connection between these works? Like if we were to fund this, I'm just thinking out loud here, but I know that that King Street intersection is a problem. There's been long-term conversations with the Department of Main Roads about that, around trying to improve that for pedestrian access. Is there any opportunity to, to advocate or work for or improve the whole area as part of this, as part of that project, or it would need to be a separate capital work project? Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, unfortunately, Councillor, yeah, it would be seen as two separate, separate projects. Project. Yeah, the scope of the King Street intersection doesn't extend that far. You would look at the <clears throat> the lead-ins into the intersection and where the rail trail is, <laughs> probably down to about Queen Street at the southern end and, and maybe up to the Bowls Club at the northern end. But, Not yeah, it, it certainly wouldn't go all the way up to Albert Street, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you. You know, I'm of the same view. By all means, we can add this one to the list. But, you know, the reality is this is... Again, looking at our, you know, competing priorities, I think this is a really tricky one. I do agree the entrance into all towns is important, but I also know there are many towns and many residents and ratepayers who have been advocating for curb and channelling in their street for a very long time. So to pick this section above another section, I would want to see the prioritisation and the, and the reasons why. Um, I know there's been some issues with drainage around that area um, that have been brought to my attention, but I know that's the case across the region. So, you know, by all means, I'm probably getting a little bit concerned. We're up to five reports, so this will be another report back um, to that 3rd of May standing committee meeting. I do still ask, is this the best use of our council, as, of our council resources preparing all these reports to, to go into a budget with a finite capital works program and and try to assess this against every other project. I don't know. It just seems like we would have to put something else off to deliver on this and with the long list of projects that we've got, I'm not sure why this one should take priority, why it should be considered and scoped above all of the others um, that we all have for our respective areas. So I'm just probably concerned about the use of council resources here when we know we've got such a heavy... Um, workload ahead of us with the reaper works and the like and note that our manager for work should be out on the roads not in his office writing reports thank you councillor schumacher final final response if no one else may order yep yeah thanks mr chair um yeah look just in response to that uh again look i've just really just brought this forward um uh, as an advocacy piece for the people of king Arroy, uh who have approached me um, some business leaders included have approached me about what they feel um, would be uh, to them is important in terms of the aesthetics, the drainage. Um, we've got this you know, major new hospital and at the front of it we've got this fairly um, 
f fairly, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is here, but you know, it's, it's certainly out of date drainage system there. Um, and, and I think, you know, because it's such a busy road, um, because there's been advocacy from community on this, um, again, I've, I had a thought this is something that really probably was just a wish list, probably wouldn't have brought it to the committee, but I'm of the view, Council, that this is something that is important for Kingaroy. Um, and uh, and if we, at least if we can get some unit-based costing, General Manager, you know, some preliminary unit-based costing, a little bit of indication as to where it might land in terms of the cost to do the project, I'd certainly be keen to see it come to the Budget Committee meeting um, so that it can be at least put into the system at some point in time um, for works in the next year or two so that we can complete that whole hospital precinct um, uh, in a more satisfactory manner, uh, recognising that probably I would have preferred this council to have said that the state government did it as part of the project, but it just, looked, it just looks as though it's an uncompleted piece of work that needs to be wrapped up. So thanks, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Chair. Thank you, Mayor Otto. Yep, no further commentary. We'll go to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. We move on to 6.6 .6 on page 42. Uh, North Street, Kingaroy, Curb and Channelling again, and uh, Councillor Erkins, uh, you've moved a motion that Council investigate the broken bitumen in Fitzroy Street in front of Southburn. No. Oh, I beg your pardon. North Street. North Street. North Street. Yeah. There was a reason for my madness, and we will get through it quicker rather than, than later. So, sorry, my apologies. 6.6 .6 North Street, Kingaroy, page 41, where the motion is from Mayor Otto that the committee recommends to council that council escalates the curb and channelling works on North Street Kingroy in front of the Kingroy Kindergarten for completion by 31 December 23. And the rationale is there, the section of North Street is prone to flooding. Council resolved to complete these curb and channel works. It would be preferable that these works are completed in advance of the start of the 2024 kindy year. Uh, Mayor Otto. Yeah. Thanks. You'd Mr. like to, we have a mover. Yeah, thanks Mr Chair. I just want to again with, with Councillor Potter and a second. Oh, sorry, I was just going to ask with your consent. Oh, right. Are we able to just get a bit of a brief overview again? From oh, the again, yeah. I don't want to put council into the bait cycle here if there's already plans to do the work. Yeah. I'm not aware of... Mayor, uh, so. Is that thanks, okay? Mayor Thank Otto. You. Manager Meehan, do you have anything in the system in relation to this? Uh, th yeah, thank you. Through the Chair. So this project is, is currently in the advanced design program. It originally was... Uh, looked at in the current year budget and was removed at the second quarter, similar to the other ones that were delayed out. Um, so if council was to proceed, they would have to bring that into their budget. We currently have a, a estimating um, what advanced design going ahead for that now. So um, depending on how council wanted to proceed, um, you would just have to adopt it into your into your current budget or your future budget to, to do that. Otherwise, we're happy to bring it back at budget time also. Um, if that if that assists, just depends on on how you wanted to approach, I suppose, so if that helps. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr Chair. Um, I, I think Council's probably across this as every bit as much as I am, but I guess the intention with here was really just to try and have this done before the kinder year starts in 2024. I imagine all the um, the parents and the kids will be turning up back there in um, probably February or January, February next year. So I thought it would be nice if we can get that finished for them before um, before December. Uh, hopefully we don't get any more major rainfall events. But if we do, as we know, their yard gets flooded terribly and the kids can't go outside. Um, and it is the only area really in that precinct, in that particular residential area that I've come across that doesn't have curb and channelling that's you know, a fairly busy space. Um, and uh, I, uh, I think our staff did go through and look at some other options, but really concluded that curb and channeling would be the best uh, outcome from a technical point of view, um, but happy to stand corrected. So uh, yeah, look, happy to have council discuss it. And yeah, where thank, we'd like to go. thanks thank Mayor Otto. Can I ask Councillor Jones, there was a conversation some time ago in relation to a member of the public had a, had a conversation in relation to what might've been an option there. Uh, have you anything further to add on that? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I spoke briefly with a gentleman that uh, does a little bit of work there and uh, he had other options, but I've also just taken a phone call from a gentleman that, well, a few weeks ago and I'm hoping that 
we're working the old uh, way through that uh, gentleman that has some uh, equipment and just asked for some uh, gravel and that to be dropped up to address the situation there and they were going to attend to that and I'm hoping that that may well be still in the process. But um, yeah, again, just while I'm up, Chair, if it's okay with you, I'll just express my view. I won't be supporting this one. Simply, I would support it, but I'm not going to support that we, we guarantee we have it done by the 31st of December because there's no guarantee we're going to have the money. I know we've had, we're in uh, serious design. We're almost to the uh, completion of design, but I won't support it simply on the fact that we've got some big discussions coming and these just keep getting chucked into the 3rd of May for um, budgetary discussions and... Uh, I'm not going to commit to this to know, well, yeah, I, I don't know where the money's coming from and I know that when we initially started it was about 50,000 and by the time it got up it was uh, increased considerably. So happy to support it and be in a part of the discussions and all that sort of stuff and if there's any, and it'll be a process where we have to drop something out to put this in probably, but uh, happy to work through. It is a kindergarten and uh, understand the situation that's there, but uh, yeah, I just don't want to commit that we're going to do it and then not be able to deliver it for whatever reason or someone else is going to miss out. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you. Yes, certainly supportive of the project, but a couple of questions about it. In terms of scoping, designing and constructing a project, in the space of a year, is it possible to scope, design and construct a project like this? Here's a question to GME. Uh, manager. Uh, through the chair, I, yes, they are. It, it can happen. Um, I think with anything, each project's probably got to look at what risk are you prepared to take. The reality is we will put up projects to budget, which we haven't fully designed, but um, if you're doing a resale program, we apply a unit rate. We do a resheet program, we provide a unit rate. Um, having that advanced design, I think when we looked at the budget meeting last time or the, the second quarter review, it was the first time Council's prioritised its forward design program, which was fantastic. We, we, I think that's a great step forward. We'll be looking to do that again at the next budget for next year's council um, to, to, to allow those conversations to have a bit early with some confidence. It can be done. It's just a matter of how much risk that we wear, I think, is the biggest thing. Um, if you're walking into a highly complex project, um, that it would be a, a risk. But if you've got other projects which are a little bit lower risk, it's a matter of trying to get some better numbers out of our design office. The worst thing that happens on these sort of projects is the low risk is when we get caught with a utility like Telstra or, or dark, uh, not dark fibre, um, MBN and stuff like that. They are where the risks lie in these sort of projects. So they do all have a little bit, but um, and I think the important thing is that when we put our budget forward this year, that council just understands what's the status of those projects. So, and the reason why James put this one on the forward design program, um, because we understand it was a priority for council to, to try and get this one sorted. It's been going around for a long time. Um, so we'll confident we'll come back with some reasonably much better numbers than what we would have previously. So I just want to confirm, so we had identified it for the budget. We then couldn't deliver on it. So we put it to forward design. And then from there, we're waiting on next year's, so 23, 24 CapEx to fund it. Is Am I hearing this right? Yes, that's right. So, so the idea, the projects that we delayed, um, and we would just propose them all to the council for its twenty three, twenty four consideration um, on how council wants to fund that. Not so just this project, sorry, other projects as well. So, by not by supporting this motion, basically, I'm saying we will fund this in twenty three, twenty four. But sorry, happy to be corrected. But that that would be my take on the resolution that you will deliver. Um, I just that's unless yeah. someone corrects me otherwise. So my concern is without seeing the whole capital works program and everything that needs to be achieved over this next twelve months, we are committing to this project in isolation. I do absolutely agree this project needs to be done. Um, my son is now 13 and he was the first cohort of kindergarten children to go into, into the new kindergarten. Um, so I know it's been a very long time that, that um, this issue has, has been in Kingaroy um, for that kindergarten group without any curb channelling. And the fact is that all the water does flood into the area and makes the driveway quite boggy because the driveway was never properly constructed. So 
I do understand all of that, but my concern is here we are again sort of saying we we are going to we're going to fund this project without looking at that long list. We've had discussions with Tingura mm -hmm. about curb and channeling. We've had discussions in Blackfoot about curb and channeling. We know there are priorities across the region. I don't disagree. This was funded just like the Drayton Street footpath was funded and it should be considered in our next project. But what I am raising is by doing this this way, we are automatically saying there are projects that we are not going to fund that we haven't even considered or looked at. And to support this when I don't actually know how much, I haven't seen that advanced design or an update on how much this project's actually going to cost, I'm a bit nervous. I'm also nervous about the fact that I know we have a small allocation every year for curb and channeling and for footpaths and basically as part of our normal capex. And basically we would be using all of that allocation up before we even look at what other projects there might be on the list. So I would challenge, I'm not sure this is the best way to make decisions. I would much rather look at the bigger picture and consider this in the 23-24 capital budget as we have with every other project. Um, otherwise, there is a risk that I can tell you, all of us as councillors will bring our notices of motion in and say we would like to fund this in the next capital works program and we're making commitments without knowing all of the details. Um, I, I agree it's been challenging to balance the high priority needs with how much money and the resources that we have, but there was a reason why we didn't fund, didn't complete this project this year, and that was because we didn't have the capability to deliver on it. Thank you, Councillor Sherman. I go, Mayor Otto, could I just suggest to you in, in reviewing the motion that set a council escalates the curb and channeling, that council considers the curb and channeling works on North Street, Kingaroy, in front of Kingaroy Kindergarten for completion by 31 December 23, subject to weather conditions and availability of, uh, be it contractors or council or consumables, be that concrete and, and the likes. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion, Mr Chair. Um, look, if I think, if, if, um, if General Manager Me and Council did make a call on this until the budget was adopted in June, uh, if, if that still left you with a reasonable chance that you could, you know, kick off in July and get the work done before the new term started uh, in 2024, then I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, all I was trying to do here was just to give the staff enough time to get organised with materials and contractors. But if a June decision would still allow that to happen in time, subject to weather, as you're saying, and materials availability, yeah, absolutely, I'd be happy to go down that path and give council a chance to, to look at this in the context of the bigger list. Thank you, yeah, for sure. Manager Meehan. Yeah, through the chair, that, that'd that be fine. Yeah. All right, so are you happy to, to reword that a little bit as, as suggested? Please interrupt me if I'm wrong here, but I would be happy to make that um, that council considers curb and channeling works um, for completion by 31 December in brackets, subject to weather and resource availability. Close bracket. As part of the 2324 capital works deliberations, budget deliberations, 23-24 capital works, uh, budget deliberations. Thank you, Mr Chair. Yep, happy with that, Councillor Potter. You happy with that yep. motion? Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I actually don't think we would be having this conversation if we changed the ways we did things as council, to be quite honest. Um, through you, Mr Chair, because we, when they first came to council, we gave them a, um, as we do with everyone who comes to council, we give them a diagram and a list of different driveways that they can build. They chose that driveway that they built. When if, if we as council make it our part to go out to look at a person's property and look at a person's driveway and say, well, actually, this is the driveway you need to build because if they had built their driveways with the pipes underneath to start off with, we would not be here having this conversation about to spend a lot of money on Curb and Channel. I do believe this and I, this, I do believe this is something that we need to do as a council. A bit of time and money 
from staff up front will save us a lot of time later on like we're doing here now. Um, this is not the first time things like this has happened to Council, but I do believe that this is something we can actually stop in the future. Thank you, Councillor Pollock. I'm not aware just how long has that facility been built? Do, can somebody... Happy to take uh, Councillor Potter. Um, they only came to council with the driveway issue, was it last term or this term, through you? Uh, I know because they came to council, so, um, yeah, so they came to council sort of around the 2016, 2017 era um, with regards to doing their particular driveway. Yeah, totally appreciate that and that's history, so, um, yeah, we can't deal with a lot of history, but we can deal with things moving forward. Councillor Erkins. Um, I just would like to see this put into the same bucket as everything else. Let's look at it when we're, when we're doing the budget to see where it ranks in priority. I, I don't want to see it that we've got to complete it by 31st of December 2023. I, I don't care what it's subject to. I think it's really more subject to money and uh, priority. So I'd like to see it go into the budget deliberation deliberations and work it then. Yeah, appreciate that, Councillor Erkins, but as it states in the motion that Council considers the curb and channelling, so I think that covers uh, that it considers it, so. It's in yeah, the same. Yeah, it, it, okay. as the others have been worded yep. similar, okay. correct me if I'm wrong, CEO, but uh, this is a path we're going down with these motions this morning that reports and considerations be given to them. Thanks, Chair, but th and this one is slightly different, so this one will come back to the ordinary, given the given the um, nature of the way the resolution's written. It's not calling for a report. So if we have to do something, if there's an action, so unless if, if the intent was that um, call for a report to the Budget Committee or the Standing Committee, if that was the intention, Mayor, or is it um, otherwise we'll just flick this one up as a brief report to the ordinary for for the substantive resolution. Your consideration on that, Mayor? Yep, so a report? Yep, cool. Yeah, we so make that a report? Council, uh, uh, that a report on the curb and channeling works on North Street, so you just change council considers to that a report, a report be brought to the May Standing Committee on the... I'm happy with that, Mayor and Councillor Potter. That's where they're all going to end yeah. up, and so then get flicked through to a, uh, a budget process. So, right. if we can, if we could do them earlier, well, we will certainly try. But uh, we've got the budget meetings coming up, definitely with operational, so the capital has to be discussed. Um, actually, if, if I may, too, in in talking with staff, we've been with a lot of these projects, um, certainly at our level, and, and this is not for in depth today. It'd be more at the budget committees. But looking at a lot of these future capital works and we've got different levels of design. So uh, where there's the high level estimate, the confidence of the costing is low. Then you've got like a, a more detailed review and then a detailed design. So we've been talking about traffic lights and we've come up with a bit of a, a very simple system. So the risk assessment, the cabling, the what, what's the major risk? So do we have a design? Is it green, amber or red? Um, red being very high level, very low confidence. Do we have a risk assessment, green, amber, red? And do we have our public consultation done? So green, amber, red. So when these projects go up, we can actually put a very visual symbol against them and say they might have a detailed design, they may have a, um, a good degree of risk confidence, but we haven't engaged with the community. So. Um, for a project, it would be it will be suggested for a project to go through into next year's budget, it needs three greens. So the design is confident that we know that the cost is right. The risk assessment is confident that we know that it's been done and that there's been some form of community engagement, so tick, so they can go through. And that'll be um, part of the budget discussions. All right, we're all happy with that. No further commentary. Uh, we'll go to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you, that's unanimous. Moving on to 6.7, Fitzroy Street, Nanango Curb and Channelling with the motion moved by 
forward by Councillor Erkins that the committee recommends to Council that Council investigate the broken bitumen in Fitzroy Street in front of the South Burnett bookkeeping. Councillor Erkins, do we have a mover on that? Um, through you, Mr Chairman, can I just ask first, because I know I have looked at this with um, Manager James and whether that is actually in process of being done and is it um, flood damage? Council, uh, Manager Mann or Manager Darcy Kev, no, we're getting a, a little bit of a heads or tails there. Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, just to get some clarification, Councillor, is it on is it on the western side of Fitzroy Street or is it on the Caravan Park side? No, the other side. Yeah. Um, I'm not 100 per cent sure on, on the repairs associated with that. To, to be honest, I'd probably need to take it on notice. So I don't know whether we like it. It's a pretty bad damage. It is. It is signposted and and um, what's named by council. I I would have thought it was flood. Um, you know through the thing. So I don't know. Council so I don't know Erkins, where to go from here. Council Erkins and CEO, your advice would that be? We put this as a report to again. It? With, through through the chair, I'll say it. Uh, we would just follow it up, um, and if it's if it's marked for repair, we'd get back to the council on what its status is. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, so I'm happy to move that that they investigate. Investigate. It. Yep. Yep. A second, Councillor Potter. Thank you. Any further? No, Councillor Erkins, you got your light on. Oh, sorry. Councillor Schumacher. Just, yeah, further to that investigation, I'd probably like to better understand, has this been lodged as a customer request? What's some of the feedback on the issue? Has it been recognised through the REAPER program? I see um, through the report here today, we've been out on our network and inspected the network numerous times. Is there a reason why this, you know, has this section been um, actually captured and if it has um, what's what's actually going to happen I'm probably a bit concerned about actually sending officers to to do separate investigations and reports this isn't is would a report come back to council with this one or is this just something to let the staff know this is a problem it's probably a question to CEO Mark the way this reads as you gave advice on the last one the committee recommends to council that council investigate. Are we really just asking our staff to go and have a look at the issue? Councillor Shoemaker, can I just interject? Councillor uh, Manager Mann, you have something to add? Oh, sorry, through, through the chair, just to answer the councillor's questions. If council was to resolve that, we would put that through normal process, go and, and, and do that. Um, on a lot of your questions, we would have, be happy to add a question or notice if council was happy that we put a status, uh, that, that a status update be given at the next standing committee and the questions or notice or what's this if your question was what's the status of the of the issue we yeah. can add that as a question or notice and give council a brief update what we did with it if that was to help that would be the easiest uh way for us forward happy yeah. with that council Schumacher? i think so a question on notice because um i'm not supportive of sending resources to go yep. and investigate things that are possibly already in the system yep council erkins you'd be happy for this to be a question or notice yep all right. I have a mover of a question or notice. All those in favour? Move, move. Are we changing that? No? Yeah. You, 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 I was just listening. Councillor and Councillor Shoemaker's questions to ask is what's the process with these are reporting back? This one's a doing job. So I know I'm probably being pedantic today, but this one's a doing. So the committee recommends to council. Council investigates. It does something. So it goes and has a look and does an assessment and come back. To turn it into a question on notice, well, that's that's fine too. But the yeah, recommendations moved and seconded, and so it would need to be withdrawn by the mover and seconder. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. CEO Mark, in terms of process, this sounds more like a customer request, um, and I don't understand... I didn't want to tie up another report. We're up to six reports already today um, if it wasn't necessary. So that's hence my question to you. I'm happy to support whatever, but um, 
if there's an issue and it hasn't been resolved, it's probably a good thing for council to understand why. Uh, however, yes, CEO Mark, when it says the committee recommends to council, I'm thinking that means a, a report comes back based on what you've advice you've given council this morning. Yep. Yeah. Well, and and they're all and they're all slightly different as far as but they're all, they're all similar, but they're all slightly different, and they're all tying up resources. Where I was going in those first couple is that we're duplicating the same process as far as committee, then general meeting, and then a report. So that only so if the ordinary meeting changed the recommendation, we've just literally got a week to to get the standing committee report done. So if we know they're just coming straight back to the standing committee, we can and they're not a doing as far as a, a physical action as actually going out and fixing something or doing something. They're um, a report to come back that will hopefully give guidance on where they go from there. This one is broken. This one does sound very, and with all respect, sound very much like a customer request. Go and have a look at the broken bit of bitumen in Fitzroy Street. So it's, it literally is a doing. So it would go to the ordinary. We wouldn't action it until the ordinary. It would get its action at the ordinary, then it would go on. That's, that's how they work. So if the mover and seconder were happy to withdraw it and you just treat it as a question and notice of what's the status of the broken bitumen in Fitzroy, well, then we can just roll it back next month as a question, answer to the question. And if there's something that needs to be done, well, then it can be just done as normal uh, normal day-to-day -day business. Thank you, Mr CEO. Councillor Erkins. So I have been there with um, council staff some time ago and looked at it. So my concern is probably... It is, it is a, it's fairly close to the main centre of town. It's a gutter that the, the bitumen has broken on the side of it. The water's been rushing down there and it's been sitting there for a fair length of time. I would think that, you know, it really should have been repaired by now. So I'm happy to remove, to withdraw my motion and put it as that... Um, a question on notice to what is happening with that and when is it going to be repaired. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. So you're happy to withdraw that, that motion? We need a second for that. Okay. All those in favour to withdraw that motion? All in favour? Thank you. With now a question on notice, Councillor Erkins, in relation to that that motion's question. My question on notice is, you know, where what what's the progress on the um, area in front of the Burnett business? In front of you, what is the status of the broken bitumen in Fitzroy Street in front of the Burnett Business Centre? What is the status of the repairs to the broken bitumen in Fitzroy Street in front of the Burnett Business Centre? That's a question on notice from Councillor Erkins. Thank you, our guys will take that on board and come back with that. Hi, Mr Chairman. Prior to the um, following notice, the following um, notice of motion that I've put in, can I just draw to the council's attention that we have a relationship with the owner of the caravan park that this borders, but I don't think I have, I don't think it will affect my decision on my um, point about the curb and channeling. But should I leave while you decide whether? Thank I've you, Councillor Erkins. CEOs, do you want to stay or do you, do you believe you can stay I or do you want to stay. leave I the want room? To stay. Yeah, I would like to stay to be able to move the motion and okay. um, debate it. So do I go now while you discuss that? 
Thanks, Chair. So um, we'll note in the COI, so the relationship is it's a relationship with the neighbouring property, the owners of the neighbouring property, correct? Um, yeah. Possibly. Yep. Okay, then. So you would like to stay, so the councillors will now consider. So uh -huh. you'd have to step out while yep. the councillors consider. So she, um, just wanting to know what the relationship is. Is, is it. Yeah, yeah Councillor Erkins, is that a business relationship or a personal yeah. one? Thank you. Yep. Sorry. Okay, so Councillor Erkins is about to leave the room, declaring a possible conflict of interest in a relationship between the owners of the adjoining uh, property. Uh, put it to the chambers for discussion or a vote on whether Councillor Erkins. Uh, be present in the meeting. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm happy to move a motion that she's allowed to stay in the room because, honestly, I know I've been in the Nango with Councillor Erkins and Councillor Froloff prior. This has been a concern raised on a number of times, even be well before Councillor Erkins, beca oh, count she became a councillor. So. Uh, I don't believe that it will affect her decision making. I don't think she's brought it to the table for any other reason than she's been approached by members of the community. And uh, as I said, Councillor Froloff and myself prior to Councillor Erkins being elected, uh, this issue has been raised on a number of occasions. So it is a concern for the residents in the town and I don't believe Councillor Erkins will uh, make a decision that uh, is detrimental to anybody she's working on behalf of the community. So I'd like to move a motion that she she partake in the conversation. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Potter, thank you. All those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you. If you'd like to invite Councillor Erkins back. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. Welcome back. So that being said, and Councillor Erkins has explained uh, her circumstances there, that is in relation to 6.8 on page 43, uh, Elk and Fitzroy Street, Nanango Curb and Channeling. Uh, where Councillor Erkins moved that the committee recommends to council that council investigate curb and channelling in Fitzroy Street and Elk Street across from the IGA supermarket. Councillor Erkins, uh, do we have a mover on that before I ask you to speak? Councillor Erkins, seconder. Councillor Jones, thank you, Councillor Erkins. You like to speak on your motion? Sorry, there's no, um, I don't have to start from the beginning, do I? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so there's, it, it's a, right in town, there's no curb and guttering, caravan has stopped there to access the supermarket, no defined parking area, so I um, believe that we should investigate that. We, I understand we don't have the money to do it at the moment, but I would like to see it put into the, Bucket for deliberation at the budget meeting. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. Further comments? Councillor Shoemaker. How did you know? Um, I see we do have Elk Street recognised um, as, as a potential STIP project. Uh, at closer, so I know it's up near the high school. So um, I know it's ambitious thinking that 
getting the other end done, it wouldn't be included in the project. But um, I guess I'm trying to understand, as Councillor Jones said, this has been brought forward before in a previous conversations with Councillor Frolov. I would probably like to understand, is this already on a Ford Capital Works program for consideration? Uh, Manager Mann, yeah. Through the chair, like, we don't believe so. I'd say it would have been prior to the PPT and, and implementing a process to, to collect this information just just by suggestion. We don't believe it is, but we're happy to check. Yep, so it hasn't likely to be scoped. Yeah, look, again, I'm happy to support this. Sure, we'll add it to the list of curb and channeling considerations um, for the 2023 24 budget deliberations. That's probably my request to Councillor Erkins is that it gets added as have all of the other requests this morning um, for consideration. I don't disagree on it. I know it's a very important, so um, probably very similar to the other motions that we've moved. Council um, is probably my recommendation, Chair, that it's very similar in terms of a report. Councillor Erkins, uh, as Councillor Shoemaker has suggested, as in the others, that at uh, yep. 23 24. I'm happy for Councillor Shoemaker to actually reword that to. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. Councillor Jones, happy with that? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's the same as the other ones. I'm just mindful of the advice CEO Mark's given us to make sure we've got the right yep, report be brought back to the standing committee meeting, so it can be considered in 2324 Capital Works. I do, again, raise significant concern that by, um, this is not, in my view, a holistic way of looking at these projects. It's, and you know, I am worried about the precedence that we're setting. I'm worried about what this looks like in my community when I sit down with ratepayers where I have had very difficult conversations and said, yes, I think that's a wonderful project. Yes, I agree that needs to be done. But no, I'm sorry. I know council's budget is really tight. I know we can't deliver on that. Am I now to go to all of those ratepayers and say, well, you know what, I'm going to put a notice of motion up. Uh, I'll get it scoped and I'll get a preliminary costing and I'll push it through so that it's considered in the 23-24 budget when I know there's pages and pages and pages of projects that we consider. I'm really nervous about the precedents we're setting here, Council, and I'm just raising my concern. I don't think we should be politically or emotionally um, influenced in our decision-making. I think our decision-making does need to be on the facts. And I do know, as you all know, there is a long list of priorities for this region to um, deliver on. I don't disagree. I know this is a very busy part of the street and I think it would be a wonderful outcome if we could get the curb and channeling actually done there across from the IGA. I just honestly don't know how I'm going to, as a councillor, actually decide one project from another. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. Further comments, Councillor Erkins? Perhaps, Councillor Shoemaker, it's the same as I have to justify when I voted to do things um, in Kingaroy. This is in the central business district of Nanango, and I don't think, um, you know, putting it in, I mean, I'm not asking for it to be done, I'm asking for it to be put in, and I do think it is, um, you know, a fairly important thing to the business section of Nanango, so. Thank you, Councillor Erkins, as we have... Mayor Otto, yep. If I can, yeah. Thanks, Mr Chair. Um, you know, I'm happy to support this. Uh, again, I don't think Councillor Erkins is Councillor Shoemaker acting in a politically or emotionally motivated way or that's being, this is being influenced. Well, I don't feel influenced by politically or emotionally on this. I think that, um, again, unless there's a, a different process or a better process for bringing these things to Council, I think we have to prepare to consider them and work with what we've got, which is our standing committees, and councillors should feel free to come forward as Councillor Erkins has done here, and put forward issues that have been raised by her community as important to her community. Um, I think that's an important part of our democratic process. If we can establish a different process, I'm happy to have a conversation about that. But at this point in time, it is my understanding that this is our process, um, and um, in light of anything different or better, uh, I think that uh, this is still going to at least enable us to consider it, um, in a thoughtful and careful way, 
And at the end of the day, we as a group of seven people have to make decisions about what's going to work best for the whole region. And that's what those budget discussions will get down to. We won't always agree, but that's democracy. So, look, happy to support this. I think um, it is obviously something that the Canango community have uh, been lobbying for for some time. Uh, and I, th I would certainly like the opportunity to see some information from our team so that we can consider it in the budget. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Otto. Yeah, look, and again, great conversation about it. And as this seven or eight points before it have stated, it will all come down to money. And we all have passion about our divisions and our towns and our villages. You know I've banged on about Tingura footpaths, it's curb and channelling. We've banged on about the footpaths in Cumbia. We're all passionate about that and appreciate and Councillor Erkins the same in, in your division as we all do. And it's a long list. There is a massive list to get through. And we're adding to them all the time, but that's the democratic process that we're, we're challenged with. Where that money comes from, I don't know. We will we'll, um, work uh, constructively and see what we come up with down the track in budget deliberations. And again, appreciate we're loading our staff up with work, more and more work. But um, they always say, there's a saying that if you want something done, go to the busiest person you know. So you guys are busy, so well done. Yeah, you're going to get busier. <laughs> Thank you. All right. If there's no further commentary on that, uh, we'll go to the vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. 6.9 Sutton Street Blackbutt Upgrade Works. Uh, motion brought forward by Mayor Otto that the committee recommends to council that council undertakes the scope. Cost upgrade works along Sutton Street Blackbutt to construct curb and channelling along the western side of Sutton Street from the intersection with Colson Street to the intersection with George Street and install an access entry into the front of the kindergarten as part of the curb and channelling works, and seal the unsealed road edges in front of the kindergarten. A report with the above mentioned information is provided to the standing committee meeting to be held on the 3rd of May 2023, and council considers inclusion of the Sutton Street works as part of the 23-24 capital works budget deliberations. Do we have a mover for that? Councillor Mayor Otto, thank you. And a seconder, Councillor Jones. Uh, Mayor Otto. Yeah, if I could, sorry. I just wonder if I could there, um, with your with your um, agreement, Mr Chair, change it to as part of future capital budget, future capital works program. Um, I just know that this is probably going to be a biggie, this one. It's been ongoing for some time. Um, and it might be that we can't deliver it in 23, 24, but maybe we can bud we can get it into our program, our three-year program or something like that. So I'd be happy to just leave the, bud the budget side a bit open-ended, if that's okay. Um, with the leave of, uh, of the committee. Thanks, Mr Chair. Thank you. Mayor Otto, further conversation? Uh, we're taking the first line, first line out. So it reads without that, as I've just stated. Mayor Otto, yep. Thanks, um, Mr Chair. Yeah, really just wanted to... Um, Probably just put this forward for discussion. There'll be councillors in the room that um, I expect know more about this than me, but I certainly was, um, again, put forward by a member of the com community down there. Um, and uh, this, uh, as most councillors would be aware, is an issue for uh, the kindergarten, I believe, the daycare, and also for the school. Heavily trafficked road um, uh, and uh, hopefully would be... Um, one of those priority areas in Blackbutt that we could identify at some stage in the future as in need of work. Uh, but happy to, to hear the views of my colleagues on this one. Yeah, thanks, Thank um, Mr Chair. Mayor Otto, we're just uh, having a little... There we go. Um, second to Councillor Jones, you happy with that um, alteration we've made there? Thank you. Councillor Shoemaker. Um, thank you. My question is, are these works in our current capital works program or are they, they new? Thank you, Manager Mann. Oh, in our current capital works priority list. Uh, through the chair, there'll be, there'll be new ones to be added. There'll be new ones to be added. And so just follow up question, when we set a capital works program, we do tend to look ahead. How many years do we actually look ahead? Uh, currently, I think we're, we... We generally look at um, up to 10 years. We give a 10-year projection and everything, but we haven't actually prioritised um, what projects will be delivered year on, year on. That'll be one of our improvement items um, 
probably for, to go forward from next year is to obviously build that forward prioritised program so we have more confidence um, and then and look to work with council to enter into a forward program so we can have a bit more um, uh, reliability in our costings and our estimates going forward. But generally you would set a couple of years. Obviously council can change year on year on depending on what it wants to do with its budget. Yeah, so when we set the last capital works program, I do remember those discussions where we, where we went, we can't possibly do all those programs that's a priority. We can't do that this year. We'll look to do that next year. So I guess in my mind, I'm just thinking this is, again, we're stacking up projects here. I don't disagree. I think this is a really important project. Um, I did actually attend that kindergarten. I don't think the streets changed since I attended kindergarten there. Certainly recognise the um, importance of works like these and um, the importance of kindergarten services in our region. It's just another curb and channeling project and I guess it's got me thinking um, I'd like to better understand how much money we actually invested this year and in previous years around curb and channeling and um, what our annual allocation normally is because it seems with all of the motions that have been brought forward today, so that's probably a question on notice. I'd like to better understand, I know we've been through the maintenance program extensively, what portion of our budget we actually put into curb and channelling. I know it's often if ro roads take priority, so curb and channelling and footpaths take um, secondary priority, and I know there's little funds that we invest in those areas because roads, we have such an extensive road network, and ratepayers consistently remind us how important our roads are. I do recognise the importance of curb and channelling in terms of um, drainage, but I do know um, there are many towns in many areas that are advocating for the same thing. So with all of these motions, we're up to motion number nine, is it? Nine. It's all about increasing the spend on curb and channelling or considering which project's more of a priority in which town. I'm not looking forward to um, making those decisions uh, and particularly when we haven't got all of the information at hand. Uh, I think it's great that, yep, we'll add this to another list, but I would be worried what ratepayers and what projects we've got in those Ford Capital Works programs we're actually putting off again um, or considering putting off again to, to look at other projects like this. Um, we only have finite resources and so much money and this morning's just reminded me how difficult it is our job in terms of trying to balance all of those priorities. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. And I guess one a point that needs to be noted and not forgotten that we've been smashed with five major weather events in the last 12 or 18 months, which has brought this, uh, I won't say ugly head, to the surface, but it's 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 everywhere. Wondor has been smashed. Tingura's been smashed. Um, Crawford's been smashed with, you know, some severe weather events. So certainly appreciate these motions, but they've come on the back of some serious um, seasonal conditions, that's for sure. Any further commentary? No? Happy to go to the vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. 6.10 is old escrowed Benarkin upgrade and Mayor Otto has moved the motion that committee recommends to council. Officers provide a report to the Infrastructure, Environment and Compliance Standing Committee meeting to be held on the 3rd of May 2023 outlining. One, the estimated cost to upgrade the single lane section of Old Esk Road to double lanes. Two, to estimate cost to upgrade the causeway on Old Esk Road. Three, Council considers options for seeking external funding for these works. And four, SBRC liaises with the Somerset Regional Council as to options for collaborating and completing works to upgrade the southern end of the single lane section that is within the LGA. We have a mover. Oh, yes, um, if I could, again, with, with your consent, Mr Chair, would it be possible just to get a brief report from our GM um, before... Yep, I thanks, Mr Mayor. Yeah, yeah, Manager Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr, uh, Mr Chair. Yeah, through the Chair. So Council would be aware we currently have a large reseal package on that road. I'll say larger, a fairly decent reseal package on that road. The road is subject to some reaper on there um, at the moment, which Council... Um, brought forward into its reseal package to, to get that done. Um, there's a number of sections of road that we have done previous upgrades. Um, we have been um, looking at that road um, continually for the last couple of years. Um, so for us to, to look at that, it would just be a, a matter of probably looking at what 
what is out, outstanding there to do. I know Councillor Jones has raised this road with us on numerous occasions too around um, some, of, some of the sections there which are failing, um, which we'll be looking at as part of our forward, forward program. Just in, rela re in relation to it, obviously some of that road is owned by Somerset Council, I shouldn't say owned, um, controlled by Somerset Regional Council, uh, which I note in there, which would be a, a discussion around what their future plans are for that road. So um, for us, it would be a matter of, of looking at what what is fully sealed through there, or full width, I suppose, um, as opposed to what is not and, and what that may be worth. Yeah. Thank, no order, yeah. Thanks, General Major. Um, in light of that, uh, Mr Chair, yes, I'm, I'm happy to move that. Um, yep. The intention is really to get a bit of a concept as to what we're looking at here in terms of cost for that section. There's about four kilometres, I believe, I'm told, uh, that is currently single lane um, from the... Um, from uh, out near the highway, from where the um, the uh, sawmill is, uh, through to joining up with the new um, double lane section. So happy to move that. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. you, and thank you, Councillor Jones. He seconded that that motion. Further comments? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Chair. Jones. I'd just like to uh, ask the mayor if he would consider adding the uh, another dot point in there, the same as what he did up there, putting this in the future capital works because. I can assure you that we are not going to have the money to do this. We're talking, it'll probably be five to six kilometres that we're talking about, extending that um, single lane bitumen out to double, and then you've got six to 800 metres of uh, Somerset Region Road as well. <clears throat> I've been on about this. This road is getting busier and busier and busier. It's got heavy timber trucks, forestry trucks, and all that sort of stuff, but it doesn't you know, the by e road, all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of road, single narrow roads that are very, very busy and we're all trying to get funding. So would the mayor consider just trying, because I know, I know that we're not going to be able to afford it, but if we get it into the program for the future capital works program, if the mayor would consider that, adding that dot point down the bottom, future capital works programs or discussions for future works, whether it be three years, five years, 10 years or whatever. Another dot point. Thank you, and Mr. Mayor's uh, happy to add that in. Linnell's putting that up there as the final dot point, and obviously Councillor Jones has suggested that, and happy to, of course, to remain the second of it. Further comments, Councillor Shoemaker? Um, just a question, just with Old Esk Road, uh, is it state owned or council owned? You said controlled before. Through the chair, um, it's a council owned road, so yes, yep. Road. Yeah. No, look, I think it's an important road to look at, definitely, in terms of um, advocating to increase it to a, a double lane way. I know um, I've been driving out that way ever since I was a little kid. There's a hell of a lot of residents that now live there. There's a lot of um, new development in the area. It's an important connector road, and I certainly would like to see it see us uh, be able to improve the safety of that road by um, widening it. Uh, I can see the challenge may be that it would be, it will be good to understand the actual costs and how we might be able to approach funding it, mm -hmm. um, particularly from an external point of view. It could be a future LRCI project or a light. Uh, my thinking would be, however, that um, we could potentially stage it over time, like we've done with other large roads like this. Uh, and I think those conversations with Somerset Regional Council have to happen pretty quickly, um, just to understand where they've got it in their list of priorities. I possibly want to understand when the motion says SBRC liaise with Somerset Regional Council, um, Mayor Otto, would that be something you would do uh, in conversation with Mayor Lehman, or are you proposing our officers do that work just in terms of that advocacy piece? Is that something you're looking to do yourself as mayor? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. I'd probably um, be happy to see this through the office of the CEO or the general manager. Our um, our officers do that, CEO to CEO or, or <coughs> engineer to engineer um, at the operational level. Uh, if, that, if that's okay with you, Mr. CEO, uh, I'd be happy for that to happen at that level. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Duff. Um, <coughs> thank you, um, Chair Henshin. Just wanting to um, ask a question about the, the TIDS funding, because I know that um, um, Deputy Mayor Jones mentioned the 
by year road and that's a state control road and if you put forward a state control road I think you get all the funding and if you put forward a, a council road it's 50-50 or some contribution like that. I'm just wondering has this road ever been considered for that type of funding? And yes. Uh, through the chair I just asked my learning colleague the exact same question. Um, it's currently not an RRTG road, Lars Road but it is currently being looked at by the group. James is just saying that the group has requested the forestry tonnage on that road to, to look at it being assessed in the future. So um, to answer your question, it it would be one if it meets criteria that we would propose it to join the Lars network if possible. Um, obviously that opens up those opportunities for us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, Mayor Otto. Yeah, I'll just close quickly if I could. Thanks, um, thanks Mr Chair. Um, yeah, look, really the, the intent here is to probably try and get an understanding of the estimated cost to do the works on that on that single lane section. Um, maybe get this to a point, maybe where it's a shovel ready project that we can go and source external funding for. It is disappointing to see, can I say, that governments at the state and federal level continue to fail to provide sufficient funding to support regional councils with the infrastructure they need in roads and water. Um, let's hope that that may change at some stage in the future and that opportunities for funding on these key local connector roads becomes available to our councils and isn't left as a burden for the ratepayer. Because let's face it, that road carries a lot of uh, logging trucks. That can, has, for, has for a long time and continues to support the economy of Blackbutt and Queensland. And maybe it's time governments stepped up and helped our council in supporting our industry and our regional, regional communities. Uh, so hopefully if we can do this work, at least it puts us in a position where we can then go and advocate to decision makers around external funding, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but at some stage into the future. Um, yeah, I'll probably just finish there. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, closing comments. I totally agree there wouldn't be anyone in this chamber that doesn't feel that way in relation to state and federal governments and, and funding. We just left holding the baby all the time and it's getting harder and harder. So no more commentary on that. We'll take that to the vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you. 6.1 on the agenda on page 46, Morris Street Blackbutt upgrade. A motion moved again. Mayor Otto, that the committee recommends to. Yes, yes I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll, before I've gone too I'm far. I'm sorry, into Mr. That, John. I'll, yes. I keep doing this to you, Donna. My apologies. I just wonder again if we could perhaps get a little bit of background from General Manager Meehan. Um, Councillor Jones is, is over this much more than I am. I really just wanted to put this up to have a discussion. So as a committee, fellow councillors, we could understand what's the background on Morris Street, um, where are we at, what's happening with it, what are our plans with Morris Street? Because this does keep coming forward from the community in Blackbutt. And I really, I really with your um, consent, Mr. S Mr Chair, I'd love it if we could just have a conversation about this one and get yeah, some background. Thanks, Thank Mr you. Mayor. We'll go to Manager Meehan and... James and Kevin, if you've got some input into this, appreciate it. Uh, through through the chair, so Morris Street has, has been a project that's been on the uh, radar for quite some time. I think it was proposed um, in a couple of past budgets, but didn't quite didn't quite make the funding stream. I think we looked at it at LRCI or Works of Queensland at one stage. It is in the PPT um, again, similar to the other projects. Um, it's a it's an unsealed road within a, an urban area. We did knock off a few of the, uh, the ones in other towns at the time previous to it. Um, so we, we added it to the PPT for future consideration. Again, from a design progress, we haven't made a lot of progress through there. It would, would be a, a bit of work to do this. So we have a preliminary estimate in there. I think, don't quote me on it, but previous years it was in the excess of five to 600,000 a couple of years ago is what we were looking at. So. And I'm happy to be corrected too, but I do believe it's the only unsealed road in the urban area in Blackbutt. I'm happy to be corrected on that, but that's how it made it to the PPT. We, I think we we did one in Pross and we did one or two in, in other areas. We did Logan Street in Kingaroy. So uh, there was a, a brief list of those projects added onto the list. So that's the background, uh, Chair, if that is this. Thank you, General Manager Meehan. Um, with that, uh, we have a mover for this motion, Mayor Otto, and a seconder, Councillor Jones. Conversation? Councillor Jones? Yes, I guess, uh, like I said, I brought this when we'd, you know, we we discussed this. All the councillors have seen it. Uh, we went away. Um, the staff have done a preliminary costing and all that sort of stuff. We had costings done for the uh, 
the length of the uh, dirt section of Morris Street goes down and collects down near the uh, council chambers or the library in Blackbutt. And we also had the additional bit up the top that joins from Morris Street to the next one over. I can't remember what it was called then, but that was all part of the costings. I've copped a lot of uh, criticism flack over that because uh, we had it in the budget or we were putting it forward in the budget anyway. We didn't get it. I didn't get the support of the chamber. We went elsewhere. The money was taken and now we'll have to... If this was to come back on, um, you know, like everyone says here today, we've all got priorities in our own region. This would be one that I would consider a priority for Division 2. Um, but in saying that, I know that there's a lot of other issues right across the region. There's uh, unsealed roads in all of our smaller towns, Wandai, Mergen, probably all have them as well. And uh, Proston's probably still have some. I know Nanango's got some. And uh, yeah, so it's right across the region. And again, this just comes down to a conversation, but um, it just keeps getting recycled and uh, nothing seems to ever happen with it. So we'll just go through the process again and put it in there for discussion. Thank you, Councillor Jones, for the comments. If not, Mayor Otto to close. You happy? All right. Those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Takes it to 6.12 on page 48. This one is mine. <laughs> yes. The motion is that I've moved forward that the committee recommends to Council that the South Burnett Regional Council undertakes a preliminary scope and estimate to construct and seal Collier Street, Cumbia, and the Council consider this as part of the 23-24 Capital Works budget. And we have a, mo a mover on that. Councillor Potter, thank you. Councillor Jones is a seconder. As a mover of that, I'd ask to speak in favour of this. And, and the rationale there is the last part of Collier Street in Cumbia that is unconstructed, and the community have mentioned this to me on numerous occasions. Therefore, the unconstructed sheet Street should be considered as one of Council's prior proprietaries in the 23-24 Capital Works budget. Now, can I just add to that? Collier Street is the first street as you go into Cumbia on the western side of the highway. During the drought years of 17, 18 and 19, heavy transport used that road to access Nutrient Ag, which is the back then BGA. Uh, Nutrient Ag down the bottom uh, of Brook Street in Cumbia. They used that road to access the back of that facility to cart fertiliser and at the time... Uh, dry feed, molophos and, and the likes for drought supplement feeding. Heavy trucks traverse that road down and could do a like a U-shape and come back out onto the Bitumen Road in Brook Street and back out onto the highway. It was heavily used. We don't have a drought at the moment, but there is numerous people, residents live down there uh, and access uh, several parts of Cumbia, be it still Nutrient Ag, the church, um, and other facilities down that road. So I... I'll recommend this to my fellow <coughs> colleagues in Chambers today for consideration. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Schumacher. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I absolutely think this is straightforward. This is just an example of um, another street that we would like to seal or upgrade to an appropriate standard. I have been down Collier Street. It's certainly uh, worthy of investment, um, as are all of the roads that have been listed on our dust seal register. And I've raised this in the chamber many times before, the biggest challenge that we have around trying to communicate to community why one road is more important than the other. Um, I certainly welcome more costings and, and understanding of this road. Certainly think it needs to be done. Uh, it will be interesting to determine to determine the how. Um, but thank you for bringing it forward, Councillor Henshin, on behalf of your community. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. Councillor Duff, you were? No? <coughs> oh, Councillor no, Duff? I'm, I'm good. Um, just wanted to change the wording. So, and I think the CEO is already on to it, so that's good. Okay, so we have a slight alteration there. The South Burnett Regional Council undertake a preliminary scoped and estimate to construct and seal Collier Street in Cumbia, and the Council consider this as part of the 23-24 Capital Works budget and report to the May Standing Committee meeting as the mover on... I, oh, sorry. Danita, sorry, Councillor Potter. And seconder, Councillor Jones, happy with that? 
Councillor Jones without his microphone on has alluded to the fact that he is supportive of that change. Any further, thank you Councillor Duff and, and CEO, any further commentary on that? If not, we'll go to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you, carried unanimously. Moving on to 6.13 on page 49, Kingaroy Medians, Minor Refurbishment Works, works the motion by Count Mayor Brad Otto. You're right to go with this one. Thanks, Mr. The Chair. Committee, the, the committee <laughs> recommends to Council that Council offers, offices provide a report to the Infrastructure, Environment and Compliance Standing Committee meeting to be held on the 3rd of May 2023, outlining the estimated costs to complete minor refurbishment works on the following median strips, Traffic Islands and Roundabouts, and they are Fisher Street and Kingaroy, Moore Street, Kingaroy Roundabout, Youngman Street South and Harley Street East, immediately east of the KTP area. The rationale is there. Do we have a mover for that? Mayor Otto, a second to Councillor Duff. Thank you. Comments? Yeah, thanks very much again, Mr Chair. Um, look, this is really just to get, um, I guess I just want to hear the views of the co committee on this one. What are your thoughts? I know General Manager Meehan has looked at uh, a refurbishment program on some of these mediums, not looking um, to ask Council to consider doing any renewal works on the structures. More, I think it was just General Manager, some tidy up work. Um, I had um, a painter come to my house one day, if I can tell a little bit about useless information, as you call it, gets legend. And I got him to paint this bedroom, you know, how the children put marks on the bedroom. I said, like, you just paint those two walls, not these two over here. And he said, but the problem is, when you paint those two walls, they're going to laugh at those walls because these ones will look so good and that'll look so bad. And I just wonder if we could perhaps see this as potentially the start of a program of starting with the KTP and starting to just work from the centre out and start to sort of just tidy up some of those um, that, those median strips because I think the KTP is laughing at some of the median strips that are on the fringe of the CBD now, General Manager. Um, so look, it's really just for, for discussion. Um, I know Youngman Street South had been in the capital program for new renewal and upgrade. Um, whether we were to go with that or whether we want to consider just doing a bit of a tidy up in the in the interim period, I'm not sure what the cost would be. Um, but probably would be, you know, again, guided by our, by our engineers and guided by council as to which way you'd like to go with this. Um, but really, it's just about doing, I guess, a bit of a tidy up a refurbishment, maybe some spray cleaning and some, some paint work. Um, thanks, uh, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mayor Otto. Further comments? Councillor Potter. Yeah, thank you. I actually put a request in to do just that recently with regards to um, cleaning of all the... Um, medians and also at the crossings and things like that because as you look around the towns there's a lot of the pedestrian crossings that used to be cream and you know pale coral whatever color it is I really don't know um, but they're all they all are dirty they're moldy um, and they don't look very nice it's not a good look for our town um, and I do I don't know where that's sitting but I think you were looking at doing a program up if I'm right a manager so with regards to that, because we did have that discussion. So maybe we could look at changing um, your report here to um, maybe working on a program for um, the cleaning of the medians and um, chicanes and things like that in the South Burnett. So, and not just limited to, because this is just limited to Kingaroy, and I, I do believe it should be um, right across the South Burnett. And it's something that will make the towns look a lot nicer. Uh, yep. Okay, so you'd like to put in there, uh, Councillor Potter, in relation to that estimate cost to complete minor refurbishment works uh, and uh, cleaning slash. Uh, through the chair, uh, we 
looking at this one here, what we would do, uh, we have a design that was put down for Youngman Street that um, we considered at the time. What we would generally do there is our intent would be to probably apply a unit rate across the medians on Haley for that same design, which is the no fines concrete and the in the trees through there. We would be able to give a, a rough estimate of what it's costing us a square um, to, to probably go through and refurb some of those ones. As far as doing a larger um, a larger program across the, the south, and it, there's a number of these that come up. And, and they have been since since council was in, we've had different ones. Yeah, our suggestion there would be is that maybe from a capital point of view that um, part of your design program, maybe for 23, 24, the council start to establish proposals for the refurbishment of medians across all um, across the CBDs. Um, just suggestion for the cleaning one that um, council considers options for a, um, a median um, cleaning, I suppose, um, as part of its um, maintenance budget for next year. So the reason reason why I bring that up is we will be looking at obviously the CBD cleaning as part of our general maintenance, and there might be an option there that you know if council pull back on some of that, then there might be a, a program that goes conjointly with that to clean some of these up. I know too that expectations are need to be met as well around some of these ones that if we clean, like we looked at Moore Street, um, oh, sorry, Fisher Street, apologies. Um, and if we were to pressure clean that, we would blow the paint clean off them, um, which would make it look worse. So it's a it's a bit of a bit of a hybrid thing to find a one size fits all. So that would be our suggestion, um, and particularly in the time frame. Like, and I don't mean it's, it's a short time. It's just a it's it's a um, there's a body of work there for us to come and give council reliable information. Um, so we would provide a, a rough estimate over those to if we refurb them, um, and then obviously look at you know what we could do in the future years if council wanted to have a forward program, uh, similar to what we've done with streetscapes and those other projects. I know we've looked at um, other sections and in, in in different towns as well. We had proposals to do footpaths in in some towns in relation to these areas. Um, council develop a forward program as part of its twenty three twenty four advanced design budget. So to give a little bit of, again, a little bit of diligence around what these could look like. Just, Thanks, just a Manager suggestion. Man, I'll just uh, yeah, CEO I? Mark, you have something to add? Councillor Potter, just I'll come back to you in a minute. CEO Mark. I just, oh, thanks, Councillor. Um, the only one with this one, and, and we've been sort of all working on this journey today because all these are capital reports. You're now going to start to break out into operational. We have the operational budget coming for infrastructure on the 19th and I'd really like point three taken out and left your powder dry for that meeting because you'll have an operational budget at the on the 19th or at least put it in its own line because like that one really belongs at that budget committee meeting on the 19th for discussion not rolled into a capital program and then we're starting to mush up a whole heap of capital reports and sticking in an operational report. Happy um, Councillor Potter. So, did we want to remove that and then I'll move that as a separate motion thank you. after? Yep, yeah. happy with that. Mayor Otto, yeah. to remove that. And Councillor Potter, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Councillor Schumacher. Um, the, I have moved a motion about this previously, and there was a comprehensive report that came back to Council that um, Cody had actually prepared in partnership with the Parks and Gardens team, which um, at that point in time, Jed Brennan was the acting manager for infrastructure. Uh, my question would be, can that report please be recirculated? I did go looking through my records and I, I couldn't find it. Um, I think it's important that we all take a good look at that report and some of its proposals. At that point in time, I was actually advocating for a dedicated fund that council would put as part of its annual budgeting process whereby we would start to do chip away at some of this work over time. Unfortunately, that wasn't supported by council as part of the council, um, the budgetary discussions that we had and the reality of the constraints that we faced and the reality of trying to stretch our maintenance budget um, further. So um, I think there could be some learnings and some findings in that report relevant to uh, the motion put forward here. Certainly happy to consider works like these in the 23-24. I actually was very um, disappointed when uh, we had actually packaged up work for Youngman Street, the roundabout in front of Ken Mills and Rikies all the way through to the KTP footprint. We had to forego that project due to the Wandai roundabout 
actually costing a lot more than what we expected it would. Um, that was an LRCI project and one of the first ones that I'd actually supported when I was um, when I was a councillor. It was probably the first LRCI project that we put forward on behalf of um, our community with Councillor Potter there. It was one of the only ones. Um, it had also been through Works for Queensland COVID funding, I believed. Uh, however, the costs were escalated and it was, um, it was not funded. So I'm very passionate. I'd love to see Fisher Street and Moore Street are in my division. Certainly have had plenty of conversations with um, residents in that area. There are a couple of roundabouts, one on Raintree Avenue that um, the Parks and Gardens crew actually did put some shrubs in, which looks wonderful. There's another just not far from where your mother lives, um, Councillor Henshin, which was overgrown with weeds. And I put through customer requests and work with the team and we actually got some um, little shrubs planted in there. I think there are some minor things that can be done to improve them. I see there's some works happening on one down on Alford Street. I think it's a matter of when and how um, what resources we have at the time and what capability or capacity there is for our staff to do some of that work. Don't disagree, it shouldn't be, un shouldn't be forgotten infrastructure. I do believe there should be a designated fund for it. But the question, uh, three years in this term, is still how? How do we fund infrastructure like this and make this a priority when we have so many roads that need funding and support and that takes priority above everything else. So um, whoop, happy to support the motion, bring forward another report and um, we'll consider it with all other considerations as part of the 23 Capital Works, 23 Capital Works program. But do recognise this is a lot of work for our staff to continue to do without any promised outcome. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. Councillor Duff. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I support 100% that because I, I, I agree that it would make such a difference if you could just tidy those meeting strips up. But I'd also like to add Lamb Street to that because um, every time I go into Mergen, I just think it would be just there's only there's a couple of meeting strips there that are, that if you just painted them like the colour that uh, terracotta with a white trim or something like that would just make such a difference. And I know that I've spoken to General Manager Me and on numerous occasions about this and, and I think you were going to put it forward as a as a proposal to do that as part of a package so just I, I just think that is it possible to add some of these other streets like Lamb Street or because that's just all King Arroy and I also agree with Councillor Potter there's just some that just need um, the mould taken off so I'm keen to support a second motion but I'm just thinking that just even with a refurbishment one I'd just like to see some options with Lamb Street. Thank you, Councillor Duff. I think the intent of the motion was, as the Mayor's stated, the streets here, and I think the streets in other towns will certainly be under consideration. But, Mayor, you'd like to add something? Yeah, thanks. It was really probably just to try and, I guess, tidy up around the KTP, um, you know, those, some of those, you know, inner, inner town. Um, but I'm happy to put Lamb Street in if, if Council, or if it was more cost effective to do it while we had contractors on the job. If it was resolved to slip down and do Lamb Street at the same time, I do agree. It's like these ones; it's pretty untidy. I, I do just want to clarify um, through through Mr. Chair that this is really just um, not wanting to overstate this. This is my view is from having a look at them, and I'm not an engineer, but they do look reasonably structurally sound. Not all, but most of these um, this infrastructure. There's one up Fitcher Street that needs some concrete work um, up near the Apex Park, but the majority of them are fairly structurally sound. So I'm hoping that when the report comes back, committee, that we're really just looking at a clean and a repainting exercise here. Um, and hopefully we can give that work to uh, some local contractors to do. So um, based on our tender process and how that all pans out. But um, yeah, look, really just looking at cleaning and repainting here. I guess if it's that we've got to then start rebuilding some of these because our engineers are saying they're not structurally sound, well, that's a whole nother conversation again about a big renewal program across the region. But this was really just about, can we do a bit of a clean up, uh, a clean and a repaint on some of these highly trafficked um, median strips and chicanes and things that are in around central Kingaroy. Um, but certainly with the will of the meeting, happy to add Lamb Street, um, um, Mr. Chair, uh, if, if uh, the committee feels that that's uh, worthwhile including. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep, well, we have, the motion in front of us as it stands at the moment. Councillor Duff. I'd like to move an amendment that we add Lamb Street. Thank you. Mr. 
Yeah, we're going to add that in. So Mayor Otto and Councillor Duff is the seconder. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy to have that as long as there's going to be a process whereby we then look at the rest of the region. I heard Councillor uh, Jones say, and Councillor um, Potter said, there could be others in other parts of our communities in Menango or who knows where that could also need this work. So, I mean, this was probably a stage one process. Um, yeah. But, yeah, look, I'd like to think that at stage two, we're going to consider this as an ongoing program across our and all our communities, uh, thanks. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. Mayor, and I'm sure Councillor Erkins has got some in, in Nanango and and um, Councillor Jones, he's probably, that doesn't got any in Blackbot, but um, yeah, no, happy for that. So we've we've added Am, Lamb, Am, Lamb Street in Mergen into that uh, motion as well. No further speakers, we'll go to the vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you. Um, excuse me, Mr Chair. Councillor Potter, sorry. Um, yeah, I'd like to move a motion off the floor, please, um, with, in conjunction with that last motion that we, um, we took the, the wording out with regards to that council, um, not too sure about the wording, whether the committee recommend the council, Mr CEO, whether you want that in, or whether the um, the council look at a median cleaning program, which includes the pedestrian crossing, chicanes um, and median strips. If we just put the word medians, will that include chicanes, pedestrian crossings, um, GM, median? Uh, through, uh, through the chair, you can, I'll probably leave it as, um, medians and, and pedestrian crossings. So um, we'll, we'll pick that up from there and, and float that back to council to say what, what additional money that might cost you to, to implement. Um, I think the intent is that council is looking to clean, you know, it's painted or it's coloured infrastructure essentially through through areas. So note that some of it needs to be redone before it's cleaned if it's um, buzzed at all. Um, can I just um, reword that, sorry? Um, just maybe a cleaning and refurbishment program maybe because some of them, once they start cleaning them, as you're talking about, the you may come across with quite a few issues um, and they actually may need fixing and, and um, is that the wording you would prefer? Councillor Potter, as in the previous motion, it states minor refurbishment works um, and I guess, again, the 23-24... Um, budget deliberations? Yeah, so this would actually have to go to, I believe, um, this would have to go to the operational budget meeting on the 19th. Is that correct? Okay, thanks, Chair, if I can. So prefer refer, so prefer and, and appreciate you you're dropping it down here, keep capital and operational separate. So I was thinking that Council um, considers that the uh, budget committee meeting on the 19th, a cleaning program for median and pedestrian crossings. So then it'll just drop it straight into its operational discussion because you'll have the whole operational budget. And I suspect I know the, some of the answers to this already, but anyway, it'll be, it'll be a good old discussion. Thank you. Yep. yep. I agree. You may. <laughs> yeah, probably not. The council, uh, oh, no, no, can you put them all back? It's just the front end. <laughs> council. Consider it the, as part of the operational budget discussions. Uh, I'll count the budget budget committee meeting of the nineteenth of May, April, April. Okay. The the the. Um, can we add to that for the whole of region? Sorry.
Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. And I will move that. Councillor Duff. So we have that. Uh, Councillor Potter has moved that the Council consider as part of the Budget Standing Committee of April, uh, 19th of April, an operational budget discussion for a cleaning program for medians and pedestrian crossings within the region. All those in favour? Thank you, unanimous. Okay, we've got two left uh, and I'm sure we're getting hungry. Is anybody getting hungry? No, Councillor Jones wants to stay on. 6.14 on page 50 of your agenda is Walter Road, Kingaroo Mediums Renewal Works. Uh, Mayor Otto has mo brought the motion forward that the com Yes, I've, I've not caught his eye, so he's right to proceed that the committee recommends to Council that Council officers provide a report to Infrastructure, Environment and Compliance Standing Committee meeting to be held on the 3rd of May outlining the estimated cost to complete minor renewal works to improve the condition of median strips and traffic islands on Walter Road, Kingaroy. Council completes these works in conjunction with DTMR works scheduled for the intersections on Harris Road and Knight Street. Do we have a mover for that? Mayor Otto, a seconder, Councillor Duff. Speakers? Yes, yeah, so, thanks again, Mr. Chair. Um, and again, I could be a little bit flying blind here, so I'm probably, again, keen to hear from our general manager as to the works that DTMR are doing on Walter Road. I guess the concern is that DTMR are doing a lot of work out there on those intersections. Um, and then again, we're going to end up with these busted and broken, ugly median strips coming in past Mitre 10 and Bunnings coming into Kingaroy, which are going to lead into all this new infrastructure at Harris Road going down to the roundabout at Knight Street. So I just wondered whether the committee was prepared to consider us having a look at this and saying, well, should we actually be looking at all those median strips from the from the Rogers Drive roundabout right through to um, where Harris Road or before Harris Road? Because on the Kingaroy, Kingaroy Kuya Road corner there, if you actually have a look at that that island there, the concrete's all busted and broken. I'd, I'd go as far to say these are the worst median strips in the South Burnett. I haven't seen any as bad as this. And I was told at the last meeting that we've got 7,000 cars a week go through there. So I'd suggest that this is the busiest road in our region. And I also suggest that it's probably the most dilapidated piece of infrastructure we've got. I would like to think that DTMR might put their hand in their pocket and fund it, but I don't know what our chances would be there, Councillor Jones. But I just thought while that work's being done, you know, do we want to leave it as it is or do we want to seize the opportunity to try and do something? Because seriously, councillors, it's a very busy road coming into our main centre, our main town, and it look, it is, you, I'm sure you're all aware of it. I mean, it just does need work. Um, and I think we're going to notice it even more once DTMR have finished their work. So happy to hear from the committee and, uh, and our officers. Thanks, uh, Thank thanks you, Mr. Mayor Mr. Otto, Chair. Perhaps uh, Manager Meehan could put, have some input into this. Yeah, uh, through the Chair, just, just a couple of comments there. Um, so T TMR are there at the moment. They've commenced the widening works. Uh, they will be back later in the year to do the roundabout at, at Walter Road. Um, so there will be, obviously, councils aware of the larger larger roundabout to go in there. So they will do the widening, work on the intersections, um, probably north of Bunnings um, through Harris Road and whatnot, um, complete that work and they'll return. At this stage, they are expected to return later in the year um, to do some, to the work on the roundabout. The main reason for that is that they are waiting on materials like the rest of us. Um, it's, a, it's a supply and demand issue at the moment. Um, so we expect that that will commence later in the year. Just in regards to the meeting, the, the mayor is right. Though We believe that those um, those medians would not just be infilled, they'd have to be replaced. Um, and I think that's fairly evident by some of the cracking in there. I'm not saying that they'd all have to come out, but I, I would think that once you start ripping ripping them out, you might as well take the lot if, you, if you're gonna do that. Um, there's probably two options for council. You can either infill them with concrete. Um, we obviously, whatever design we would do, we would have to talk to TMR and get that approved through, through what that looks like. Um, so there is an option there to, like we can put a preliminary price across that again, um, and to to value that. Um, again, you would be risk until you until you design, which is what we found out with Yarman. We can put a price through to landscape, and we can put a price through to uh, to do um, hard fill con concrete JD or no no um, no fines concrete, uh, similar to what we've done in other areas as well. So, um, depending on what council wants, there just probably if you want to get a feel for the price of what that's worth. Um, and then you can consider yeah, how you want to take that forward, I suppose. Um, there's, again, there's always option to put that into a forward program for later on. Um, 
just a matter of how you want to actually fund those works will be the be the main one. Thanks, General Manager Meehan. Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Chair. Um, just with regards to this parcel of work, thinking back, um, I'm pretty sure there was a recent DTMR, recent report about DTMR's contribution to street trees in the area, quite a significant number of street trees that would run along the Walter Road Reserve. Um, I can't think when that report come to council, but I was just wondering if there's any more discussion about those. It's uh, a three, three, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, so there, there currently is the, the current program of trees to be planted on Walter Road on the Western Soil James, um, which TMR are, are paying for um, as part of their project. But there's also the apex or the rotary, rotary apologies uh, to the community, the Rotary 100 years of services. So we have started discussions with TMR um, that we would do that work in conjunction with that. We actually have the contract for the planting of the trees of that section through that. Um, so we'll be the reason one of the reasons why we had that is is one of the discussions we want to have is to coincide those two projects together um, to make sure that we deliver that with Leanne and her team. So that last thing we want is team R six sixty trees in and then yeah. Rotary coming with a hundred and that doesn't match. So uh, we'll be working through that together hopefully. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it was sixty trees. Look, supportive of the motion, certainly agree that uh, Walter Road area is, um, those medians there are in need of repair and certainly with the Kingaroy roundabout, it would make sense to go through and do some work on there while um, the works are being done. I'm just not sure our ratepayers should be funding that work, to be honest. Um, and I would, I would probably struggle to put funds toward median strips and traffic islands in that area when I know there are so many other competing priorities um, and when I know there are other beautification measures such as planting up to 160 trees in that area at that, you know, over the coming period. So it's not that I'm against the motion, certainly agree it's an important project. I probably mm -hmm. don't like the wording that we complete these works. Um, in line with the, the work that DTMR are doing. I think it's something that we should investigate and give ourselves some time to consider what we'd actually like that to look like as you come through town. And I don't um, don't know if, you know, the 3rd of May meeting really gives us enough time. So I can certainly see what you're trying to achieve, Mayor Aldo. I think it's important, um, but I'm not prepared to commit to the works when I don't understand the costs or what we're at, what that work would actually look like. So it's probably just the motion that I'm not comfortable with the way it's worded at this point in time. If you're willing to make some changes, um, I think that would be good. Thank thanks, you, Councillor uh, Do you want me to respond? Yeah, thanks, Mr Chair. Uh, well, I guess probably that second point could be reworded just to say that I guess that would be the ideal or desired outcome, but may not be achievable. So. General Manager Meehan, I might go to you if that's okay to get your thoughts around whether we could say that, you know, council would endeavour to or consider. Um, what are your thoughts there, GM? Uh, I was just going to suggest to council to, to meet the intent. If council, if funded, um, yeah, if funded, um, coordinates these works in conjunction with TMR. And then we can go from there if you have, if council green lights it. Obviously, there'd be probably if, we, if council green lights it, there'd be a few reports in between now and commencement to go through the logistics of it. So I think that'll be okay. Just a suggestion, Mayor. Thank you. Happy with that, Mayor Otto. Councillor Duff, a seconder. Deb. Yes. Happy. Further further commentary. No. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Just to wrap up, I just wrap up, want to yep. say that um, just to Councillor Schumacher, I think those trees are primarily though on further northern end, but bit of Binger School. Are we getting trees out where these where these median strips are on that southern end? Because I think we've already got our trees there, haven't we? So that beautification work will be happening further north, which is really from the start of the Tabinga School sort of down towards Knight Street. So I still think that will leave this area, yeah. even though we're doing that over there, I think that's still going to leave this more southern um, entry point into Walter Road that comes in off Rogers Drive roundabout looking um, in a very poor state for our major town. And now let's face it, 7,000 cars 
I think this one, I'll be, I'll be advocating to have this one at the top of the priority list because I know there's a lot of medians to be renewed across the region, but there's none where we have 7,000 cars coming into a completely reconstructed um, set of work that DTMR are doing. So my view would be that hopefully the prioritisation tool will support it, that this should be a high priority one for us as a region because that is a major growth part of our um, regional area. So, um, but, but, you know, be guided by you, Manager Darcy, but, yep. Just I'll leave it with that. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. Yeah, three Manager chairs Darcy. to the Mayor's comments. Um, yeah, the, the trees highlighted in that project is really from around where that Bunnings entrance is, where the trees currently terminate, up to River Road. So that, that's what the High Risk Roads is, is looking to fund is, is around um, you know, replacing a lot of the tree removal that happened with the uh, other ancillary works through there. The work that we're doing with Rotary um, parallel to this is, is around looking between that river up to night section as well, looking at trying to get a lot of similar outcomes and objectives achieved um, that we know will get over the line with TMR based on principles of approval to the south and then just wanting to work with uh, Rotary if there are any leftovers um, as to where they may seek to put them. Um, that by no stretch of the imagination is this bolted down. It's, it's all in principle at the moment, but it, um, it is quite positive at, at this point. So just wanted to try and highlight some of the boundaries between the two projects. Thanks, Manager Darcy. If there's no further comments or questions, commentary, we'll go to the vote. All those in favour? Unanimous, thank you very much. 6.15 is the last one on the agenda in, in the section six of notice of motion. Scott Street's car park, public toilet. Councillor Erkins has brought a motion that the committee recommends to council that council staff replace the lock on the toilet door of the public toilet. Councillor Erkins, please explain. Okay, um, there's probably a couple of things um, on this. The vandals continually break the locks that council put on there. So at this stage, council have put a barrel bolt um, on there. So the issue with that is there was a gentleman approached me and he was walking past those toilets and heard a young child inside who had actually fallen into, because it's they're those stainless steel toilets the kid had fallen into the toilet and couldn't get out of the toilet. Luckily, she had not been, she hadn't shut the barrel bolt, but if she had, you know, I don't know how we, he would have been able to get in. And he was pretty upset at having to go in there, pretty, um, you know, worried about going into a lady's toilet to take a little kid out of the um, toilet. But I just wondered whether we can you know, what there is that we can look at to put secure locks, um, but if there is an incident that people can get into them, into the toilet. But I don't think a barrel bolt is really a, a suitable um, yeah, solution. Can, so I have actually um, raised this through council um, channels, mm. but it, um, you know, I just thought it, especially with the vandalism that occurred in Nanango at the public toilets mm. um, yesterday. You know, so, like some huge vandalism, and it really is a, a um, you know, all ratepayers are paying for this damage that is done to, to to toilets in the area. So I probably also wanted to highlight highlight that issue, and I don't know how we go um, about addressing that, but maybe we can contact the police that they do some more. Um, patrols past the the toilets, but the ones in um, Reg McCallum Park and the Scots car park. I mean, one's across the road from the police station, and one's two doors down. So, but it is a concern. So it's probably, as I said, I mean, it's really more to draw attention to the fact. Yeah, yeah. Happy with that, that. There is an issue. So happy I'm, with that, Councillor Erkins. Your motion is that council yeah. staff replace the lock on the toilet. Door of the public toilet, um, you'd be happy to move that motion, no doubt, and a second for it would be Councillor Jones. Could I perhaps go to uh, Manager O'May with some um, comments on that? I mean, public safety is paramount out here, no more than children. Jay. Jay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, through you, Mr. 
was to say, yeah, so as Councillor Aitken said, like the, the, the vandalism is the issue we have down there. So the normal toilet privacy locks that you have aren't very robust, so they get busted out really easily, and, and hence the... Um, the, the barrel bolt, bolt set up. But, um, so the team are investigating a deadlock system that has that indicator um, on it. I'm not sure about that accessing, so that's just something we just have to look at how we access it if there, if it is locked from the inside and you can't get at it. But, yeah, so they are looking at a more robust deadlock system than the standard toilet door privacy locks that are, are quite feeble. So, yeah, the team are actually just investigating that at the moment, seeing what, what suitable locks or alternative locks we can use there. Thank you, Manager and my Councillor Erkins. Um, pro probably one of the concerns for me also is there is a security camera right on those toilets, and yet we do have, you know, vandalism happen there quite regularly. So maybe um, that should be raised because if we've got cameras there that feed direct into the police station, and as I said, it is across the road. You know, like there's a falling down of somewhere that would that, that the community are having to pay for. So I just want to so raise that raise that to give an awareness um, of that fact. Maybe we can speak to the police. Thanks, Councillor Erkins. Um, see how Mark is. Uh, just uh, for councillors. Um, knowledge and understanding so each one of the acts of vandalism is uh, an incident report is filled out they're all reported to the police and we insist on getting our uh, QPS number so everyone is identified and has a number in the system if the police through that security or well, through any form of security camera anyway we will prosecute but it is um, there's challenges of that with age groups and everything else but every time and regrettably we um, the staff are exceptionally good at filling in the reports and doing because it's just devastating to see, uh, not just in Nanango but across the region, what happens. And we've done media before, and there's been stories. And it is a cost to the organisation. It is a cost to the community. But every incident of the vandalism, uh, the staff fill in the report, and we insist on our QPS number, and they are reported and logged. And we do prosecute wherever we find someone. Thank you, CEO Mark Mayor Otto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again. Um, Yes, look, I was just wondering on this, whether we could also just have a bit of a skip round, if not already, General Manager OMA, just all the toilets across the region at some stage, uh, obviously not tomorrow, but if our um, facilities guys could do a bit of a skip round and just check the appropriateness of the locks. I know we had an issue at Wandai Coronation Park with the disability toilet lock there. There may be others, I'm not sure, but um, whether we could just maybe just put that on the to-do list at some stage would be great, um, grateful for that. Thanks, um, GM. Yeah, the other one I wanted to say is, um, if you want to say, is that I'm wondering whether it's worth Councillor Erkins and myself going down and doing a bit of a media release down there at Nanango and saying, hey, community, work with us here. We're getting a lot of vandalism across the South, but particularly on our toilet facilities. If you do see someone, um, please help provide information to the police. Look, it might not help. I don't know what the answer is. We're getting this in Kingaroy far too often. I don't know about the other towns. Clearly now it's in Nanango. I don't know, Mr. CEO, is it worth us doing a bit of a media release to say, come on, community, work with us here? This is costing the ratepayers. Um, Sorry, Mayor, we'd be very happy to. Again, um, regrettably, the, the element that seems to do it a fair bit is is not, not, a, not a listening element. But, yeah, no, very happy to. Yeah, that would be yeah. nice. A, a physical face to it would be good, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Mr. CEO. And we could do that together, perhaps, Councillor Erkins. Um, the, the other thing I want to say is, just to finish a note, look, I know this has been an arduous meeting with all these notices of motion, but just to share a positive story, I went to catch up with my auntie that I haven't seen for many years, and I won't say where she comes from because I'd probably get in trouble, but she comes from a major central Queensland regional council area. And she came down here, and she's a woman in her 70s, and she's managed, because she wanted to drive over to Black Button and Ango and see where you know, her father's buried and her grandparents were and so forth, She's driven over the region over the last two days and she said to me, oh my goodness, she said, I can't believe how beautiful the South Burnett looks. I remember growing up here as a kid and seeing how untidy the streets of Mergen were. And she said, I come back here all these year, years later and compared to where I came from in our regional council area, the South Burnett looks so much better. The streets are clean, the mowing, the gardens. So can I say to the councillors, the hard work that... Uh, that is done is paying off. People, I believe, are noticing it. Tourists are noticing it. 
Obviously, she noticed it. So can I say, Mr CEO, to the councillors that bring these things forward, but also, more importantly, to the staff that are continuing to lift the standards of service that we're giving, thank you very much, because I know myself, when I drive through our towns now, they are a major improvement to what they were years and years ago. So I think that shows that we're doing some good work out there and people are noticing. Um, so I just wanted to share that story with everybody on a good note to finish. And um, General Manager May, General Manager Meehan, to you, Mr CEO, thank you for the wonderful work you do because the community are noticing it and you should be very proud. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I think it also needs to be noted there are some good people in our community that are, are doing just that as well. Unfortunately, we have a have a um, a section of them that don't. You know my views on that as far as I believe they're oxygen thieves and I didn't want to run into them in particular places. But um, Councillor Duff, if you'd like to add to this. Uh, <coughs> thank you, uh, Chair Henshin. Just um, on the Lamb Street toilets were getting vandalised and the staff and I think it went through council but we actually close them at six o'clock every evening and I and I know the Glennon Street ones were closed six o'clock and then we opened them up because there was homeless issues I'm wondering if that's an option to look at maybe closing those toilets at six o'clock in the evening or whether there's too many people using them afterwards but that made such a difference in Mergen when they closed them at six o'clock with the vandalism is just about non-existent so just whether thank you councillor Duff yeah provided yeah, yeah, provided um, I guess it doesn't transfer that vandalism to something else. Is something we want to keep an eye on, Councillor Shoemaker? Um, thank you, Chair. Just recognise that there is a comprehensive report in this agenda about our toilet facilities. Um, probably a question to General Manager O'May was, were all the locks, I can see in the report, something like 47 facilities that we have, were all the locks actually part of that building inspection around compliance um i guess you probably don't yeah we might deal with that when we deal with the report we'll have the officer yeah, um, available so mal will come in talk to that then just to understand that um and it's and, and the report that's probably, it's probably more around the structural condition and that than, than the physical than fittings the physical. but we can yeah we can talk to that when we do deal with that report i think would be more appropriate yeah sure look supportive of um, changing the lock on the toilet door of the public toilets in Scott's car park. Um, certainly recognise it's an important issue for Nanango uh, and all of our public toilet facilities. Uh, it's just probably not a conversation I would have thought we would have at this chamber like we've had with all of the other conversations. But okay. hey, I'll support my colleagues and whatever you would like That's to do great. with this time that we have. Um, I'll, sure, let's look at this. Probably just a um, question to CEO Mark is, does this now come back to council? Because you've got the committee recommends to council or does this actually just get actioned? Because it would seem like a waste of resources to bring back a report on a matter like this. Um, oh, before council, this one is a doing one. So it's, it's if council wishes us to change the lock it would come back for a brief report to the ordinary for um, endorsement because this meeting Mr. carries no delegation. Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, I Thank think um, I would like to withdraw the the um, motion and just leave it to our staff to organise that. I leave it in their hands. I'm happy that they do it. I'm happy to withdraw the motion. If Councillor After, Jones, after um, all that deliberation. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. So you're happy to withdraw that. Uh, and the second, Councillor Jones. Thank. Yeah. So we. Uh, so Councillor Erkins has moved that that be withdrawn. She's moved that. We have a seconder for that. Oh, sorry. The, the because it's been moved and seconded, the resolution is owned by the meeting. So mover and second are in consent. So with the leave of the meeting, it's just a show of hands that we would draw. Show of hands, otherwise in favour. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. We've come to an end on section six, which has been notices of motions. There's been plenty of them and plenty of deliberation and conversation with them. With that, I'd like to move that we go out of this uh, meeting and into a luncheon break. 
and we adjourn now to at uh, 103, I believe, and come back at 145, 150. How do my colleagues feel about that? Yep, and we have a mover for that. Popular chair, thank you, Mayor Otto, and a seconder. Councillor Erkins, all those in favour. Thank you very much. We'll see you back here at 10 to 1. Welcome back. Thank you, councillors, staff, managers. After lunch break, we move back into open. Could have a mover for that, please. Councillor Jones, thank you very much. All those in favour. Thank you. Councillor Jones, Councillor Potter seconded it. All in favour, thank you. We're on to number seven in our agenda, 7.1 on page 52, Infrastructure Planning Works, Construction and Maintenance Portfolio Report from Councillor Jones. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. And uh, again, you know, uh, to uh, present the Infrastructure Planning Works uh, Portfolio Report for the month of April, I'd like to present it as red, uh, Chair. Uh, it's there for everyone to see. There's a lot of information there. Uh, road slashing, our uh, bitumen resealing uh, program is well and truly underway and it will continue through. Roadside slashing, it's on our uh, webpage for anyone to have a look at. And uh, so I'd like to put forward and move that uh, my portfolio report for the month of April, month of April be received, yeah. Chair. Uh, just a question through you, um, Chair Henson. Just wanting to know about the approval timeframes for all the the reaper works, reaper submissions, and how long we. Um, when are we going to be finished all the flood stuff? Basically. Is it two Thank you, Manager Mian. Uh, yeah, through the chair, happy to take that as a question or no, so we can provide an update at the next month if that's okay, just on what the progress of that looks like. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Manager Mann. Councillor Jones? Yeah, just in reference to that question and, and how long it's going to take the reaper works and all that sort of stuff, can I, uh, and a fair question too from the councillor, but be assured that Western Downs and Toowoomba Regional Councils and the likes are telling their residents that the work will continue and be lucky to be finished by June 2024. So you know, in a, in a reasonable time frame with the whole program, we're talking nearly $50 million in our our region to uh, be conducted along with our our um, normal business. Um, yeah, so all the other councils are putting that time frame around June 2024, so I can't see us doing anything before the, or getting ours completed before then and I'll be happy to be corrected by our general manager. Thanks, <laughs> Manager Man. Yeah, th uh, through the chair, the time frame for us, I believe, is actually 24-25 um, is the financial year for completion for us um, in program. So, but again, we'll, we'll bring back some information to the next one to, to provide an update. Thank you, Jim. Man, and I, I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mayor, we did make the comment some time ago that it would be two years and in the conversation that I've had with neighbouring councillors and, and, and mayors around not just our neighbouring boundaries, but from here to the top of Queensland, everyone stated that it would be two two years, works in progress, without anything else major happening. So, um, yeah, I know it's frustrating for the public, but that's um, where we're at and there's a lot of work to be done in that space. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Erkins. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, on the uh, roadworks, the reaper works in Nanango, like I'm really um, extremely happy with the work that's been done. But just to get an update from you guys, that really bad section with the underground water, can you just tell me what's actually going to be happening there? So you're talking about Mount Stanley Road, Councillor? Uh, yeah, we can provide an update. Um, I'll just have to go back and check what, what the progress of that is with QRA. Um, again, there was a number of projects that we're working through to see what reaper we receive and also where council may want to contribute its capital money next year to try and improve those assets or do complementary works. 
And also, I'm not sure if you're aware, but also East Nanango Road also has, I believe, the same issues with as fast as you guys are fixing it, it's coming through again with the underground water. Yeah, uh, through the chair, so exactly the same scenario. We did some temporary works there last week after your, your email and we signed it. Um, Mount Stanley, um, Eastern and Ango, Seaford Street, they're in probably a, a high priority basket for us to have a look at, along with a couple others. So um, we're currently assessing them through with QRA at the moment to try and expedite those, noting that the maintenance is, is a fairly big impact to us there at the moment. Okay, thanks for that. And just, I know I did ask Councillor Jones's, but just to get it from the, <laughs> from the apple, not the worm. When there, <laughs> when there are, when there are um, potholes in the bitumen, and it's after rain, so they're still wet, but they're deep, they're deep potholes. So is the bitumen that you put in there, like the, is it cold mix or cold mix? It, that's just a temporary solution because it's too wet to actually do permanent, a permanent um, fix on that. Uh, yeah, that's right. So the, those repairs probably serve two processes. If you've got wet wet material in the ground, um, you need to either dry it out or come with a, a high degree of solution to do that. The other thing is too, we do put um, premix or pave line through potholes normally, which again, that might be the only fix that we apply to there because you don't want to spend $80 a square metre per, compared to 12 So it's a priority basis. But generally, if you see them on flood damage work, if they're emergent works, they're a temporary repair until such time as they get approved. Councillor Jones did actually confirm that, that question when I asked it of him. But I just wanted to confirm that so that when I answer back to my residents that I'm actually giving them the right word and not led astray by Councillor Jones. <laughs> Happy for you to ask us in the first instance from now on, Councillor. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Erkins and Manager Me and Councillor Shoemaker. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Look, I did my best here with your recent storm and damage and flood response overview, but I know I've consistently asked and I'm a little bit concerned about the risk around what we're actually doing on the ground versus what we're being paid to do and what the potential shortfall is. I read over the report that said we'd spent $16.87 million across five events and QRA had provided grant advances and a 30% payment on five reaper submissions plus progress of payments for emergency and immediate reconstruction costs with the totals equaling $8.81 million Council contributing an additional 1.15, incorporating trigger points and ineligible plant and payroll costs. QRA have approved submissions to the value of $12.019 million with a further $25 million lodged with QRA. When I'm looking at these numbers, and I just want to be sure, it looks to me like there could be a $4 million shortfall here that hasn't yes yet been captured for funding or approved by QRA? Yeah, uh, through, through the chair. So there's a couple of, couple of things that are there. So you have your emergent work submission and your immediate reconstruction submission. So what we've been approved to do and what we've been paid are, are two different things. So um, what we followed up with Red Frost is we want um, QRA to prioritise our emergent works and our immediate reconstruction so that we can understand what we will be paid for for works that we've had to perform during those events yep. and what that shortfall is. If there's any shortfall, we will return to council to, to walk through what that may be or how that's or how that's going to be funded. So that'll have to come from maintenance or or from capital. So they're, they're roads where um, we've had to go to make the roads safe or, or do works or, or whatever it might be. QRA have made an advancement of another three million this week, I believe, Kev, to us. Um, in recognition of our cash flow. So we regularly report to them. What we've done um, with other works is we're waiting for those approvals to come through before we proceed with those works. Yeah, that's why we're holding, um, to be honest. Um, that's why our, our, um, our reports have come up previously to say with the Reaper that's on the reseal roads, do you want to proceed? This is your risk value. Yeah. 
yeah. um, so that we're not going off. We're not awarding any contracts at the moment unless they are approved by QRA. Um, given that we had five events, you've got a large gap there as those submissions catch up about what we've been paid and what's been approved. Yep. We still have our immediate reconstruction ones from those events still being assessed by QRA. Yeah. So we're waiting for them to come through. The big thing that I think has been an issue for us that we've raised is every other council had events in the previous financial year and we had, a, remember, a raise with the KTP. We had an event in July in Kingaroy. That pushed us into the 23-24 year. So we went down, our priority was reduced. Um, we've asked for that to be restored because obviously um, your sentiment is well known by me and I've had this discussion with with, with others. Um, we want that risk profile closed up before we yep. go down the road too far. So that way, if there is a shortfall that we're going to be short funded for IR, for immediate reconstruction, before we go and say, hey, council, let's go and put some more money to this, we want to make sure that's accounted for so that there's we're not going and pulling cash and those sorts of things. So very much aware of the issue. We're just trying to close up the risk profile. And once those submissions catch up, then we'll return to council and say, well, if we do any proceeding, what do you want to do about it? So just a supplementary question to that. I probably want to confirm what measures you've put in place to manage that risk. So one, if I'm hearing you correctly, is you've escalated this with QRA around the time frame for approvals. Yep. Um, Two is that you're working through what's been approved, what's been submitted, and what you've been paid. I guess I'm just as a like as a councillor overlooking this, getting a little bit lost in the figures yep. like, and the way this is re reported. Um, so yeah, just keen to understand what what's in place to make sure we're not actually spending money that we don't have. Yep. So you're saying you're not awarding any more contracts. But I imagine you have awarded some contracts. Were they all approved to date or not? Yeah, only for immediate reconstruction and works that are in and around that, inside that Reaper is my understanding. So what, we've, what we have what do have set up, Mark, um, at Mark's direction, we have a flood damage governance committee that sits over the top of this, which is myself, Kevin. Ultimately, any variations are reported up through us and, and ultimately to Mark. We meet every Tuesday to make sure that no contracts are released without our, our, our knowledge. I shouldn't say without our knowledge, that's not fair. Um, without there being an approval process going through. So hence why council got those reports previously, we would not release those contracts without council being informed that you're carrying risk. The biggest issue that we have is that we had so much emergent works and immediate reconstruction undertaken during that emergent work period. You'd, all those approvals are retrospectively applied. I want to settle them now so that we can move forward and say, well, here's what it is um of what that what that might be the only reaper that's also done in that inside that is works that reaper that would all normally would have been covered by capital work so mount stanley road for a classic example there's a resheet on that road so the reaper will be claimed back against that if approved but normally we would have taken that work through council council's capital works program anyway so there's no that risk profile is managed within that work so if anything that should be a financial benefit to us so um, on page 63, you know, you, you've highlighted Mount Stanley Road and the, the risk of um, Scope Creek because of the long, like the long period of time that's taken from the time that you do that immediate reconstruction work, the time that you re report it, get it funded or approved through QRA. Yep. So I guess I was just trying to understand that even once the works are approved, I'm re the way I'm reading this report is that, you know, a road might have been approved for works of up to $100,000 and by the time you actually get to the works because the situation has worsened, it could be, you know, that you actually need to carry out $150,000 worth of work. Yep. I guess I'm just trying to better understand how we ensure the quality control or how we ensure what we're actually doing is, um, you know, it's best value both for our money and QRA money. Yep. yep. So through through the chair, so very good question. I asked the same question as well. So we have works out at the moment where we've gone and done additional works, which might be um, if there was a, pot, a, a patch from, say, myself to Peter and there was an additional amount, we would approve that work there. We then have to re-lodge that submission because if we left that much yeah. of work there, we'd 
reputationally you'll get shot. Um, you know, it's so we do look at it on a risk basis from my point of view. So those variations are signed off by Kevin and myself, um, and they're normally post off, and they're they're a small amount of money. Why we've got the submissions um, stacked up the way they are, something like Mount Stanley Road, we would not step onto that road without having an the, approval. Well, yeah. Yeah, so there's no there's no more repart unless there's an approval. Um, the other thing is to why we we're looking at high priority roads. So similar to what we did with Silverleaf and Campbells and those ones, is from our point of view we're looking at a risk basis. Reality is, do we think that there's going to be an issue on that road? We're having a, a good. There's an inspection done on the road prior to the work starting, but when we're talking about major schedules, the the stuff that Red Frost produce are very very good. We actually get a schematic map, so we've asked them for all the schematics that might overlap with the reseal next year um, so that we can deal with those issues now as opposed to reporting to council midway through the year and saying, look, we've got all these risks and whatever else. But if there was something like Mount Stanley, we would probably put a, um, a report up to council, but we wouldn't step off um, expecting that there would be major growth on that. Again, part of having a, a flood damage governance committee, we treat that the same way as I would treat a capital project. Someone needs to explain to me what we're doing on that road and similar to the floodway as well. So what's our treatment for that? We don't want the scopes growing up and down the road. So we do do a confirmation of that. And it's to be honest, it's quite a good team effort, to be honest. It's a lot of moving parts. Um, I think too, once we get our approvals in place, it would be good for Red Frost to come and provide an update of council of how that works. But just to, to, to probably put the, the ease of the risk more, and I fully understand the same reason why we have the committee, we're... We have a risk exposure of what we've got submitted at the moment waiting to be paid for emergent and IRW that we've done. We want that closed up so that we see if there's any liability that needs to be applied to us. No other reaper will be going ahead unless it comes up to council prior to say this is your risk of of, of that if it's not approved. So, and we aren't doing any unapproved reaper. The only reaper or, or um, uh, works that we're doing on flood damage road is if the road becomes unsafe similar to what we have done on Mount Stanley Road, and we did, um, the council just raised about East Nanango Road. So those claims go into QRA at the moment, but the reality is if they're not paid, we would have done that under our maintenance budget anyway because we have a duty to make that road safe. So so on page 65, you've got to the contract status, and there's, if I'm reading this right, there's an... There's a number of projects. So down the bottom, there's three projects at total $6.125 million that we've gone to contract, but we haven't actually got approval for. We're still waiting, pending QRA funding approval. So... Sorry, those contracts are being held by us, Councillor, at the Governance Committee. So they're not... So they're saying pending. Okay. Then they're not awarded. They're not rewarded. Yeah. So, so to answer your thing, exactly what we're trying to do is we, we had gone to market to try and yep. seek contractors, um, but we're holding everything until for reaper until unless it, until someone tells me it's okay. Okay. No, that's that's very comforting. I was reading that report and there's yeah, a number no. of very big numbers in there and um, still a number mm. of you know I certainly appreciate you guys have done so much work in getting the information to QRA or. Um, but yeah, there is such a risk there if we were to start doing some of this work without approval. So. Yeah, no, we're not looking to step Thank off you. on that foot anyway. Um, the, the biggest one for us is like some of those submissions have come back and it was a prime example where QRA have knocked out Reaper out of those submissions. Yep. That's why we haven't awarded until they're finalised. So yep. the big thing too is it where I think we were hopeful that the reason why they did go out to contract in all honesty to, to market was we were expecting our approvals through quicker so we wanted to be ready to go. Um, and obviously we've had contractors in our region who were looking for work because we have had some delays and, and, and that sort of thing. A lot of those contractors have moved on. So when we talk about timeframes between Council's Capital Works Program and the REAPER next year, it's going to be very targeted for what's probably important to Council and its REAPER packages to, to get done. Um, there'll be no doubt there will be a spill into 24-25. Um, Gympie are, are moving through, North Burnett are moving through and you know, it's it's a tight market at the moment to try and get contractors back. So um, we'll need to work through quite efficiently to how that to how that's delivered. So, is there capacity for our crews to be doing this work instead of contractors? I think you'll need a little bit of both. There's there's probably two parts to that. Is a the complex nature of some of the projects. I think when you talk about QA and risk, there's some projects that are horses for courses. 
Um, the big thing is around is we've, we've got a large capital program as well. You know, when you look at some of the, the packages that are in there, um, you know, it's going to be very, very competitive for I think. And I think, again, once we table that out, I think it's important for council to have the same expectation of what the time frame is to deliver. Because yeah. um, the other thing is too, you can go as quickly as you like, but you've still got to try and find a contractor and also you, you've got to risk quality as well. So it's a, it's a balance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but fully appreciate the questions. Would appreciate um, the Red Frost update when or if that can occur. It's quite complex to go through reading the different submissions like this and just would really appreciate the time to, I know we don't have the time today, but really appreciate the time to unpack it and fully understand what what to expect over the coming years. Um, CEO Mark, I don't know whether we need to add that to the motion or that was your intent. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Yeah, you're right. Question or notice, yeah. Uh, yeah, and just interesting, as Councillor Schumacher has alluded to on page 66, 65 and 66, with the drain and culvert clean out. I know we've had plenty of discussions around that um, over the past couple of months and certainly with our community uh, and, and in the rural sector, certainly in my neck of the woods, but it's interesting to note 471 locations across 60 roads uh, and that's just touching the service. So, um, yeah, just an interesting paragraph there. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? No? Go to the vote. Yeah, all those in favour, thank you. Unanimous. 7.2, Councillor Jones, uh, water and wastewater portfolio. You um, managed to spend some time on 7.1. I look forward to your report on 7.2. Let me tell you, Councillor or Chair, that... Uh I spent minimum time, but uh, I'm happy to deliver the water and wastewater portfolio report for the month of April. Uh, I'll present it as read, but I just want to draw the attention to the bottom of page 69. The note there, Sunwater has advised that the Tarong pipeline will be shut down from the 7th of May 23 up to and including the 21st of May 23. We will be required to run 100% on Gordon Brook for this period for the Kingaroy water supply due to the change of water source pockets of discoloured water will result, black butt will be required to use Booba Dam, which has high levels of iron. Add manganese, which results in discoloured water. Prost and water supply will be required to source water from the weir, with arrangements being made to install temporary pumps for the shutdown period. As usual, we will notify Toowoomba Regional Council irrigators that supply is unavailable. Notification is be sent to dialysis, hospitals and other sensitive customers. And uh, that's pretty important, so hopefully that uh, message will get out. It's all on the website here that you can address. You've got graphs of uh, the water, the water allocations. Uh, there's four graphs there of how we've responded to uh, <coughs> wastewater requests, uh, supply requests, all that sort of stuff. The all information is all there, so I would like to uh, move that my water, waste, water and wastewater portfolio for the month of April be received, Mr. Thank Chair. you, Councillor Jones. Seconded, Councillor uh, Potter. Councillor Duff. Uh, no thank comments? you, um, Chair Henson. Just um, wanting to know will we also be putting media releases out, particularly around the discoloured water and black butt and those, because yeah, otherwise you're going to get a whole heap of people. Yes, um, probably phoning in unless we get that word out there. Yeah, through the chair, happy to happy to make a note of that. That we'll we'll make sure we do advance media releases. Um, also, um, acting chair, just wanting to uh, I've had um, it raised with me now with the cooler months coming on whether we can change the water restriction times from six till seven to from to seven till eight and. In the afternoons, maybe from four thirty to five thirty, rather than five to six. Just is that is that something we're looking at? Uh, through chair, I might just take that one notice, councillor, if that's okay, and I'll just have a look at what 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 our policy and, and things say, and where sorry where those numbers come from, if that's okay. Uh, yes, that would be good because um, yeah, there's a, elderly people aren't wanting to get out in the cold and as it gets um, darker earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Councillor Schumacher. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for the report and certainly um, the information around the Gordon Brook and Booba Dam issues when we convert to 100% usage 
um, of those storages. I just wanted to confirm how we monitor water quality during that period and um, how we will ensure that our um, town water supplies meet Australian drinking water guidelines because I certainly understand the risk profile of that. Yeah, through the chair. So we have a drinking water management plan which we're abided by. So no matter the source, the testing remains the same. So council, council's required to treat to the Australian drinking water quality guidelines. Um, so we have a full uh, drinking water management plan that we must meet. So obviously, um, if there's an incident in the water, then we would take appropriate action there where, where we may not be able to achieve the, um, the outcome required. So which does happen from time to time. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher and Manager. Man, just um, I guess I watch all, always our water and our storage levels and, all, and it's been a commentary around the rural sector certainly with evaporation rates and it's interesting to note that Boondoomba Dam is already down to 90% it's, um, and that top 10% of water storages is an enormous amount of water and we haven't even hit winter yet so it's been amazing the evaporation rate. And I can understand the releases as well from Boondoomba, but um, yeah, if I go back to the 1st of March, Boondoomba Dam was 94%, uh, which sounds good, but to be at 90%, it's substantially lower. And that's not hard to see when you traverse the South Bennett region and you look at water levels in just normal dams, how they've all gone back a metre or two metres. So interesting. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Is there any other commentary? And if not, uh, happy to accept your report. All those in favour? Unanimous, thank you. 8.2, we have done 8.1. Thank you, Mr CEO. 8.2 is on page 81 of your report, which is request for naming small section of Hart Street Blackbutt to the Roy Emerson Way, which is on page 81. And the summary is Council received a request from a Blackbutt-based community group to name a part of Hart Street Blackbutt after Roy Emerson. They see an acknowledgement of his contribution to Australian terminus and the officer's recommendation is that the committee recommend to Council that Council rename a small section of Hart Street to the Roy Emerson Way and advise the Blackbutt and district community of the proposal. Do we have any count? Yeah, mover. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Second to Councillor Potter. Speakers. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a quick uh, update. Everybody's uh, well aware of this. We were trying to uh, at the, initially to get a, a long section, including Colson Street, from right out from where Roy Emerson initially lived and was a dairy farmer, right through to the other end of town, the southern end of town. Working with main roads, absolute. Uh, nightmare to try and get something like this through, uh, through. So the committee down there, the Roy Emerson Museum and Peter Racy, and that has been very proactive. This piece of road that they're referring to is from the Blackbutt Monument down to the front gate of Roy Emerson Museum. So that's the only thing that they're, they're doing down there. I know we're going, it says here that we go to uh, community and let the community know. I think we just, um, I'm happy to do consultation, but seriously, I think we just need to, I'd like to uh, recommend this to the Chamber that we just uh, take it to the general meeting, endorse it and put the signage up and whatnot because I don't think that there's going to be too much of an objection down there. And we are very busy coming into um, budget mode. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Jones. Great Chair, initiative. Any, Councillor Schumacher. Oh, Chair, may I just, just to clarify that? So the way the wording is it's not to, not to consult, it's to advise. So it's for information. So it'll be... So yeah, so we're an advisor community. So we'd be pushing out the information that this is what we're doing once it goes for the ordinary. Thank you, Mr. CEO, Councillor Jumai. Uh, yes, fully supportive of the request. Um, my only question was just in terms of our street naming conventions and Hart Street in itself. So I recognise the remaining part of Hart Street up past the tennis court, if I'm thinking correctly, from the Radnor Hotel, would still be Hart Street, so we still have a Hart Street. Just wanted to understand the history of Hart Street. Was there a, a name or something associated with that that Council should be aware of before making this decision, and should we engage that family? 
through through the through the chair. So Hart Street would remain the substantive name of of that road. So Roy Emerson would be a, an honorary name if that makes sense. Um, so that would be our our intent. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Fully supportive. Aaron, Aaron, maybe yeah, actually, yeah, we we understood what that meant, but that's a really good point because it'll be the same as the highway. It'll be an overlay rather than a renaming. I'm just wondering, Aaron, if we pop out the um, change rename to overlay, so that we don't confuse people. Councillor Jones, Councillor Jones, Councillor Potter, happy with that? Yep, thank you. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, good pickup, Councillor. No, you had, thank yeah, you. You read it a million times and you know what it means, but yeah, different set of eyes. Yeah, thank you. All right, so that now reads the Council overlay a small section of Hart Street to the Roy Emerson Way and advise the Black Button District community of the proposal. All those in favour? Thank you. Carried unanimously. 8.3. Which is on page 84 of your agenda, the Wando Industrial Estate Stage 2 Detailed Design, and the summary is Council wishes to consider an upgrade to heavy vehicle access to provide two-way, 26-metre B-double access to Kemp Street and Bowo Street in Wando Industrial Estate, in addition to the gazetted B-double operations undertaken in 2022, and it's the officer's recommendation that the committee can rec recommends to Council that Council note the design and cost estimate provided in this report for upcoming capital works, funding deliberations for 23-24. Uh, there is a quite a detailed report there, and can I just bring to probably everyone's attention that in the report, the first stage of Wondor Industrial Estate was subdivided in 1984 by the Wondor Shore Council to promote industry in the area. Due to the estate being developed with a 20 to 25 metre road reserves and the popularity of small vehicle configurations, the ability to support heavy vehicle movements was not designed for at the time. And for reference, it wasn't until 1990 when all states allowed B-double, 23 metre configuration only, operations on some major highways. We've had that conversation before, Dan, and one of was regulatory uh, standards there. I'm not sure whether... Manager Mann or Manager Darcy would like to elaborate any more on that, but um, we have that in front of us there. We have a mover of that. Councillor Duff, thank you. Second to Councillor Potter. Any commentary? Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think everybody's pretty shocked at how much that's come back at about over $4 million. Um, I know that I I've, I've have moved resolution and it got passed that we actually go out and consult with the, the, all of the businesses affected in that industrial estate. I've spoken to, um, like Parkside, their issue is this 200 metres where they've got to take that forklift and normally they just take it 200 metres, now they've got to take it all the way around and they were looking at perhaps a, a, just a permit to move the forklift. Their their issue is in Burrow Street and the and the inspection station, they they only are concerned about Kemp Street. So whether we can meet with all those groups and come up with some sort of a compromise, I don't know. But at the moment, there's the feedback I'm getting is that it's not working. People are using, still using it two ways in a lot of instances. There's all sorts of issues down there. So happy to support the report, but yeah, just, just thinking we need to um, really look at alternative ways to um, sort this because I, as we've already said about the budget, Four million is an incredible amount of money to try and find. So, yeah, just um, wanting to flag that, keen to, to meet with those um, businesses and, and try and sort out solutions. Oh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Yes, we uh, we expected the um, sum to be quite large. At uh, yeah, four and a half million is a little bit higher than I expected too, but just the asphalt alone, uh, the uh, EME base, or two base, 90 mil thick, 1.4 mil approximate. So you, you're almost looking at $2 million just for the asphalt surface to uh, carry in your B doubles to make sure they're up to standard. So there's half your cost just in that. Now, as you just said, Councillor, the, uh, the sawmill down there, Parkside, are looking just to move a uh, forklift 200 metres 
Um, I'd be interested to hear general manager's uh, option on that and whether or not we could uh, give them a permit because I know that other people around the town of Kingaroy and Mergen and all that sort of stuff run forklifts up and down the streets of our town to uh, go and load grog trucks and all that sort of stuff around the town. So I'm sure they'd have permits to do that. So whether or not that is an option. The other option, as you, uh, the one of the blokes that seems to be or telling, uh, telling us that he's most affected is the truck inspection station. Now, where he's situated and on that particular intersection, whether or not it's an option for us as a council, and again, this is a question through you, Chair, to the GM, whether or not there is availability to go down there and talk to this particular business on whether or not he can shift his gate or we can do something to allow him to get his trucks in there and out because he's telling me with the conversations I had with him that day down there were saying that his trucks can't get in around through the gate. And I actually said to him that day, well, if you just moved your gate post back about a metre and a half, whatever, you know, it, it would be accessible, I think, and then he's just got to come out and get across that other... So his entry points may be an option to work with him as an, a, a private owner, whether or not we can work with him on that and give him access in and out of that. But uh, as Councillor Duff alluded to, like 4.5 million in this particular situation where we're in, coming into a budget, I don't think there's any hope in hell that we're going to be able to do that Bondi upgrade at that stage to the to the uh, regulations that required. And James and uh, the crew here are only operating under the legislation that they're required to, to be able to uh, uh, work with heavy vehicles coming in and out of that um, uh, industrial estate. So I don't know, through you, Chair, to Aaron, whether or not that's an option that we could possibly work on an, um, in and out for that particular business, the truck inspection business, because I think the others have reasonable access and whether or not we can offer that permit. Yeah, through the Chair. So on the, um, on the back of those comments in the councils before about community consultation, if council was happy, we could provide an update to businesses on what's, you know, just a, a bit of a fact sheet around what they can and can't do, what the, some of the design constraints are and those sort of things. But if council was happy as opposed to having a broad consultation meeting, and then as part of that update, we would invite people to get in contact with us if they wanted to discuss a particular issue that we might be able to help them out with. Is that what you were talking about, councillor? So we would meet with Parkside if they wanted to talk about their forklift and try and find a solution, or did you want to still have broad community consultation in relation? Uh, the, I think that it was uh, the, um, that there was more than just the two people that have um, flagged issues, inspection station and also Parkside. And I was hoping that we would have broad community consultation because I know that even when we did the consultation in the first place, there were some businesses felt that they hadn't been consulted. So, yeah, I just I don't think it's good enough just to go back and say, you know, let's just deal with Parkside, let's just deal with the inspection station. Um, the intention was to have a, a meeting with any, like call a meeting that anyone wanted who, was, who had concerns could come come to like even if that was you know held at i don't know one of the sheds or something but just invite the whole every single person to, to a meeting so we can f make sure that it, that they're all being heard rather than just a couple yeah sorry through the chair i wasn't looking to exclude anybody it was probably more of um give people an update on the project where it's at and then invite them to, to contact us if they wanted to talk about their particular issue. So that would go to all businesses. So if you had a business there, exactly that we could go and, and um, meet with them to say, and take, get them to take us through their issue if they chose to. Um, so we could do a, an afternoon there or something like that. I just probably looking to make best use of time um, to try and specifically solve a few if that's, if we get some prior notice, it's a lot easier to have that chat on site to say, Here's some solutions that we might be able to offer. Yeah, I, I just it's just that we that that went through council that, that we were going to have a meeting, that we're going to notify all the businesses and have a meeting. So whether we could, as part of that whole letter, like send out letters to them and just say, well, there's going to be a meeting at such and such a time in such and such a place, rather than just go, you know, if you've got an issue, come to us. Yeah, is that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff, Councillor Erkins. Um, thank you. 
in my opinion, $4.5 million, you've got one tenant there um, who is not a property owner there, he rents there. So what's to say in two years' time that he's not going to decide that he's a bet there's a better position somewhere else if you know if we look at investing that sort of money. And as to the other mob with the forklift, it'd be cheaper for us to buy him another forklift, save him taking it backwards and forwards. You know, I mean it's a long way, yeah, you know, it's a lot of money for someone who is just to travel up a forklift. I, I understand that it probably you know, there are new rules that have come in, but it is it's a huge amount of money that we don't have at this stage. So, you know, I'm all for, you know, sure we meet with them, but we've got to meet with them and give them the hard truth. And the hard truth is that we're not in a position to be able to be spending anywhere near $4.5 million to alleviate those issues. Thanks, Councillor Erkins. Councillor Schumacher? Um, thank you. Thank you for the report and the detailed design estimate. Um, I was looking here in the report you said that the proposed works would impact significantly upon underground and overhead services requiring the relocation of existing water mains, communication conduits being Telstra and overhead electrical um, infrastructure as they would be disrupted by storm water channel realignment. So I was just trying to understand, and you also mentioned that there'd have to be some land that would actually be acquired by council to be able to actually make this a two-way um, two road for B doubles. So it sounds to me like quite a, a complex project in terms of delivery, even if we were to have the funding available. I'm imagining the time frame to actually negotiate with Ergon, Telstra, all of the, all of those services plus the landowners. This would be a very long period over a long period of time. Is this a project that could be scoped, or do you kind of need all of those things to? Oh, sorry, staged, or do you need all of those things to line up before you even put a shovel in the ground? Uh, through you, Chair. Yeah, this this is a complicated project. There is no doubt about it. Um, the fact that we've uh, attempted to get a lot of the objective outcomes of two-way access for camp and burrows, um, and then we've gone and analysed where do we have service clashes as a result of that. Um, it's not a curb street, so the so the stormwater is reliant on on open channel to to get to its current destination. So things move, um, but it's all competing for the same space. So. You know, the staging of the project um, would also need an analysis if, if we were to do either camp or burrows, that would also need further assessment on the on what can work and what can't work as a result because just you know slicing between the two streets still requires an assessment, um, making sure that each of them can operate independent of the other. In, so in the conversations I've had with um, with our colleagues here, it's my understanding there's only two landowners that really are, or two operators in that estate that have have raised particular concerns in relation to the two-way access, or is it everybody in the estate? Oh, I, I can't make comment on that, Councillor. No, um, okay. I haven't been at the forefront of those communications, but um, based off what we've uh, done through Stage 1, we've got a, an admirable outcome and gazetted the industrial estate for B-double operations. Um, you know, the, there's only 200 metres of difference between the two-way and the one-way configuration that we've managed to come up with in getting wow. movements to um, operate legally through the estate. So that is, uh, is a pretty significant outcome in such a short period of time that we managed to achieve uh, in the last couple of years. And just in terms of the cost to actually do this advanced design work for a project that we certainly aren't in a position to deliver on tomorrow, was this, it can, you can take that on notice, but I'd actually like to understand what it costs council to do this design work. Um, through you, Chair, it, it was in the vicinity of about seventy-five to $80,000. Wow. Um, because of the complexity of it. Yep. And the fact is, is that we, we needed to go and survey it 
Um, it's around making sure that the level of service is, is maintained through that estate. The, um, you know, the drainage, road operations, the duty of care to, to the common operator is, uh, is maintained. Um, but we've also got some asset management principles that we need to try and suffice. Um, industrial subdivisions are not cheap anywhere. It's not just the South Burnett, it's anywhere. These are very big investments and, um, and as such, this is something that you do need to look at very closely in order to get an outcome. Um, so it's good that we did this in order to arrive at an outcome such that council are informed on what that level of investment is because it isn't a small number, but you're better off knowing now rather than later. proceeding further ahead and then finding that out later on. Yeah, thank you for the additional information. It's just a reminder, I guess, on how important it is when we make a decision as a council to actually go and scope a project that we are thinking about the realistic, what is realistic and achievable at the forefront. Clearly, um, I didn't realise that we would actually be acquiring land or moving electricity, power poles and alike until this point in time. So I'm glad um, we've done the preliminary work to inform that. But it is a reminder that $75,000, $80,000 of ratepayer funds have gone into building a plan for something that we can't afford to fund. And we potentially could have put that into something that we could fund um, if we had have had the difficult conversation up front with the operators in that, in that estate and advised them that we couldn't facilitate two-way communication or uh, two-way trans transport routes in that area for B-doubles. I've been down in front of Parkside, certainly know how narrow it is. I know how much drainage there is in that area. Um, it's just a, it's a key learning for me in terms of making decisions like these, like we have this morning around scoping works that we just simply cannot deliver on. And going to the point of actually taking them to detailed design like this, I'm quite disappointed when I know there are other projects around Wanda, like the Streetscape project and many others that we could have actually invested this funding in. Um, it's a shame that we've, it's good that we know this up front, but the reality is for our council to invest four and a half million dollars on enabling one operator to drive a, a forklift to, to tighten up their operations with with their forklift manoeuvres and another operator at the end of the estate who is only renting the premises, doesn't actually own the premises. Um, it's a key learning for me and one I will be taking forward, but I do appreciate the work that's gone into this. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Councillor Erkins. Um, one of the things that um, I would also like to add, when they did the street upgrades in Nanango, there are a number of businesses there and the hardware store is one where they changed the two-way traffic had been going down those laneways for probably 170 years. But with new rules and regulations, that was made into one way. And I know that they objected very much because they said it, it really affected badly their business and being able to get people to access their business. And the bottom line is they just had to suck it up and live with it. And that's probably, you know, when it comes to, you know, some things, that's exactly what's got to happen. So, you know, I mean, I agree, we just can't afford it. Thank you, Councillor Ergens. Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you. Um, through you, um, Chair Henshin. Yeah, the, the, um, when it was suggested that of st the stage two, there was nowhere near that kind of money put forward. There were suggestions that it might be 600,000, 800,000. So until it's been designed and scoped, there's no way that to, to, it's now come up with four million. There wasn't anybody who thought it would be anything like that. I know that the people at the Wanda Industrial Estate won't want to spend anywhere near that sort of money. They'll just think that that's insanity. What they want to do, and I agree with what Deputy Mayor Jones has said, is to try and tweak it to, to see if there are some ways that they can manage it, like move a, move an axe access or get a permit just so the parks I don't have to take that forklift all the way around and uh, so that's that's why I'm keen to see the meeting happen and also that people are basically saying that the, that it's a safety issue because it's not even being taken notice of so I'm when we have that meeting I'm hoping that that comes out that 
that you can drive down there any time, any day, and the people are driving using the one way as a two way. They're not even doing it properly. So if we have that meeting, those are the issues that we're going to have to address. Some of them are saying that it's not actually marked well enough. Like, and I know when I'm going around there, unless you come out at a particular street, you don't know which way which way is one way and which way is the other way. So, you know, that those kind of things. So it's more about now having the meeting and tweaking it rather than obviously spending four hundred four million. So that's where I think we need to have that meeting. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Yeah, look, I certainly feel for all the operators in that industrial estate, miraculously that's worked down there for a period of time and things have expanded since then and certainly when you look at 1984 when they would have been driving in there in single, single or bogey axle echo trucks today in modern day machinery with B doubles to 26 metres or whatever and they are, the guys down there are responsible operators. I feel for them and it's this $4 million price tag is just blowing everyone in this chamber out of the water. I can, yeah, it takes your breath away and it, and it, it reiterates a bit and it hits home when you start to try and talk about 25 or 30 year plans. 1984, was there a 30 year plan in that industrial estate? There wouldn't have been, there would have been no. And I remember when it was built, I do, it was a fantastic facility down there, it really was. One I went ahead in leaps and bounds and people for King and Roy were going down there starting businesses. Um, but you, how do you how do you plan? And, and I say this with all due respect: a twenty-five or a thirty-year plan. When this is a classic example of an industrial estate that's just way outgrown not the industry that is there, but the operations to get in and out of it. And they've been working fine for a long period of time. And they are responsible operators down there. And I feel from how we can tweak that, as Councillor Jones has said, and Councillor Erkins. Uh, you know, you've got to look outside the box a bit here if it means you've got to get another forklift or if it means we've got to help perhaps in some shape or form with entries and exits into properties down there. You can do a lot of that for $4 million, I'm sure. And I think the other thing is educating the operators and the business houses down there. If that's the regulatory standard, which we've said time and time again, we've got to somehow work around it and work with it, not against it. That being said, is there anyone else with any further comments on this? We've spent some time on this and we will spend a lot more time on this. Yeah. Councillor Jones. Yeah, I will, Councillor Anchin, uh, the Chair. Um, just in regards to um, Councillor Shoemaker's comments, I don't... I, I tend to agree with Councillor Duff. The, the staff wouldn't have been able to come up with that $4.5 million accurate costing unless you'd done the full detailed design. Is that a... Is that a fair comment? You would have been, again, surmising and uh, preliminary, you know, guesstimate sort of thing. So you needed to do that, even though, yes, it costs us 75, 80,000, but without spending that money of ratepayers, you wouldn't have been able to sit here confidently and say it's going to cost us 4.5 million. Yeah, no, so, so I'm comfortable with that. Um, yes, it is a lot of money, and yes, we can't provide it now because it's 4.5 million. I'm just sitting there thinking with that forklift permit, it's going to be hard for you guys to possibly permit that because it's going to be, as we know, it's just going to be continually running up and down that road. Now, whether or not that's classed as a heavy vehicle or whatever, I don't know how you do that. Yeah, so that that's a possibility. But um, and the other thing, with that, uh, what's the road coming back out? Is it? Kemp Street, the one that brings us back out from that truck inspection station. And so for that to be even considered um, to carry a B-double, to bring, a, like, even have it a one-way, that's still got to be upgraded with all this EME2 and all that sort of stuff as well because you can't just go down there and say, yep, we'll give you a one-way permission to come out on a B-double on that road that's currently there, can we? It's, it's just not safe. And you, you as a designer... I, I wouldn't put you in that position and ask you to do that. Is that a fair comment? Uh, through you, Chair. No, I totally agree. Councillor, um, yeah, the, the infrastructure as it stands right now has, has limitations. You know, it was, it was fit for purpose back at the time, as the report and Councillor Henshin's alluded to. Um, yeah, trying to get two ways and, and us being 
um, accountable for the gazette of B-double operations in the estate. That's the real difference at the end of the day around where the operations of the estate were a few years ago in that there was um, you know, operations that weren't in adherence with the law. Um, it was what it was at the time, but us, as a result of going and, and investing time and understanding and listening and then converting that knowledge into a design, this is where it lands in the, in the terms of cost. So it's around risk mitigation. The design is around risk mitigation as well. Um, we've used it as a tool to inform and advise council on, on where this would land if council were to, we're interested in proceeding with it further. So just another question through you, Chair. In regards to uh, Councillor Duff, and I, I agree totally that every individual um, person that operates out of that industrial estate down there cannot justify and will not even try to justify the $4.5 million spend. In regards to us going down there uh, and talking to these people, now every one of those people that operate down there are going to have different issues. So is it going to be beneficial to get them all in the one room yelling out their own individual issues or is it better off us going and speaking one-on-one -on -one with every business that's on that industrial estate and having a conversation with them and getting their own individual issues and then allowing our staff to condense all of that down to... Because I, I just see when we go down there and we tell them, you know, we've got this and that and we're going to address, we'll try and address the forklift permit we're going to try and address the uh, gateway issue and all that sort of stuff. Every one of those people down there are going to have different issues. So is it worthwhile and beneficial? Do you, do you see it being constructive as a whole group that's ever trying to, individuals trying to push their own individual issue or is it beneficial to go and talk one-on-one, -on -one, just putting it out there for trying to get a better outcome for everybody concerned? Councillor Duff. So, uh, so for me, I, I think that if everybody hears the same for a start, you have you gather them there and you, they all hear the same, you know, this is four million, this is what it is. So you don't get these people talking behind councils back to each other. And then you can have just say um, anyone that wants to stay back and discuss individual issues, we'll have some one on ones. But I, I think that everyone needs to hear that that the four point you know, that's the money that's yeah. Yep. In reference to that, I thought that was the idea of what the staff were going to do to notify with an update and tell them exactly that, give them the costings. Would that be something that you guys would portray in a communication letter to these people? Yeah, I, I think the best way, if we if we do, do do a public one, we'll have a fact sheet there as well so everyone gets a piece of paper and says this is what it is. So happy to be guided by council. If, it, if it's easier for us to do a group one, then we'll do a group one, give them something and they can go from there and we just I think the big thing is I, I, I do think we need to manage expectations and I'll just put that out there for council um, around you know uh, what can and can't be done um, in the estate. Thank you manager Mian and I know when we were initially that very first day when we stood on the side of the road there the drainage was a major issue it wasn't taken into consideration 39 years ago um, yeah, so it's, it's outgrown it's uh, I won't say it's potential. We want to encourage it and keep people in that industrial estate, that's for sure. So there's certainly some work, Councillor Shoemaker. Yeah, I just want to be clear. Um, the reality is we were going to fund this through LRCI funding, and, yes, we did progress it to advanced design because we'd received a number of complaints from operators in that area. I am not comfortable with sending our staff to have an open forum meeting that's not necessarily chaired. It's an opportunity to beat council up publicly over matters that could be solved more productively with one-on-one -on -one conversations at each of those individual premises. I'm not supportive of a, a meeting that would put our staff up to be the bad guys. The reality is we as council has made the decision to fund the advanced design of this project and I think I am I am of of the view that we've invested seventy five eighty thousand dollars yes as a risk mitigation but at the end of the day that's money that's rate pay that's real cash that we've invested in this project because we had a couple of people who expressed concern and my concern is how many more of these decisions where we may, do we make where we say oh we'll try to work with we you will try We'll, you know, we'll try to 
um, get our magic wand out and make everybody happy when the reality is often we can't. And this is a reminder of that. That's what I mean, Councillor Jones. It's a reminder of the importance of the discussions we have as a council up front, the difficult conversations that we have as a council up front before we make decisions um, to pr proceed with works like these. Certainly, I'm grateful for the knowledge now that it's a four and a half million dollar project and we didn't get started um, with our LRCI funds like we'd intended to, that we've done the work. But it, I am disappointed that this is a, a detailed design that will sit on a shelf. And that's the reality of the decisions that we have made that led us to this point. And I'm not supportive of sending our staff out there to be the bearers of bad news. I think either we as councillors go to that meeting and we have that discussion with people, or we offer a one-on-one -on -one update with our staff once the fact sheet and all information has been supplied. I don't think it's fair that we put our people in that position um, because the reality is they will be the bearers of bad news. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Councillor Ergens. Um, I think one of the other things of having public meetings is sometimes the people that have got the loudest voices speak and, and quite often other people don't get an opportunity to speak. Um, so I think, you know, going with staff one-on-one, -on -one going to... Um, businesses and explaining to them. I don't think Councillor Duff actually meant for staff to go out there without council. I think she did um, intend council to go out there. But I think you're much better to go one by one to the um, businesses. And I mean, even if we wanted to, we could split up and go to to some of them and talk to them and just, you know, get their feelings on it. But I, I also don't, you know, I don't like those public meetings where you have one or two people you know, mouth off, and other people either don't say something because they disagree but don't want to be, you know, shown to be disagreeants. And um, so, you know, I, I, I think the one-on-one, -on -one, I'm quite happy to go out and take, um, you know, a part in it. Sorry. Um, yeah, Mr Chair, we do have, uh, I'll probably seek the, the CEO's advice here. So just um, as a matter of practice here, councillors, we do have a resolution 2023-461 from the 29th of March, I believe, looking at the minutes here, that says that council had resolved that officers and councillors would consult with all relevant stakeholders at the Wandai Industrial Estate through an on-site meeting. An meeting one, the term an, meaning one on-site meeting, prior to the next Infrastructure Environment Compliance Standing Committee on the 3rd of May. The meeting is to be advertised and promoted through Council's media and comms, and a letter of invitation issued to all businesses within the precinct to attend. A uh, report be brought back to 3 May. So that is a resolution on the books, Mr CEO. So, Councillor, Mr So, please correct me, but we would either have to repeal that resolution if you want to do it differently or seek to modify it or I'm not sure, Mr CEO, but we do have that on the books uh, as a resolution of Council. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Right, I, yep, Mr CEO, we, that being said, um, to further that and discussions, with that resolution. Oh, thanks, Chair, and, and the Mayor. Actually, I was bringing up the same thing just to go back and have a read what it, what it actually said. Because uh, originally when it was put up as the notice of motion, it was to the April Standing Committee and recollection it was changed at the ordinary meeting. Um, we're probably drifting off. Uh, the General Manager was just uh, getting a bit of guidance, I believe, uh, and he can speak for himself about what sort of format the resolution as it's been adopted is what we're going to enact as far as so um yeah whether council wanted to go through the repeal process and certainly um that that takes its own um has its own process but as it currently stands and i don't think and i'm looking at the general manager that there's that that's it's not it's not unachievable what's in the resolution as it currently stands so certainly um it would be a joint effort between all parties and 
Um, yeah, really, councillors, oh, I, I can literally say it's been adopted. That's what we were heading off to do. And uh, if anyone wants to do something different, you're happy to happy to take that advice. But Mayor certainly was repealing, but I'm not sure whether that would produce a better outcome to repeal a resolution either. And whether you've started to enact it or not, so we could override it, but this meeting wouldn't override it. It'd have to be an ordinary meeting that would override it. Yeah, through the chair. It, so to me, it, it's um, not looking not to do consultation. It was probably just seeking guidance whether we wanted to, based on the fact that expectations that it's jumped to 4.5 million and some people might just take that and run and other people might want to come and have a discussion about it. It's about what's the best use of, of the time, I suppose, of, of what the outcome is. So either way, uh, we're, we're happy to be guided by council. We're quite happy to do consultation. If it's easier to do a meeting, um, we can distribute material prior to that meeting so that so the businesses have a, a, a way of feel about what that's going to be about. So um, if council, to move it, to move the issue forward, if council was happy, we would probably provide an update to businesses and then invite them to a meeting if they wish to attend. And then from there, we can provide an update of, of the summary of the design requirements to go to two-way. Um, and then that way, it's, it would be a, um, a bit more controlled, I think, around expectations of what material would be presented. And then, you know, they're invited to hang on afterwards if they wish to raise a specific issue so that we don't um, go off track or, or um, who's, you know, what what expectation. I think to me that would might be a better way to control expectations. So if council was happy with that advice I'm provided, we would be happy to proceed on that, Lawrence. Thank you, Manager Meehan, and I'll ask the, the members in the chamber uh, to further this conversation, like there's a re resolution that's been passed with the expectations that that's just what we do. Um, certainly well aware, Councillor Shoemaker, about not wanting to go down there and get anybody lynched, um, but certainly the the industri industrial <laughs> the industrial estate and the proprietors and anyone down there deserves um, for us to follow through with that. Any Councillor Duff? Oh, yes, I actually moved that motion, and I actually think it's the perfect way to do it because there's nothing more. I think there's nothing worse than people. Not, if you gather them together and everyone hears the same information, and we've got councillors and staff together, that I think people are much would be much more respectful than if they get banding around among themselves. Why would it be four point four million dollars and start to hook into council because? It's just ludicrous amount of money in, in their view. I'm, I'm just hearing what they'd be saying. Whereas if you can explain it to them why that's come to that, then I think that that's the best process when you gather people together in a f and everybody hears the same information. That's I, I was keen to, to progress that the motion that the Mayor has said that was already on the books. So I think that's the, the way to, to manage the expectations. Thank you, Councillor Duffer. I guess, Mr. CEO, we deal with, is it fair to say we deal with um, the recommendation that's been put in front of us to start with? And if uh, we have some further input in relation to the resolution after this, that the recommendations that the committee, the council to the committee recommends to council that they note the design and cost estimate provided in this report for upcoming Capital Works funding deliberations for 23 24. That's as they. Uh, Recommendation stands out at the moment. There's no further commentary. Do we have a mover for that? Oh, it's a bait. We go to the bait. That's what I said. We go to the bait. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. Yes, Councillor yeah. Jones. Yeah, could I just move another resolution from the floor that we get the staff to send out the information and the update on the current costings and so that they've got the information in advance? Is that, uh, how do I go about that? Just move asking staff to send out information to all businesses on the that are affected on the Wandai Industrial Estate regarding the uh, scope and cost of possible upgrades to to the network internally. I think it would only be advantageous for all of us that they get the information and Councillor Duff, 
I can assure you that we will get beat up down there and they will continually ask us, why is it 4.5 million? So it doesn't matter how we go about it, we're going to have the same issues, but I'm happy to go forward as the Mayor has pointed out. And uh, I certainly was one, along with other councillors here, that no way in the world do we want to put our... We're making the decisions here that affect our staff and they should not be hung out to dry, which I'm not suggesting that anybody in this room is trying to do, but I think we all need to go down as that resolution that the Mayor referred to. So I'd just like to see the opportunity be given to the staff to uh, pass on the information to all people affected in that industrial estate by that, um, that costing and uh, full design before we go out to the meeting so that they've got no issues, they can have plenty of time to read it and they, they can be forearmed. Thank you, Councillor Jones. So that your proposal, send information to all businesses affected by the Wondor Industrial Estate upgrade. We have a sec prior to the meeting to be prior to the meeting to be um, I guess uh, as far as a date we have a seconder in councillor Potter do you need a time frame on that mr CEO sorry chair no because the other one has to be done so we got a report back by the 3rd of May so it's going to have to be done sooner rather than later <laughs> Okay, as I stated, if you want something done, go to the busiest person you know, so. <laughs> All right. So, Councillor Jones has moved that. Councillor Potter has seconded that. No further commentary. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving right along on to 8.4 on page 92. 92 is the scope and cost of possible upgrade works to the Maidenwell Glencliff Road in Wengenville, the summary at the Infrastructure Environment and Compliance Standing Committee meeting held on the 1st of March 2023. The committee re recommended to Council that Council officers present a report on construction scope and cost to upgrade the Maidenwell Glencliff Road in Wengenville. The report has been prepared based on current unit rates and existing information supporting Council's capital budget. And the recommendation is that the Council note the report. Do we have a move of that? Councillor Jones, second to Councillor Potter. Thank you. Any commentary? Thank you, Councillor Duff. Just a, a question. It's um, in that uh, background, it said that it was to include the gravel estimate and drainage work, but then it, in the, it says that no drainage work has been included in the report. Just wondering why that has happened. Yeah, through the through the chair. So we've quoted through for a medium formation grade uh, through there. We would have to go through and do some design, further design work if we wanted to do um, upgrade to the drainage structures. My understanding is that we are currently looking at them as a possible betterment project on the first floodway. So that would be lodged through that process. Our suggestion for council for this one was going to be in the, um, uh, once our reaper approval comes through, um, Kev's okay, just pointing out to me, that on the, just on page 93, um, you've got um, the two, two Saddle Tree Creek and the uh, Wengenville ones there, um, drainage line. So we're not proposing to, to do any upgrades there. That would be a capital project through the betterment process. Suggestion for council, um, if, if council was in, in, in way of thinking, um, our suggestion was note the report when the reaper is approved. We would then come back to council if we wanted to do further complementary works um, on that road. I think we're in the order of about fifty thousand um, dollars, which would then also give us an opportunity to see where some of the betterment is, so that we would um, look to progress it sensibly. I suppose. Thank you, Manager Man Mayor Otto. Yes. Um, thank you, Councillor Hinch. I'm only short, and I've got to bend down. I don't know how you do it with these microphones. Being so tall. Being so tall. Bigger voice. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, General Manager, I'm just, my eyes aren't what they were, but that sheet that we've got, that spreadsheet that shows the change, I think it's on page 94, shows the change and the works to be done. I just wanted to clarify that the full 4.5 kilometres of MG Road will be subject to a medium formation grade. Question, that's the first question. 
So there won't be any spots that aren't done under that scope of works? No, so through our, our way of thinking there, Mr Mayor, so you've got right, ranging challenges from challenge 20 to the 4.46 on the challenge thing. Our estimate there is to do complementary work. So once our reaper is approved, we'll see what's in and what's out. And we, we would go through the whole road to answer your question. Um, our thoughts is whether that would form part of our regular maintenance program, but it could be in the order of 50,000. We, ex we expect that between the, the formation grade that required there to do, plus some gravel patching, Wood Council would be looking to kick the tin of about 50 grand to make sure that we get the outcome right through. So um, so we two ways to do that. We either do it under maintenance, but what we were thinking is once these approvals start to come back through like we did before, we would then report up to Council and say, here's some of the priority projects we would recommend that do you want to contribute your $2 million across these ones here to, to fix these roads properly? That was our thoughts. So council would have an opportunity once we got the reaper approval mm -hmm. to say, okay, well, we'd like to actually resheet the remaining unresheated sections of the road with our own capital. Correct. We wanted to make sure that the full 4.5 got resheeted. Yep, correct. Okay, so that would be an opportunity. The second question was, does that, I know it normally doesn't, but do, are we going to do table drains and tail drains as part of that work? Do we need excavators? What's going to happen with those, with some of that, um, with some of that uh, natural drainage infrastructure? Yeah, three, Mr. Mayor. We have done a large bit of work on that road, obviously, around Christmas time, I think it was, or, or quote me if I'm wrong, but it was somewhere in that when we came up last time. We would be looking to meet exactly that we would meet with the landowners as their per discussion, have a discussion around what drainage needs to be done without any, you know, obviously constructing with a, with a D6 or something like that. But yeah, to answer your question, we would look to meet the landowners, get the outcome that we're looking for to clean the drains up that are existing and restore that road back to its existing condition and patch in between. So that's, yeah. that's all I had. Thank you, General Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No further questions, commentary on that? All right. All those in favour? It's unanimous. Thank you. Under 8.5 on page 95, which is round two school transport infrastructure program, known as the STIPS. In the summary, the State Government School Transport Infrastructure Program, STIP, provides funding to improve the safety and operation of schools throughout new or improved infrastructure at the school and or on the surrounding road network. Round 2 for 22-23 has been released for submissions in April 23. And the officer's recommendation is that the committee recommends to council that 1. St Patrick's Catholic College car parking and footpath upgrade Nanango, 2. Nanango State High School footpath Nanango, Three, Tangerindji State School car parking and bus set down upgrade Tangerindji. And four, the Mergen State School footpath in Mergen. Uh, we have a mover of that. Councillor Duff, thank you. Second to Councillor Potter. Questions, commentary, Councillor Duff? Uh, just a couple of questions. One is, um, is that number four, is that prior, are they prioritised or are they just all level playing field? Through you, Chair, no, they're just um, all four applications. Yep. Or all submitted at the same time, Councillor. Thank you. I was just wondering with that, um, the Bergen State School footpath one, that the, it says at the bottom, the project would also seek to address a small section of bitumen footpath adjacent to the Stephen Street West intersection fronting the courthouse. That was that piece I put forward into in, in, at the committee meeting. Shit. I've had numerous complaints Sorry. about that. It's just yes, a short section. So there's concrete on both sides and then there's a section where it's just it's just bitumen with grass growing through and it's only about, I don't know, 50 or 60 metres. I'm just wondering if that could be included as scoped for this budget rather than waiting yeah. another two, potentially two years to get that happening, just that particular small piece. Yeah, uh, through, through you, Mr Chair. So James and I went for a drive to Mergen um, to have a look at that section after it was raised and we saw this one there. We, we can have a look at that. It is on our capital program to, for consideration so um, as always I, we're, if if council's happy we're happy to include it like that that's not a not a not a big thing as long as it's eligible we'll have it take it away and have a look if it's eligible we'll add it in that's no problem I'm just saying to no you've got it added in I'm saying to take it out oh you want to take it out well, I, I'm just thinking it's going to take two years to get this project up whereas I was hoping it might that short piece might get done in the budget yep that's fine yep. yeah that was Sorry. Thank you. 
we, we actually we actually don't think it's included in the submission hence our original response we didn't pick up we actually must have had a look at it and and um had not included in our actual submission we don't think well, well i'm just concerned yeah sorry Councillor Duff. yeah ha so, happy to run that into happy to run that on its current course with the capital program if that suits could because this this project is looking at probably two years down the track isn't mm. it i'm just concerned about the the community and the complaints I've already had and the safety issues around that short piece. That was yep. No, happy to deal with them as two separate issues yeah. if you're happy with that. Mayor Otto. Sorry yeah. for chomping at the bit, Mr. Um, um, Chair, Mr. Chair, but I just want to clarify. Um, at the bottom of page 96, it says that the Mergen School footpath project would also seek to address a small section of bitumen adjacent to Stephen Street West, intersection fronting the courthouse. I think that's where councillor um, has got become concerned that that'll get swept up in the proposal. So I think councillor Duff wants to keep item four in, but just uh, get in and do that little section straight away. That is on that that is on that um, uh, northern side of Stephen Street. I think that was the confusion there, GM. Yeah, no, Thank through you, chair. through the chair. You're fully right, Mr. Mayor. We'll exclude that from there and keep it on its current capital um, consideration program. Recommendation doesn't change. All right. Okay. So no more commentary questions on that, Councillor Jones. Oh, Mr. Hanson, you've got no idea how much I want to get out of here. But anyway, um, good opportunity through you, Chair, to congratulate uh, James and the staff. Uh, STIP uh, funding round one has just been finalised and confirmed and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, working with these guys, we were successful in receiving over $1.2 million, I think, or thereabouts throughout the South Burnett. I think Mergen State High and Mergen State School got a couple of uh, thank gongs. Kingaroy State High School down there where the bus turnarounds. The school up here, I think, the uh, one of the, and um, a school in the Nango, a couple of, anyway. Yeah, so anyway, I just want to, uh, uh, pass on a congratulations to our staff. Uh, I worked tirelessly. Well, I didn't do a great deal. I just helped uh, advocate for it. But uh, these guys done all the design work and everything behind there. So I think it's a good opportunity to acknowledge the staff that are involved. And uh, our school communities are 1.2 million plus better off for it. And hopefully we can be successful in this as well. So congratulations. Please take that back to all other people concerned. And well done, guys. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Yeah, exactly. Greatly appreciated from the staff. And um, yeah, I can appreciate Councillor Jones. You might want to get out of here, but we're about halfway, so stay with us. Stay with us. Stay with us. And if there's anyone in the public or watching, please stay with us. We're six hours in here and uh, got a little bit to go if we're halfway through. So appreciate your concentration and your participation. So if there's no more commentary, we'll take that to the vote. All those in favour, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. 8.6 is page 102, is the Tingura DTMR Roadworks material site. Okay, so the summary there is that the Infrastructure, Environment and Compliance Standing Committee held on the 1st of March in 2023. The committee recommended to Council that the Council officers liaise with DTMR regarding relocation and rehabilitation of the stockpile site in Dingura next to the Bunya Highway and present a report on this and the officer's recommendation that the committee note the report for information that is there in front of you on uh, the relevant pages. Do we have a mover? Councillor Jones, a seconder. Councillor Erkins, thank you. Speakers? Mayor Otto? If, if I could, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. Just... Uh, being as mobile as I am, General Manager, there isn't much that happens I don't swoop on around the South Burnett. I noticed that there's new piles of screenings going in there only in recent days. Um, can I just ask, is that, what work is that related to? Is that up on Tinny Chumsford or is that a different DTMR work? Yeah, it would be our reseals, Mr Mayor, for yeah. a Tingle or a Chelmsford Road on that first Tinny, section there. Tinny Chelmsford reseals, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, can also just say thanks to your work you've done in liaising with DTMR. Clearly, we're waiting for them to write back to us in terms of options to perhaps relocate that site. So, look forward to that report. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor Otto. Any further comments, questions? No, we go to the vote. All those in favour? 
carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Item 8.7 on page 105 is the Bunya Mountains Electric Vehicle Charging Station. And the summary there is Council has been approached by the Bunya Mountains Community Association Incorporated to assist in investigating the installation of an electric vehicle EV charging station at the Bunya Mountains. And their officer's recommendation is that the committee recommend to council that on one, officers continue to work with the Bunya Mountains Community Association Incorporated to assist with citing a future proposed electric vehicle charging station and two, do not propose to accept future electric vehicle EV charging stations as donated assets due to the ongoing maintenance and operational costs and competing proprietary products that are supporting the electoral, electric vehicle charging network. Do we have a mover for that? Councillor Mayor Otto, thank you. Seconder? Councillor Potter, commentary, questions? Councillor Potter? Yeah, thank you. Look, I'm not too sure if um, do not um, propose to accept future electric vehicle charging stations, even if they are donated. Donated. I'm not too sure whether I'm quite happy to accept that one um, because I think we're just stopping ourselves for the future because if something happens, you know, if we decide that we want to um, do some more work up there, a vehicle charging, electric vehicle charging station would be a great um, asset to that area um, for people visiting. It's a great um, tourism site. Um, I know there is a person up there who's already got his own electric vehicle and I think he must charge it himself. You know, I just think that we shouldn't be um, knocking this one out of the park completely right now. I think it's something we should think about. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Councillor Erkins. Thank you, through you, Mr Chair. Can somebody tell me, how does the electric charging points work? Do we, do people pay to use them and do, are they profitable to have in? <laughs> uh, through you, Chair. Um, so ha ha probably happy to go and give you a bit of a demonstration at the one over in the Alfred Street car park, if you'd like, Councillor. But uh, essentially it, it works through a similar to like a tap and go scheme that sits in the background and it's like an FPOS transaction. What it does is allow connectivity to the station between the electric vehicle and the station. And I think it's about 30 or 40 uh, cents per kilowatt hour is around the retail rate um, for, for charging of a 50 kilowatt station, which is what's over there. You'll see in the rapid charging network that they're charging probably double to triple that sort of rate. Um, it's all about the dollars versus time and, and that level of service that goes with that. Um, but the electric vehicles are, they're an emerging technology in the, in the transport industry and you know, there's, there is a reasonable uptake of, of that and there's more, varieties of electric vehicles coming um, into the industry as well. So these sorts of um, stations are becoming more and more proprietary and um, it's becoming less and less more of a council emphasis on needing to own and operate these stations because there's, there's other providers coming into the industry that are leveraging off the state um, uh, zero emissions vehicle scheme, I think it's called but it's a funding basis to support getting charging stations out across Queensland. So it doesn't need to be taken through council. Um, there's other suppliers so, so, who can, who so can do that. So if you were going, like if you go and fill up your vehicle with fuel, yep. you know, it takes you a few minutes to fill it up. Yep. So can you do that at an electric? Yeah, it, it, it takes probably around 40 to 45 for a, a reasonable minutes. charge. Yes. 40, 40. And that's and that's where we we've you know, really leveraged off the time. It's not the cost; it's more the time and and the indirect spend that goes with with that. So, um, the higher charging units obviously take a lot less time, but they they're still longer than what it would be for a traditional um, petrol or diesel so Bowser filler. So, do you think that um, if there's going to be more electric vehicles come onto the market, which Presumably there will be, yep. unless petrol and diesel. Do you think garages will trans? You know, will they end up having them in there? Yeah, through the through the through the chair, my understanding is that that does what it occurs in in places like the United States. So there is hard home charging units, and I think this technology will go exponential in the next couple of years as people use their electric cars and batteries to 
charge homes and houses and stuff like that. People, I think they're already using them as battery banks. Just just for background for council for this one, um, James and Cody and, and Mark have been working with the, the um, community association up there. They're looking to seek a grant to install an electric car charging station up there at a suitable location. Um, we've been working with them on a number of locations. Um, happy to assist them. There is some challenges with that. They, they need to go through some ergon energy assessments and, and those sorts of things. You, you can't just plug and play. The purpose of the report was to, um, the council's happy for us to assist with them in, in placing a unit in a suitable, at a mutually suitable location up there if they get a grant. Um, but also but we wouldn't take that on as actually as a council asset um, unless council wanted to. So, so, um, so on the ones that council have, do we, does council actually make money on the? Yeah, so um, the, the only asset that we have is the Stanwell partner, the one we partnered with Stanwell, it was a donated asset to council. So um, the Eureka ones across the street here are not, do not belong to us, they belong All to right. the state. So just, just by way of, uh, if the, um, for those who are wondering, do we own any? Technically we do own the one in the Alfred Street car park that is a donated asset to us. Um, it's just a, a matter for council whether they wanted to, if people start to install them in, in groups. And I actually think it's a, a great idea that you've got an electric charger in range from Brisbane uh, to the Bunyan Mounts. the power on the ones that are... Yeah, it's cost, cost recovered through the, through the, through the system. So, 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 the, yeah, so the revenue goes back to pay that power bill is my understanding. Yeah, that's what I want to know. Yeah. Making... yeah, they are. We actually charge more than um, that made through a company called ChargeFox. So council has an agreement with ChargeFox is our, it's a bit like our telco, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and they administer that system for us. So if power goes up, obviously we would increase the price um, in line with that as well. Okay. Yeah. So it just seems to me like when it's taking 45 minutes to charge, if you're really going to have a lot of vehicles, well, you know, George can't find places to park now. And I have looked at those one sitting over there empty with electric charges and think I'd like to park. Yeah, there. That, um, believe it or not, there's 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 actually I think there's a Tesla there every morning and then and normally late in the afternoons. But we also have seen them in the Alfred Street car park too. People go there early in the mornings before work, go and have a, a coffee or, or do their things. Yeah. Um, we've run into a number of individuals who are transiting through our area. Some gentleman was driving to Melbourne the other day and he stops every two hours and just because he get, yeah, it's just. You either have an electric car or you don't, I think. Councillor Potter. Yeah, thank you. I'm just wondering whether um, we're able to take out point two completely, um, unless we want to change it to, because we've already got working with the Bunya Community Association to assist with um, citing a future proposed electric vehicle charging station. And I personally believe that might be enough and we can probably take out point two. Because as I said before, I think I don't really want to, you know, sort of completely um, cut that one out of our um, future works. So if unless there's a business up there that's willing to take this on, um, but yeah, I just I just don't want to cut it out. I just think a charging station up there is a great idea, whether we own it or whether a private business owns it. Um, it'd be great if a pri private business took it on. But I just was wondering whether we could take out point two, whether um, people would be agreeable to that. Well, as the mover, Mayor Otto, are you happy to remove point two? And well, obviously, Councillor Potter to remove that. Councillor Shoemaker. Um, yes, thank you. I would certainly like to better understand the maintenance costs that are referred to in the report um, and the operating costs, because. I was of the view when we accepted the stations at Alfred Street that they did make enough money to actually fund the um, maintenance and operating costs. So if they are not doing that, I think I think we as a council do need to better understand that. Um, I'd also like to propose that, you know, if let's say somebody did donate another one of these stations, maybe a learning in this is that we should be um, you know, if an entity such as Stanwell Corporation, a government-owned corporation, donates an item like that, perhaps there's an agreement or something with them that clearly highlights what those ongoing maintenance costs are or what the expected contribution over time will be for the life of that asset or what the renewal of that asset looks like. Like, perhaps we need to be having some of these longer-term discussions 
noting, as um, you've mentioned here, that the industry is changing. There's new technology coming out all of the time. Um, I think there's a bit more work to be done in this space before we say we wouldn't accept them. I do note that any asset that we do accept has to go on our depreciation schedule. So I do think the option with Eureka personally, where we've got an external entity maintaining, operating, et cetera, those stations is a good agreement. However, if there is an opportunity to make some funds from this that could potentially go back, you know, to the Bunya Mountains community group, perhaps there's another avenue that needs to be explored here. Um, I agree with removing dot point two, but I do think perhaps more conversations need to be had. And I do think that um, council probably does need to understand if that station at Alfred Street is actually costing us money and not delivering a return or paying for its operating costs, then that's an indication to us that we either need to increase the rate of charging or make changes when we accept the donation of equipment like that. So, um, yeah, I really value the, the report and the discussion. I think um, noting that the state government has got their EV superhighway um, sort of plan, that there is investment in this area. We probably just, as a council, almost need to get clearer on what our policy is in relation to these. So um, my question on notice is probably just understanding more the maintenance and operating costs of the existing station at Alford Street so that we can have further conversations around what council's policy may actually be in relation to accepting EV charging stations as a, as a gift for our asset register. Thank you. Councillor Schumacher, thank you for that uh, question or notice. But with that maintenance and operating costs, would you be interested in putting their revenue as well? I was of the view that would be included, but yeah, sure, if you would like to identify it separately. Thank you. Yep. Further, oh, may I? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Um, I know this is probably a slight side issue, but with, but with your um, uh, generous generosity, uh, General Manager Meehan, um, while we're on Bunya Mountains, the T section there with Bunya Mountains Road and Bunya Avenue, signage, line marking, we know it's a safety issue for traffic moving into there. Has there been anything done by DTMR on that yet? Because we've been waiting for donkey's ages for something to be done there. This goes on for almost 12 months. Um, or do we need to go? Do I need to go and strap myself to a tree or something up there to get them to do something? Um, any any updates, Jim? Strap me to a Did tree. Did want to strap me to a tree? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, thanks, Mr. C. Any updates? Sorry, thanks, Mr. CEO. Uh, Tim, uh, okay, yeah, you can do. Um, Roads team consulted with the uh, group on uh, appropriate location. Oh, that's the 30 kilometre, because this was answered. Um, we chased this up for Carol before the last uh, meeting. TMR, I won't use the word guaranteed us, but pretty close to guaranteed us that they were coming up, and so should the line marking should be done. The signage was different, the 30 kilometre signage. So there's roads. Uh, the, when the next the line markers are in, the 30 kilometre, which is our road, will be put onto the road for the 30 kilometre. The artificial speed hump isn't agreed to, so that was a message that was conveyed back. So we'd try the 30 kilometre. But certainly for the intersection, TMR had undertaken that they were going to go and do that with the signage. That when would there have been their last meeting? Would have been November last year. So I must say I haven't been up to physically and personally double check, but certainly we can follow it up, Mayor, if it hasn't been done. Thank you very much, Mr. C. I must admit, be honest, I'm a bit out of date because I probably haven't driven through there for a few months myself, but I don't know if anyone else is aware if it's been done. But thanks for following that up. Much appreciated. Thanks, Mr. C. Um, I can thanks. confirm, Mayor Otto, that I drove home from the Bunny Mountains. Oh, well, I drove to work yesterday from the Bunny Mountains and that those signs have actually been installed and the line markings have been made. And that's probably happened since, like, Christmas. Um, so it has, as somebody who regularly drives the road, which which I do, I can um, 
I can say it has made it clearer. It's still a challenge with the tree in the middle as to which way you go. Um, but from my experience, and I drive up there a couple of times a month and, and actually live there part time, I can assure you it's it's much better than what it is, what it was. Thank you. Right. We're right. With the Bunya Mountains uh, Electric, we voted on that. All those in favour was unanimous. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you. There's number eight ticked off the list. We're on to section nine, Portfolio Resource Management, Rural Services, Agricultural Innovation, Compliance and Environmental Health, which will be myself. Uh, there's a lot of work going into that. Thank you to the staff and, and managers behind the scenes there with weed management and feral animal management. I'll just note quickly uh, an application has been submitted through the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries to access $100,000 in funding under the African Swine Fever Service Delivery Grant Scheme, uh, the project titled Burner Inland Regional Emergency Animal Disease Response and Preparedness, will directly support the inland Burnet region to develop an increased capacity to prevent, prepare and respond to emergency animal diseases. If we quickly breeze through there, the Building and Invasive Species Management Alliance, fire management on council reserves. Uh, council officers attended a few South Burnet fire management group meeting with other state land managers to review the burning activities of last season and discuss requirements and priorities for the season ahead. There's an enormous amount of fuel out there for this upcoming winter and, of course, of the spring, which is on the tip of everybody's tongue. Uh, environmental health is there. It's all noted there. Asbestos incident in Kingaroy Town resulted in a lengthy process for the clean-up of asbestos material. Asbestos, we've had this come across our desks in chambers here several times. Anything to do with asbestos, it's a special case and needs to be dealt with accordingly. That being said, I would like to note that my report be accepted. I'll move that my report for natural resource management and rural services be accepted. And a second to Councillor Potter. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Councillor Shoemaker. Um, the only question, I was interested to read that only 20 landowners have actually taken up the opportunity to participate in the coordinated baiting program. Um, and I understand there's more advertising. I've seen the signs out there. Um, Councillor Hench and I just wondered if there have been any discussions with Ag Force or South Bennett Grazing Network about the opportunity to participate in that baiting program. I know it was something that um, in, the in the discussions around foot and mouth disease and the like, you know, so many landholders have advised us the importance of baiting. Um, I just probably would have expected to see many more people taking up the opportunity to participate in the baiting program. So I just wondered, um, you as the portfolio holder, if you'd had any discussions. I know the staff have been trying to plug it, but yeah. what's happening on the ground? As a rural man, I know you um, often Yeah, thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. I have had a lot of discussions, actually, across the board and across our neighbouring councils. I've had uh, media, different media outlets, be it the Country Life, be in contact with me in relation to this. And I've publicised this. I've put it out there for them. And our public notice, on the, which was released on the 20th of March for the Wild Dog and Feral Pig Control Program. Uh, you're right, there's 20-odd people that have registered their interests. I can't stress enough with this, and I say it every time, and you'll be sick of me saying it. This is a seriously controlled thing. We get, we get criticised uh, from some people in the community about the baiting program. You have to register your interest in this before you start. Your portion numbers are taken down. The amount of bait you receive is controlled and, and the weights of it, I think it states there somewhere uh, in my report, the kilograms of bait that is expected uh, to be handed out. It's a very, very diligent process that this is undertaken by the people that participate <laughs> and the council, as is every other council. We're, we have rules and regulations around this. There might only be at this point in time 20, but honestly this gets implemented from the 3rd of May to the 11th of May, so that's about a month away uh, as we speak, I would envisage that that would and perhaps uh, Manager Books would be able to, and I'm sure it's in the figures that follow my report, uh, the numbers I would envisage would escalate to double that by the month 
ahead when it actually comes. You have to be registered, of course, by a certain time. That's on the no later than Thursday, the 20th of April. I encourage if there's anyone listening out there, and I'll certainly promote that this media release gets a, a run again, Mr. CEO, and I'm sure that it will be publicised. Um, but their intentions by no later than the 20th of April. I, I'm talking to people out there that are, and again, uh, you know, our, our wild dog population just doesn't disappear. Um, and our feral, feral pig, there's work in progress. You've heard me speak about that and what we can do perhaps as a council if we could ever receive and, and manager and May might be able to elaborate a little more on it down the track as to what we can do with it, whether we can get some funding, whether we can implement some of our NRM money towards something, be it aerial uh, eradication of pigs. I know I have that conversation with many people in the public. It does work. It's a terrific thing, and it, and again, it's managed. We had, as you all in these chambers were here, we had the presenters, the helicopter pilot and the shooter. I've since then had a communication from a company in Brisbane that's interested to have a conversation with us as well, if we were interested in that. Um, so it's being implemented across uh, across the, the whole state in different shapes and formats. Just uh, for a, bit, a little bit of useless information, we have wild dogs and feral pig problems. The company that contacted me from Brisbane are absolutely flat out eradicating birds in their airports and aerodromes in Brisbane and surrounding areas. That's their contract to eliminate birds because birds are a major issue on airfields. Uh, so, yeah, it's, there's issues out there, not just with wild dogs and feral pigs, but... Um, yeah, thank you, Councillor Schumacher, for the question. I hope I've answered that uh, to your expectations. But um, it's, a, it's a great program that Council runs. And along with the syndicates that are within the Burnet, and hopefully we can promote s some more of that in time, that's a work in progress as well. Uh, there's enormous numbers of dogs. And if we look on social media, there's dogs now stalking people within our South Burnet region. I know the Bunyan Mountains have major issues with dogs up there wild dogs up there, they're massive. And again, it's community, educating the community to not feed them or encourage them in certain um, hot spots, be it tourism spots, that's for sure. But they're out there. They, they continue to become a problem in the rural sector and the agricultural sector. The pig damage across the board is, honestly, it's millions of dollars in our region, not just in the in Queensland, in our region. It's not hard for a primary producer to lose, whether it be stock with wild dogs, can easily lose $20,000 worth of damage to stock in a night through wild dog attacks. And in the agricultural sector, it's not hard for a primary producer of growing cereal crops or grain crops or legume crops to lose the same overnight. Uh, and it happens. It, it's, that's just a part where a major rural primary producing area in the South Burnet. So, um, yeah, thank you for your question, Councillor Shoemaker, and I hope I've answered it adequately. And again, you know, I'll say the dates again, the 3rd of May to the 11th of May, with registrations for their intention to be no later than the 20th of April. Uh, and if we've got 20 already, I'd like to see that certainly double, and I'm sure Manager Brooks, he's probably had uh, more inquiries since this has gone to our agenda print. Yeah, through you, Mr Chair. Um, yeah, at the time of... Um writing the report, which was early last week. Um, the program had just been released. I don't have the actual numbers of how many have actually registered now, but um, yeah, it would be more than 20. As you know, you know, we've got the core flutes out there. We make contact with people that have participated previously. So the, the word's out there. So that's um, really positive. And just quickly on the um, application there to DAF for the 100,000, um, we just did get um, email confirmation this afternoon that we've been or successful in $40,000 of that funding towards a um, running a mock exercise. Um, in that funding application, we did ask for some money for aerial shooting of pigs. Um, that hasn't come through initially, but we'll certainly be uh, maintaining a presence with DAF to uh, try and seek some money to do, do an aerial program. That is excellent news, and thank you, Manager Brooks, um, being a primary producer you know, that gets me excited. Uh, and I've stated before, mock exercises, yeah, and Councillor Jones is excited as I mentioned that. Have a look at him. Um, it, uh, 
it's getting on, isn't it? My goodness. <laughs> It's, we've got to be able to laugh, haven't we? It's, honestly, it's healthy to laugh. But um, yeah, it's uh, we continue. We'll lose our train of thought. But um, yeah, thank you, Manager Brooks, and uh, hopefully the mock exercises I'd like to see developed further into um, more productive rather than mock exercises. But uh, look, anything's appreciated in that space. So thank you. Uh, with that. Oh, sorry, Mayor Otto, yes. Yeah, thanks, Mr Chair. Um, just a couple of questions here. So that's, that's first of all, um, yeah, thank you, um, Councillor Henshin, for your report. So to our officers, this $100,000 application, so they're going to give us $40,000 to run a mock exercise, greatly appreciated. Thanks for the great work and putting the application in um, to the staff. Is there still possibility that we may get some funding to do some sort of pig, pig um, program, aerial shooting or what might that be? And, and how much could that potentially be? Because, um, look, thanks for your great work, and this is not a criticism of you, but when is the Queensland Government going to take this issue seriously? They're dead set throwing, they're throwing cookies at this. Um, they're throwing around little bits and pieces of money here and there to run this and have a program here and have a program there. When are we going to have some funding? If they're serious about um, ASF and other diseases that could wipe out this industry, which is a massive part of our economy and much of Queensland's economy, about getting on top of the feral pig numbers. Quite frankly, it's just not good enough what they're doing to this point in time and they're not taking this seriously. Um, so that's my first question. Um, is there a chance we could get some money? Any idea, manager, as to how much we might be able to get? Thank you. Um, three, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, the information I've got currently is um, yeah, we just have further negotiations with DAF, um, and there may be the opportunity for a little bit more uh, financial support in control activities. Um, so that's all the information we've got. Mm. So no indications for how much at this no, stage, manager. No. Look, again, thank you for your work. I know you guys are doing the absolute best you can with limited resources. And uh, unfortunately, again, council's carrying the burden of this with very little help from the state. The second one question is, weed management. Do we get any funding? Are we getting any funding or likely to get any funding, general manager, from the Queensland government in relation to weed management and the impact it's having on our cultivation, on our crop production across our region? We see here that autumn storms are gonna bring fireweed through uh, we've been through and are still going through a process here um, with parthenium. Just to mention a few of the dangerous weeds that we've got coming up in our region that have a, you know, have, as Councillor Henshin's told us so many times, the impact this could have. Is there any state government funding that we get at the moment in this year's budget and are we likely to get any? Uh, happy to take that as a question, put that as a question on notice, though, GM. Mr Mayor, if I may interject there for a minute, and being a primary producer, can I, and I'll say it openly, the, the state and federal governments, you, you talk about our local governments and our local council are bearing the burden. We don't, the primary producers do. No, honestly, they do. They bear the burden, they pay the cost for it in both ends, whether they try and eliminate the problem themselves or the damage it does to their crops or their livestock industry that they run. So the primary producers bear the burden of it. Yeah, through, through you, uh, Mr Chair. So at the moment, there is there currently isn't any financial um, contribution from the state for those on-ground on works. Um, yeah, and it is rare. Sometimes they will put funding out. Um, some of the programs where we participated, particularly the, where the regional with the other councils involved, so they often fund offices, but, yeah, it's pretty rare that you get that on-ground work uh, uh, funding for that on ground work as you're aware we did request funding for the parthenium in conjunction with sherberg um, and that wasn't forthcoming um, but yeah the, the guys do keep an eye out if there is programs available but yeah obviously they're always hotly contested across the state as well thanks very much my third question is again thank you for the work you've done because i know you fellas are doing everything you can um, the third question is why do we see an ongoing proliferation of lantana through our state forests. I've been driving around recently, I don't know whether it's been the weather, but the land tenor just seems to have gone to another level. 
Um, years ago, I didn't see that much land turn around state forests. Can someone explain to me why that's the case? Whose responsibility is that? But it seems to be out of control. I'll leave that as a question, perhaps. Yeah, no, I'm happy there. to have a crack Council. at that one, Mr Mayor, because our state forestries are poorly managed. Simple as that. They, they straight away, they'll shy away from burning and control burning is a good way to eradicate lantana. And show me a state forest that they have con they have diligent burns. And, and a classic example is our Great Dividing Range on our boundary where we border Western Downs. Absolutely nothing happens up in there. And I adjoin it. Practically it's on my doorstep and nothing happens up in there. We talk about protecting our tick-free status. There's no control of red deer. Red deer are one of our biggest carriers of tick in our tick-free environment. We've had an outbreak in my neck of the woods. We've had an outbreak of ticks. Make no secret of it. The, the landowners out there working diligently, how did they get there? It's not through the primary producers how they got there. It's through negligence on some of our neighbouring, uh, be them forestries, what it, state forests, whatever you want to call them. They don't do anything. And again, I, I say it again, they pass the buck on to the primary producers. They're the ones that are carrying the, the burden on this. They won't do anything about it. Simple as that. Uh, control burns or burns up in forestries, they don't want to touch it. I've had this argument, and bear with me for a minute here. I got chipped, I'm a fire warden, and I'm proud to be a fire warden. I've been a fire warden in my district for 28 years. I got a, a phone call from uh, the head department in Bundaberg for issuing a fire permit only a couple of weeks ago. Now, I'll make no secret of this, where I was, my fire permit that I issued was automatically um, non-compliant. Now, in your fire permit that you have to fill out, it is a reasonable piece of paperwork, and I'm sure Councillor Duff is aware of that as well. I believe you're a fire warden. Yeah, thank you. So she knows only too well what's involved in a fire permit, and I'd be happy to bring one in one day and show you. Where, again, it's like our baiting program, you have to fill in every portion number, address, phone number, contacts, what they're going to do, how many people are going to be there, how they control it, what they're burning, when they're going to burn. You have to put conditions on it as to the wind uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Now, with that is you have to contact Firecom. Now, Firecom is a number that I've put on my permit for 28, my permits I issue, for 28 years to get a phone call two weeks ago to say that I'd issued a permit that's non-compliant. Now our particular fire brigade goes over into Western Downs. I've argued for years that why would we have a fire brigade in the South Burnett region that crosses the Great Dividing Range and goes over into Western Downs. Historically I found out through a lot of digging and research that because there was primary producers that own country in Western Downs also own country in South Burnett. Back then, the King of Roy Shire. Hence, they thought it was a good idea to incorporate them in the Iron Pot Rural Fire Brigade, so they drew, they drew a line out around those property owners. And the Iron Pot Rural Fire Brigade is an area, I'll tell you now, there wouldn't be another one as big as it in the entire southeast corner, where it goes from the South Burnett region across the Great Dividing Range over into Western Downs. When I asked the question of, I, honestly, I thought Firecom's number was a Firecom number. That's, that's a number, that's a, a 1300 number. No, I issued the wrong Firecom number. I s asked the gentleman in question, so what's the Firecom number that I'm supposed to put on a permit? Because the gentleman that asked for a permit's property was in Western Downs. My argument has been for years, we, don't, we can't see Western Downs because it's over that side of the Great Divining Range. We have no communication. You talk about connectivity. We have no communication out there across the Great Dividing Range. And the third major factor is the weather conditions on Western Downs will be completely contrast to what they are in the South Burnet because they're over that western side of the range. What's the Firecom number? That's a really good question. I don't know. I'll get back to you. I waited for 15 minutes and received a phone call back to say, continue what you're doing. It's worked for the last 28 years. We'll leave it the way it is. And this is the sort of stuff that we're dealing with, and, and I'm sorry to dribble on about that, but we've got a state forestry on the Great Dividing Range that nobody wants to take any notice of or do anything about it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I sometimes get bash your head up against a brick wall, but 
that's what we're dealing with. And again, I'll, I'll say it again, the primary producers wear the burden of every single thing they to incompetent to deal with them themselves. Yeah, thanks for that response. It was what I thought you'd probably tell me, Councillor. Um, thanks for updating us on that. Uh, I'm going to grandstand Councillor Erkin, sorry to tell you. Um, acknowledge the State Government's Energy and Job Plan, or Renewable Energy, and that's all great. And that's all great. Um, that's going to save our economy, apparently. I've read our draft Wide Bay Regional Plan. Don't see much in there about biosecurity in terms of its importance to agriculture, sadly and disappointingly. Um, when is someone in government going to t acknowledge and take seriously the fact that the future of our economy, and bank economists will tell you this if you listen to them, the bank economists in this country are saying that in 20 and 30 years' time, it will be food and fibre exports that will underpin the growth of this economy. When is someone in government going to take that seriously in our region and other regions? And taking it seriously means building better roads, not expecting councils to do all the heavy lifting, number one. Number two, providing water infrastructure to our ag sector and to our food manufacturing sector. And number three, getting serious for once and for all about biosecurity. I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much for your report, um, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Is there any other further? We're getting ourselves heated here. Um, but a great conversation, and I hope it's brought to attention, whether anyone's listening out in the public, but I hope it does come to someone's attention and they, and they pick the ball up or someone picks the ball up with this and runs with it because you're right, Mr Mayor. Um, yeah, they're, they're not prepared to do anything with our local road infrastructure which means connectivity to get our freight in and out of this. Um, we've just had a lengthy conversation about the industrial estate. Councillor Jones has alluded to it months and months ago about the, the savings on freight companies where they can run B-doubles, and the list goes on and on and on. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a major major conversation point, that's for sure, and not many are doing much about it. That being said, we'll wrap up uh, 9.1 with... Uh, my compliance environmental health portfolio, I've moved that. They were all in favour. Thank you, Carrad. Unanimously, could I suggest and, uh, we break perhaps for a five or ten minute recess. It is close to four o'clock. It's been a long day and a quick cup of tea. Would somebody like to move? Mayor Otto, thank you. Seconded Councillor Potter. And we'll come back in, uh, say, ten minutes' time. Thank you. Okay, welcome back from our recess. Uh, thank you. Quick cup of tea. We have a mover to move back into Mayor Otto, second to Councillor Potter. All those in favour? Thank you. We will move on. I can appreciate the time of the day. Ladies and gentlemen and the staff and everybody behind the scenes, we're under 9.2 on page 110, Natural Resource Management Operational Update. Um, and it just states that the officer's recommendation that the Natural Resource Management Operational Update be received for information. Do we have a mover on that? Councillor Duff, thank you. Second to Councillor Erkins. Any comments or conversation? No, we're happy with that one. All those in favour? Unanimous, thank you very much. Moving on to 9.3, Environmental Waste, which is on... Uh, waste Service Operational Update on page 113, and it is very similar, just that, the recommendation that the Environment and Waste Services Update be received for information. We have a mover for that. Councillor Potter, thank you. And a seconder, Councillor Erkins, thank you. We have any commentary on that? No. All those in favour? Thank you. Unanimous. Item 10, Compliance, 10.1, Abandoned Vehicles on page 116. Mayor Otto. I'm sorry, Mr Chairman. Um, I'm probably better off in that chair because I don't talk so much, do I? But, um, yeah, thanks, Mr Chairman. Uh, look, I'm just keen to move a procedural motion to move this one into closed. Sorry, Mr CEO. Uh, under section 254J-G, on the basis that the council... I believe has a commercial arrangement in relation to the collection of some abandoned vehicles. And I would like to see us discuss this matter in a closed session um, by using section 254J-G of the 
um, of the, of the uh, local government regulations? Yeah, Mayor, may I suggest then that we procedurally, so when you move it, that it be added to the closed agenda yeah, under, under the section, but also move it then but to the back. So it comes after 15.1, so then we yes. can deal deal with both close at the same time. If, if yeah, that would be great. Thanks, be Mr good. CEO. So if I could move that, that it be moved to be dealt with in the confidential section after 60, after after six, after 15.1 in the confidential section under 254J-G. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just um, I sent through a um, question on notice to CEO Mark about an issue that I have in um, in Mergen. It goes. It's been an ongoing issue in a street in Mergen, Kreb Street, and, and it's there's a whole there's about four or five um, like cars that are abandoned type cars in the backyard, and it's it, it's a visual amenity in my view, and I'm just wanting to know, the lady, I've put in numerous customer requests and other people have put in requests, and it just comes back that, there's, that really there isn't, it's nothing that, it's, that, our, um, that our Excuse me, point of order, we've actually finished the discussion on the abandoned vehicles, haven't we? Because haven't we moved that well, to the session? Well, that's been moved yeah, in the confidential. Yeah, yeah. That, now I'm talking about it. The Are you doing a notice of motion? I actually then? sent this through as a question on notice to, to CEO Mark. And see, I have just asked CEO Mark, is it okay to raise it here? Where do I raise it? And he said here. Oh, do you, sorry. Yeah, you could do it as part of 10.1. It really could have been done as part of the um, operational reports as well, Mayor. It would probably be just as quick. Uh, they flick the question through to, and I'm looking at Peter and Daryl. Um, so if, Basically, the crux of it is is uh, there's some abandoned vehicles on a property and what's being done about them. Yeah, just uh, mm. and I put it on a, as a question on notice a, as to report to be brought back as to why that's just all allowable, why our lo local law is not being enforced on that. What is there an issue around um, the local law? Or why is it not being enforced? Yeah, through you, Mr Chair. Um, yeah, I've had... Um my staff have a look at that particular one um, and I think since 2016 there's been 10, 10 requests around that car bodies on the property um, and for whatever reason historically they've been closed out. There isn't currently a, a request in the system for that property regarding abandoned vehicles or the unsightly. Um, the most recent uh, customer request came through in August last year. So, um, th thank you. That's why I've raised it now because it's come back to me, and I've thought, well, I need to put. It's no good just going through this continuous customer request system. I need to raise it in the chamber. And through you, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to take it up with my, my compliance people, and um, yeah, we can go and revisit the property and just see what the state of play is and what action we can take. Thank you, Manager thank you. Brooks. Uh, that being said. Uh, and I guess if that is a question or notice, do we need to take that into confidential, Mr. CEO? No, no. It's 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 we we have asked in the past, and do appreciate it when people send because it's no different to a question off the floor, except we at least got it in ahead. We're in the compliance section. It was the vehicle section, so it's its natural spot. Now the the fact that the report's being moved into closed. Okay, that's that's fine. That's procedural. But yeah, the question was asked and it was answered. As in, there's been multiple questions today asked. So uh, again, and I do appreciate when uh, people flick them through in advance because we can get them out to the to the relevant managers so they've got some idea they're coming. Okay, you happy with that, Councillor Duff? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chair. Okay. That being said, we we'll move along on to 10.2, local law backyard burning on page 117. And the summaries council has requested a report be brought to this meeting on a number of local law three community and environmental management complaints relevant to backyard burning. And the recommendation is there that the report be received. There's the background information there for everybody uh, to read. I'm sure you've read it. And upon investigations, verbal warnings, written warnings, compliance notice and penalty infringement notice. 
Uh, we have a mover of that. Councillor Potter, thank you. Seconder. Seconder, Councillor Mayor Otto, thank you. Commentary, Councillor Potter. Yeah, I'd just like to ask a question with regards to the um, the enforcement and that. So we've got um, a verbal warning, written warning, compliance notice and penalty infringement notice. So if there are multiple of these over a period of time, so would each particular um, complaint regarding a backyard fire be um, done on their own merit or is this... So if they did one fire and they didn't put it out, they would get a... Um, if they did a fire they weren't allowed to, they'd get a verbal warning. If they didn't put it out, then again, they would get a written warning. But when would that written warning come? It would come, obviously, after the fire's done. So then when they do another fire in three weeks' time, would that start then with the compliance notice or would it start back again at the very beginning with a verbal warning? Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, yeah, obviously, yeah, each case gets taken on its merit. Um, depends on the scale, intensity frequency and that sort of thing. So it's really at the discretion of the authorised officer um, as to what action they take. But obviously if there are um, repeat complaints regarding um, smoke nuisance from a, a residence, we certainly don't go back to the verbal warning. It sort of escalates up every time we go there. Happy with that, Councillor Erkins. Yeah, that's what I was going to um, ask. Do we actually follow up? Because I've had a guy who has made, he said to me, he's made several complaints. I've put in a complaint to council, and I'd just like to know do, are we actually following up on those complaints? Yeah, certainly any, any request that comes through our customer management system does get followed up and, and does get tracked through our monthly reporting on. How we're going with our CRM? So yeah, certainly. And as I say in the report, there it is triaged, you know, based again against other uh, requests that we do have in there. So obviously, a dog attack or aggressive dogs would take precedence over a backyard burning complaint, but it would certainly be investigated. Thank you, Manager Brooks. May I? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Probably just a bit of a side issue here on compliance and backyard burning is one example. Our staff have to go and deal with. Dogs, they've got to go and do with overgrown allotments, a whole range of things. I'm becoming increasingly concerned with what's happening in our society today um, with a loss of respect for authority, if I could call it that. Now, we saw a pretty tragic event happen recently over in Tara, um, and there seems to be, you know, radicalisation movements happening right all around us. Um, not a matter for today, but I just wanted to probably just share this with the Chamber, that I'll be keen to have conversations in the future. Um, and I'm sure Mr CEO and our people and culture manager are intimately aware, and our workplace health and safety people uh, would be all over this. Um, but I'm keen to have conversations as a council as to how we can better support our compliance officers um, in what is becoming an increasingly dangerous world out there, even in our rural communities. Now, I heard a story recently of a group that broke into a house and got the key and busted open the... Um, busted open the, you know, the gun cabinet and stole all the guns. I mean, that's our local South Bennett region. We're seeing car chases and cars stolen, all sorts of things happening. I'm becoming increasingly concerned about the environment that's out there for our compliance officers to walk in when they're knocking on doors, not knowing what's going to be behind that door. And I'm keen to have conversations. We obviously need more compliance officers, but I'm keen to have conversations about what role our compliance officers play and is the current role putting them at undue risk in the current environment and into the future should we be looking at how we can actually maybe allow them to do their work in a different way that takes them out of putting them... I'll get some ideas, but takes them out of that environment. So, look, just wanted to put that on notice, Mr. C, um, Mr. CEO and Mr Chair, that conversation I'm keen to have in the future because, you know, I, I do worry. Um, I watch the guys and what they do and I do worry about the environment they're in and I would hate to see something happen uh, to one of our staff. So keen to have that conversation in the future to uh, assist and support and keep them yeah. safe. Thanks, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mayor Otto. Yeah, look, and that's, that is a good point. Um, I am led to believe not just here but in other councils when you have compliance officers having to take people of authority, be it police, with you to a, to a scene, uh, that's genuine reason for concern. Safety is a paramount to not just our staff, but everybody, of course. They need to go home to families. 
that afternoon that night as well. All right, thank you. No more comments? No? We all in favour? Go to the vote, all in favour. It's been noted unanimously. Thank you. Chapter 11, 11.1, Waste and Recycling Management Portfolio Report from Councillor Potter on page 118. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Yeah, look, I'm not going to read the whole thing um, as everyone else, but there's a couple of things I just want to point out that um, we're sort of, with regards, we've done 385 visual bin inspections carried out in Anango and Blackbutt. 72% 70 of the recycling bin bins were observed to have no contamination but the biggest contaminant was identified as soft plastics. 53% of the general waste bins were observed as to have some sort of recycling material, with the biggest resource loss is the general, um, in the general waste was cardboard at 28% in those bins. Um, and I do want to point out that there's the new, recy new recycling collections um, contract tender documents released on the 21st of March with tenders closing on the 11th of May. Um, and then I actually would like to point out that the um, development approval for the Maidenwell Transfer, um, the preparation has commenced for development approval for the Maidenwell Transfer Station and the pre-lodgement advice has been received by SARA. Um, then also an application for funding has been prepared under the 22-24 Local Government Levy um, Ready Grant Program. This is a funding of up to 60% is available um, to prepare various landfills for waste level reporting, sites include Mergen and Wondai. Um, and also the illegal dumping, I know we discussed this pretty heavily last time, but you know, during February, um, a total of 14 illegal dumping instances were recorded. Five of them were at the unmanned transfer stations. Seven of them were at road reserves with remaining two at other locations. Eight of the 14 instances were cleaned up by council with one event cleaned up by the alleged offender and um, five a pending further investigation with a total legal dumping record is estimated to be 81,980 81, litres, which is approximately um, 24,980 24, litres or 30 per cent of dumping is cleaned up by council. The existing um, funding for the Waste Compliance Officer is until the 17th of May this year, but a communication was recently received from the Queensland Government offering an extension to the program. And the illegal dumping and abusive use of the unmanned waste facilities is an ongoing issue causing council to spend a lot more resources and money to keep these sites safe for the use of the users and staff. If you have a look at the photos attached, you'll see photos of the illegal dumping of tyres, um, illegal dumping of um, household furniture. At, I think that was at the Maidenwell transfer station, if I remember rightly. And um, if people could just take more note of people who are around and what they're dumping off. But, you know, if we can't, in all seriously, if we can't um, look after our unmanned stations, we might have to do something seriously about them because this is costing us far too money, as much money as council. But with that, I'd like to move that my um, report be received. Thank you. Councillor Schumacher. Um, I recognise we have some 18 transfer stations across the region. Is this where the illegal dumping is largely happening when I read the report? Yep, that's the unmanned sites that we're referring to. Yes, through you, Mr Chair. Um, most of this occurs at the unsupervised um, waste facilities. And um, just a supplementary question, do we have any sort of CCTV or any kind of... Um, those rural cameras or anything set up to try to catch illegal dumping? Uh, we do have some sites, but not all. Okay. Yeah. And are there some sites that are more prone to this kind of activity than others? Uh, three, Mr Chair. Any unsupervised site that doesn't have any restricted access is, is a risk to Council. Yeah, I can see some um, very difficult decisions needing to be made in that regard because Certainly, I recognise the challenges for rural people to, and, you know, actually making sure that they're dumping waste appropriately and that's what our transfer stations are designed for. Um, but to hear there are so many constant illegal dumping is something that we discuss every month in this chamber. It's a real concern. Um, and 
clearly there's no easy solution, but perhaps something I would like to, as a question on notice, probably understand what we've actually spent <coughs> in terms of resources. We've said we've spent, Councillor Potter said in her report, we've spent quite a lot of money in staff clean-up time. Is that something that we track? And would it be easy to report back to Council what, it, what we've actually spent in terms of staff hours on illegal dumping call-outs, or is that complicated because of the funding arrangement? No, well, certainly through you, Mr Chair. And, you know, if we send contractors out to, you know, clean up the tyres or what have you, well, then, you know, those costs should be tracked. I mean, we can... Not too sure how, how far down we, we drill down because generally what happens is once they're at that site, they'll push up the scrap metal, they'll push up the green waste, and then they'll pick up the tyres. So it, it probably isn't itemised to that yeah, degree. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, we can... Have a look and see what I we can do. I don't want to create more work. I just want to understand, you know, this has been a discussion we've had for quite a period of time now. We know those waste transfer stations are co costing us. I prob I just want to <coughs> probably understand the bigger picture in terms of the real impact this is having on our operations and how we're to address that when we've only got such finite resources. You know, if we're sending staff out to clean up other people's mess, they're not actually, they're diverted from other activities. So, yeah, it's a really, it's a tricky one. Thank you for bringing it forward. Certainly appreciate the work the staff do. Looking at some of these photos would be a logistical nightmare to clear up, clean up some of that wire and, you know, miss unused furniture and some of those mattresses, quite frankly, I wouldn't want to touch myself. So really grateful for the people that are out there clean, keeping our community clean and doing this really difficult work. And through you, uh, Mr Chair, I only attended a toolbox talk with the waste collection guys this afternoon and, yeah, they're very frustrated. Um, you know, they turn up the site, you know, it might have been cleaned up two days ago and then all of a sudden we've got tyres or mattresses or other things, you know, that shouldn't be um, dumped at that location. So, um, yes, and, and I know we've got budget discussions coming up, so I think there'll be some, you know, some good conversations around that for next financial year. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Shoemaker and Manager Brooks. I know, um, you know, it's a cost to council, but it's not. It's a cost to our ratepayers. You know, there's 90% of, 99% of people are fairly responsible or very responsible. You look at that and see 14 illegal dumping instances, whether that's 14 people or seven people or one person doing it 14 times, it's really not good enough and I'd encourage people to dob in a dumper you know, and be diligent about how you do that. But, um, yeah, I was up, I went up the top of Mount Maroolan only 10 days ago and the ru rubbish up there was disgraceful. Just sheer ignorance of some people in our community. If they do that in their own environment where they live, it's a um, summary of just what they are. And But we have them and every community has them. But um, it's a cost and a major cost to our ratepayers. So, yeah. Thank you to the staff and the staff there. I can fully understand. I've reported tyres being dumped on roads and rubbish on roads and Mount Laurel and, you know, and I, I do honestly feel for the staff. They've got to run after someone and pick up their rubbish. That's the last thing anyone wants to be doing and it's not hard. It is not hard. Anyway, that being said, thank you, Councillor Potter, for your presentation. Uh, all those in favour, accept it unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on to... 11.2, page 124, Local Disaster Management Portfolio Report. Uh, 124, sorry, did I say 125? 125. 124, Local oh, Disaster Management that. Report. It's just at the Councillor. Potter's Local Disaster Management Portfolio Report to the Council be received. For information, Councillor Potter. Yeah, thank you. There's just a couple of things here. So as part of the Get Ready funding, we're holding business continuity. We've held business continuity sessions with the aged care facilities around the South Bennett region, including Sherberg, Aboriginal community. So these sessions um, were held during the week commencing the 20th of March. And also we recently met with the Minister for Police and Corrective Services and Minister for Fire and Emergency Services, the Honourable Mark Ryan, who was in town, giving out some well-earned awards to some of our locals. So we actually discussed the local disaster management group and how well we all work together, especially with some of our larger stakeholders. That was a very, very good meeting. So, And I'd like to um, put my report forward and be accepted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Move a second for that. Councillor Jones, thank you very much. All those in favour? 
Unanimous, thank you. Moving on to 12. 12.1 on page 126, Rural Resilience and Disaster Recovery, Parks and Gardens, Property and Facility Management and First Nation Affairs. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, um, Chair, Mr Chair. Just um, quickly, I'll just um, highlight some of the, the QE2 Park project in Mergen is, um, it's been turf laid and concrete footpaths and it's um, still a work in progress. The Wondai Splash Play area was officially open, which was a great event. Um, then um, just there's uh, projects have, been, has, have commenced at Tipperary Flats and uh, Prosson Lookout, the Prosson Railway Park Wieners. That, that project is, hasn't started yet, but it'll soon to be happening. Um, then just uh, we had the local libraries reading the natural... Disaster birdie books. Did every councillor have a chance to read their birdie book? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah to the kids, which was a good. And uh, we also went and saw um, David Young, a psychologist out at Ringsfield House. That was a uh, mental health event, which was very um, well received, I think, by the councillors and also the community who were participating in that. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just I'll just um, move my report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, I'm just just on that one. Just on that QE2 park, I, I would just like to. I'm concerned about the um, concrete slabs, and I did send a, a, an email through to. Um, I just want to alert council that those concrete slabs in QE2 park are, have all got. Um, they're not level. They're not letting water go, and um, I know that we've got. I just like that we invest just to put a, put a um, question on notice about how we're going to address that because I'm concerned about leaving it as is without, um, you know, into the future those are going to be, um, it's going to compromise the, the end result with the water and the shade shelter structures. So I just wanted to question on notice as to how we're going to address that. Thank you. Press that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just Kathy, just to address that, um, we're in consultation with Concrete who did the works there, um, and we've come up with a resolution that we're just going to grind them top two slabs flat, which will eliminate the the water holding issue, and they will be resealed and repainted the same colour as the pathways at the moment. And all five shelters will be getting the same ceiling on them, so they will all look the same. All slabs will end up appear the same at the end of it. So that's, yeah, that's where we're going with that one, to eliminate that issue. Thank you. That's um, good to know that we have a solution. So I was thinking, I didn't know where we were going to go with it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Manager Mel. And, and I know w w at different times in Mergen, and it had rained, I think Councillor Jones, myself and yourself, Councillor Duff, had had many conversations with people just in relation to that. So that's a really good outcome and um, a pretty big job to undertake by the people that did it to fix up the level playing field that they now have to work with. Mayor Otto. Thanks, Mr Chair. Yeah, I know Councillor Erkins raised concern about the concrete jungle that was QE2 Park. I think I said at the time, wait until the grass goes in. I think if you go for a drive past now and see the green grass in there, it looks, quite, it looks, it looks really good. And I just wanted to say, um, to the staff and the people involved, the contractors, uh, it is looking good. And uh, congratulations. I think it's a re really well job well done. Thanks. If you could pass it on to the team, General Major May, it's made a huge difference to the presentation of QE2 Park. And I think they've got a really good balanced outcome uh, with shade, with greenery. There's still a few trees to go in. But I think overall it, uh, it's been a good result. It's a good outcome. Yeah. And I've had a lot of good feedback from the Mergen community. So thanks very much, Mel, everyone involved. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. Chip.
Uh, I just wanted to um, to raise the uh, when we had the meeting on with the mayor and the councillors with the Wando community, there was issues raised, and I actually went with um, a lady to have a look at the um, Mikel Park, the finish at Mikel Park, and I just wanted um, a question, I guess, on notice as to how how we're going to address the fact that it, it wasn't finished properly, like it, there's still issues around the. Um, bottom sections, the concrete's got like stains on it, there's, there's issues that were raised there. Just maybe a report back as to what we're doing about, about that one. And also wanted to know about the Kingaroy Teal Kilkeven Rail Trial, that funding money, what's happening with that? That um, How far advanced are we in getting something happening with that money that we, I think there's about $600,000 that we have in a grant? Yeah, uh, through you, Mr Chair. I might take the second question first because I actually received an email yesterday just from the um, department confirming that we are um, going to get that funding. So we've yeah, got funding agreement to come through and yeah, we just got advice uh, yesterday. Um, and Mikel Park, yeah, I might hand over yeah, to Mel. Back to Mikel Park. Yeah, I've been in contact with the cleaners after that meeting. Um, and yeah, and, and they're going to go through and do thorough cleans, and we've fixed up um, a couple of items already that, that were noted. And yeah, steam cleaning of the floors is going to happen, the tiles areas. Um, we're installing a tap down at Kingo Park, which will allow them, them to have more freedom to get water to hose out those areas and wash the floors. And yeah, Sam, we're just working through the other issues at the moment, so we are actually in there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Councillor Shoemaker. Um, thank you. I just had a question um, in relation to, it's on page 137, Government Land Register Surplus Declarations. Surplus Declarations, all state-owned land is on the Government Land Register. State government agencies are required to declare land sur surplus on the GLR and notify other agencies and councils. And I see there last year, I, ha I haven't noticed this on the report before. So first thing, I'm probably just trying to understand what it means. Um, and secondly, just the Wurulan fire station um, pricked my attention. I had a conversation with the GEM Club president at the um, GEM show on Saturday and he mentioned that they were actually interested in that site for a clubhouse. <coughs> but that there'd been no further consultation or discussion with them. So I just probably a question, General Manager I May, and happy for you to take it on notice or catch up with me later, but I was just curious what that what that actually means in terms of the report and, you know, in terms of the rural and fire station or conversations with the GEM Club, if, it, if they could be reinstated or who I should actually get them in contact with. Um, yeah, through, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we will have to just follow up those specifics. But generally, the the government land, uh, the surplus land register. So if they do identify land that is surplus, they will go through a process, and generally they'll put it through all of the other government departments to see if there is any any um, you know, say if it was say fire, if they've got surplus land, they'd be asking if anyone else had any need or requirement for that before it could be um, released to the to the um, public market. But yeah, I, I can follow up that specific one because that was from sort of 12 months ago or getting close to that um, on the fire station and see where, where that is at and whether it is available for a, a club to make an approach. Yeah, thank you. And just with that Crofton Street black butt, like I had a bit of a look on the map, um, just wondering if that block might actually be suitable for a um, social or affordable housing um, Project. Yeah, it's, yeah, we just have to take that one on notice. Not familiar with the block, but yeah, can certainly investigate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Councillor Duff. Um, just uh, some more questions. Thank you. Just wanted to know, I'm just concerned in um, QE2 Park in the Jubilee uh, um, where we did that, the tree planting, there seems to be at least three to six trees that are, are not, that look like they might actually die. So there, there's some that have really gone well, but there's, I'm just concerned about, yeah, I've, I've counted three 
and it looks like even six, up to six, just wanting to um, maybe put that as a question or notice as to what we're going to be doing about those, whether we're going to replace them or whether they haven't taken or why they are looking very, very um, concerning. That's one. And the other one is I just want to know with the high pressure clean, what's happening with that? Because I do have a, a, a motion that I've actually sent through um, through you, um, Chair, just on what I think needs to happen with that high pressure cleaning. But where are we at with that one? Yeah, through Mr. Yeah, we would take those trees and I'll just have to follow up with the team and see um, yeah, what, what is the situation there. And I might let G and me and take the um is that the high pressure cleaner foot pass you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, through uh, through the chair we'll be looking at the high pressure cleaning process as part of our budget on the nineteenth of April. So it's a discussion we've had with the end of how we take that forward over the longer term, so um and how that's resourced. So um Question though, Council, is that in relation to Mergen who needs a high pressure clean or? Just, um, we, uh, just wanted to, it says here the trial, a second street oh, right. sweeper, that just what what are we doing there? Yeah, so my understanding is Leanne has trialled that second machine. I'll probably let her to respond, but I don't think it was overly effective. Um, hence why we'll, we're happy to work through that at the budget meeting. What that, there's probably, uh, there's probably a way that we can do it and, and we'll put that on the table. Yeah, I might just add to that, yeah, Mr Chair. Yeah, so we, we have trialled that second machine and, and found it that not very successful either. So we are actually, that's something we wanted to come back and talk to Council through the budget on, on how we do approach this, um, the street cleaning. So, yeah, there's a combination of factors there. But, yeah, we certainly weren't as happy as we would have liked with, this, with the second clean. So, yeah, we, we, we are coming back to Council with the budget I mean, April on that one. Thank you, Manager. I may... Happy with that, Councillor Duff. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I wanted to move a um, motion, but I think after we vote on this report, yes. So no more commentary on that. We'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Oh, oh sorry. Um, thanks, Mr Chair. Just um, wanted to again acknowledge the Parks and Gardens team, teams across the South Burnett. Uh, I think that our, particularly our CBD areas where they've made their real focus, you know, we made that clear to them. We'd like them to focus on our uh, CBD areas. They've taken that on board and they're doing a great job. Um, I don't drive through many, too many regions these days that present their townships the way our parks and gardens, gardens teams are presenting ours. So congratulations to everyone involved. Um, our towns are looking the best. I've seen them in a long, long time. So thanks very much to everyone there. If we could pass that on, please. General Manager O'May um, from our council. Uh, Tingara Hall, um, I know it's been probably about uh, seven months or so since we were out there and had that meeting at the school. I just wanted up, uh, I know though we've got, we've had um, resource, you know, we've been short on staff in this space. Um, GM, I'm probably just happy to take that as just a flag that perhaps maybe we just could update the next meeting, maybe next month would be, would be great if we could. Thanks, Mr. CEO. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor Otto. No further commentary. We'll go to the vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Chair. I'd just like to move a motion that the committee recommends to Council that we call for tenders to do a high pressure clean in our designated towns of the CBD footpaths and gutters, including cleaning of bins on a monthly basis commencing September 2023, and that the Village of Possum be done on an annual basis. Like to move that motion. Thank you. Councillor Duff, we have a seconder for that. Mayor Otto. Speakers, thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, as um, General Manager Meehan has said, we're uh, going to try and move a way forward with this. And I think that we, it's um, an opportunity now to get to go out to tender and even to at least find out what that cost would be to have these. Um, streets clean on a monthly basis. I think that we have, you know, we've got the King Road Streetscape, we've got the Mergen footpath, we've done it up, we've got all these beautiful towns and CBDs and things, but it's the cleaning that's the issue. And I, I'd just like to see us uh, at least go out to tender and get some quotes on what it would cost to have contractors do it. Thank you. Further speakers, Mayor Otto. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think this is actually the very first item that's 
listed under section two of our corporate plan is um, programs to maintain to a high standard our CBDs. Um, if you look at the KTP and King Arroyo, the contractors did a first class job there and um, the, um, the guys that did the contractors that did the surfacing has just come up magnificent. So it's just, it looks a treat. Um, so congratulations to everyone involved. But um, I think it's, uh, we're good at building things. I'd like to see us to become really good at maintaining them as well. And I just think that our CBDs now, we've invested a lot of money in them. We've got a bit of work to do on the Nango um, yet, but hopefully it'll be, one day on the Nango will be the next cabs off the rank um, in time to come. But I'd like to support this. I've, I've had a look at what some of the other regional councils are doing. Um, and some of them are using this high pressure, uh, high pressure water spray clean um, that they do periodically that cleans out the gutters, does the footpaths. Obviously, there's timing issues around that um, in terms of when it's done, late nights, early mornings by contractors. But it does seem to be very effective. Um, so unless there were technical reasons not to do it, from what I've seen, it seems to be a better way to deal with it than the street sweepers. Um, so I'm keen to pursue this and have a bit of a deeper dive and have a look at it as an option. Um, but uh, just my views, yeah, thanks, um, Mr Chair. <laughs> Thank Chair. you, Mayor Otto. Yeah, Councillor Jones. Yeah. Um, not, I don't disagree with what you're asking or what you're proposing to do because Mergen, Blackboat, Kingaroy, everybody, every town, village, Proston, Cumbia, they all need to be looking, looking clean. But is it appropriate to call for a tender to do a high pressure clean when you don't know that you're given the contract yet? Like that, that resolution doesn't read right to me. If you're calling for tenders, you should have a contract or some sort of a proposal or something that you're actually tendering on. So how is it fair to, as a private, private person supplying this pressure clean, to ask them to tender if there's no guarantee they're going to get the contract? Or are you saying that we're going to definitely do that? Councillor Duff. So every time we go out to tender, we don't necessarily have to accept the tenders. It just gives the people opportunity to quote. So, so you're actually saying that you want them to quote so that they tell you, and then you're not going to say, you're well, going to tell them that you're just tendering on nothing. We just want that information. Well, so, well if, we, if we're happy with it, we would put it in the budget. But otherwise, we're not going to, if we, if we go to the budget and we, don't, we haven't got something to, Say well, it, it, are we going to? Is it is it affordable? Unless we go out to tender, we're not going to know. I don't disagree with it that you do need to know, but is it appropriate? Is that the way that we do? We call for tenders before we even know whether or not we're going to um, have a because uh, you're tendering on a contract, and I would be a bit dirty if I went to all the trouble of putting a tender together and then come in and said, oh, well, we're not going to accept that, we just want the information. Well, but, but, but we're, we're continually tendering, putting out tenders, and if it's not, if we can't afford it, we don't But don't we ask, it. don't we normally, through you, Chair, don't we normally ask for a tender with something that we want someone, to, that we know we want someone to do? I would have thought, I would have thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, managers or Mr CEO, that um, you would have some guidelines in a tender process um, because what are you tendering on? You're tendering on a high clean pressure clean in designated towns uh, and then Proston on an annual basis. Um, I, I think there's a bit of work to do in that space before you call on a tender. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Yeah, if I could say, Mr Chair, this certainly wouldn't be the first time we've done this. I know Manager Leanne, I think you can recall, has called tenders for things to get pricing historically, where we've had to sort of then bring that to council to consider. So I think we have used the tender process to get pricing. Um, no, that was more for services. Um, I do recall we've done that. I know um, that we have from time to time, but I'm not sure if we break any rules, but we'd certainly have to give our staff time to scope it out and make it clear as to what the scope of the work was, works were going to be and what the expectation in terms of the outcome was going to be. I would have thought GM then, but... Uh, I mean, I think we have done this before, to be honest. Um, obviously, uh, keen to hear from GM, but... Yeah, Manage, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I don't manage a man. Um, that, uh, yeah, happy for your input. Yeah, through the chair. Um, just just with um, suggestion for council, um, both Leanne, Pete and myself and Kevin had the intent that we would walk through um, 
the service cleaning for both infrastructure and parks and gardens at the 19th and the 21st budget meetings. Just um, if you wanted to delay that until we walk through those service levels and costs, probably just then you can have a look at what that is. We do have an indicative price on what it costs us to do a contract claim. Um, so we do have a square meterage rate that we have available to us, but um, there's probably just a couple of considerations that I would like to walk through with council and then you can decide which way you wanted to go just for, before we um, get 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 gridded in, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, happy to go down that pro that process. I just want to just get something happening so that we, when we are in the budget discussions, we have some some um, something that we can actually do because I really think this needs to happen at some, in some way, shape, or form. Thank you. So happy to. Well, just put um, uh, withdraw you... the motion or. Sorry, Mark. Uh, sorry, it was going. Yeah. There's buttons at 20 paces. Um, you just leave it lay on the table until the April Budget Committee meeting. Yeah. Yes, happy to um, move a procedural motion that that motion lay on the table. So can I not have a speak if it's too late to talk then? Councillor Erkins. I just want to um, say that there's a lot of different surfaces that we're looking at. So, you know, I don't think what will necessarily work on the footpaths here will necessarily work in Nanango because Nanango has no seal on their paving. So, you know, I think it'll take more than um, a gurney to get... It will take some sort of um, detergent, biodegradable, of course. <laughs> well, Mr. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Um, Chair, point of order here, I think that the procedural motion should be seconded and put to the vote. Uh, I'm not trying to guillotine the councillor, but yeah. um, I think the procedural motion should be put to the vote. Yep. Um, because otherwise we're going to be here all day. Yeah. Five no. o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Otto. Yeah, moved Cathy Duff that this item lay on the table. We have a seconder for that. Uh, councillor Potter, thank you. All those in favour? Yep, unanimous. Thank you. All right, 13, 13.1. Is on page 139, Memorial Park, Kingaroy Dog Park relocation. As stated there in your agenda, the paperwork in front of you, the summary that during the development of the master plan of Kingaroy Memorial Park, it was resolved to investigate an alternative location for the dog park and the officer's recommendation is that the report is received and council investigates funding options for future dog park development at Lions Park, Kingaroy, and reports back to a future standing committee. Do we have a mover of that? Councillor Potter, seconder. Councillor Duff, thank you. Speakers, Councillor Potter. Yeah, thank you. Look, the only problem I have with this particular location is there is no parking facilities right beside... Um, if we do build it, there, there will be no parking facilities right beside the gate. And when we were discussing with the um, with a lot of the different people that use the dog park in Kingaroy, the best thing about that dog park that we've already got um, is the fact that they can park near the gate so they're not walking their dogs um, a distance um, you know, through people because the problem here is if they park, they'll probably have to park around the corner and walk through that park section and to get to the park section where the people and kids playing to get to the dog park a lot of the times because there's not much parking on the main road outside. And that's going to be my biggest, um, I think, thing against this particular position, which is why I did prefer Barron Street. So I think that's something that should be looked at when we do discuss this or go for grants and things like that. So um, if that's possible to be looked at um, somehow, I don't think there's any way we could do um, parking on site. But I just think that this is something that um, just because it came out on top, it may still not be the best, um, the best particular one. And I would like to know if we actually spoke to the, the dog groups in, to, in this with this particular one, all the people that do use the dog park already in Kingaroy, and um, whether they had a particular say um, in, in this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Further comments, Mayor Otto? Yeah, I certainly concur with Councillor Potter. I think we get a lot of parking on street there in front of Bill Hull and also from SB Care across the road. That's a fairly um, high demand parking area there. Um, I was just wondering, Councillor Potter, whether sort of on the soccer field side of Lions Park. Is there any land there where we could actually, people can park around um, sort of on that 
western side of the current Lions Park infrastructure, there's a lot of open space land there. Um, or General Manager of May, is, is that an option? Well, I, I like the Lions Park location, yeah. but I just think the parking is an issue, whether we could move it over a bit, because uh, it's a lovely big open area there. But uh, you're yeah, keen to hear your thoughts, GMMA. Thanks, yeah. uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Manager uh, May. Yeah, um, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so, so this this is the um, result of reporting back on the results from the um, the community consultation on this matter. So we haven't actually on, on the, the car parking hasn't been um, included in in that. So the costings that that are um, indicated there are. To, to relocate the dog park, but if we were going to add additional car parking, that would certainly be possible, but it would be something that council would need to look at at the time and, and, and allocate appropriate funding for, for that. But, yeah, I, th I think clearly from the results, you could see there isn't a, a, a perfect solution or there was a yeah, different difference of opinions for each of them. So, yeah, it, it, I think it will be the... Um, but, yeah, so it's basically back for, for, for councils. That was the results of the um, community consultation and... Yeah, back for further investigation. Thank you, uh, Manager O'May. Oh, would it be a fair assumption that perhaps we leave this on the table for further investigations as to an area suitable? Like I know it states that funding options for future dog park, but leave it on the table until we perhaps investigate an area that may be suitable, perhaps further down in the park area. Is, is there anybody? Councillor Shoemaker? Um, yes, thank you. Look, to be honest, I'd be a bit hesitant in building a new dog park. I know the report said $170,000 and to factor this into our next 10-year um, CAPA Works program. Um, to be honest, I can't see our council committing to delivering on this dog park in this term of council. Um, I think the feedback that's been received in relation to the Memorial Park and the discussion that was had has put the Apex Park site um, up for discussion. And I've had a number of conversations with community members who actually think it's a great idea because so many people pass through as tourists. They stop and they go to the peanut van and many people travelling with dogs might use the dog park. I personally am of the view that many of our other parks around Kingaroy actually require more further investment um, and repair. Um, before we would even consider a greenfield site or developing a dog park. And the Memorial Park plan is going to take a number of years, a number of different funding options to deliver on that vision. We're not removing the Memorial Park dog park tomorrow. It will continue to remain. So at this point in time, I don't want to tie up resources looking at other locations when the reality is we don't have the funding to build a new dog park tomorrow. I actually agree with the original motion that we investigate future funding options when they become available. And for now, we accept the advice which has come from people that we've engaged with through the Memorial Park planning process. We accept that advice. They've suggested Lions Park. We're not suggesting going forward and building a concept plan or a scope or an, an actual design for the dog park, we're just saying that site's been selected. Um, I don't think it's worthy of tying up resources to do more work on this at this point in time when the Memorial Park site still is remaining open and won't be changed for some time now. I think it's good feedback that we tuck away in our back pocket for when funding or options to develop a new dog park might become available. But when it comes to the reality of it, there's 24 parks across Kingaroy. And there are certainly many of them, I know, that um, require investment. And I'm a, whilst I love my dog and pets, and I certainly recognise people live in small backyards and they need space to run their dogs and animals, um, I also think I'm a big believer in people before pets, I have to say, and I think we need more open space for families and youth and I'd much rather see us invest our time and energy in those outcomes than a dog park, which I know we won't complete in this term of council. That's my view. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. Mayor Otto? Yeah, just in response to that, I just want to clarify that the recommendation, I think, at this stage, General Manager, is that we receive this report and that we consider um, that we investigate funding options for future dog parks. So I guess if there was a funding pool that come along we could then um, 
explore that. But uh, I think it would be um, valuable, though, just to have at least conceptually an idea as to where the community would like to see that dog park. I'm not suggesting that we should go into incurring any costs around designing anything, but at least if we can sort of have a location flagged. We know ten generally has community support for it. That seems to be Lions Park or somewhere there nearby uh, here. So, um, yeah, look, I'm supportive of this recommendation. I think if we can flag somewhere, have it in the back pocket, as you say, if some funding comes up, we'll in a position to at least apply at that stage. Yeah, thanks, uh, Manager. Thanks, Thank uh, you, Mr. Mayor. Chair. Otto, any further comment? Otherwise, we'll go to the vote. Councillor Chair, um, given the commentary, so it was just a thought of us. If we're just doing investigation without, do we just drop Lions Park out? So future investigation of funding options for a future dog park. Yep, Councillor Potter, are you happy with that? Councillor Duff? Yep. Thank you, Mr. CEO. You have that in front of you, the report we received in Council investigates funding options for future dog park and reports back to a future standing committee. No more comments on it. We go to the vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you. 14, 14.1 on page 156. Property facility and ma property and facility management. The summary of the region-wide amenity buildings inspection program was conducted to provide an understanding of the overall condition of this asset class and establish an objective condition rating for each building. And the officer's recommendation is that the committee recommends to council that the six facilities rated seven or higher are included in future capital works programs for replacement or refurbishment as outlined in the schedule below. Now you've got that in front of your councillors. Um, I have a mover, Councillor Potter, second to Councillor Duff. Speakers, Councillor Duff. Uh, I just wanted to flag, and I've um, talked to the other councillors before, including particularly Councillor Potter, that um, that um, park in Mergen, and I've had school teachers and different ones that have had the, uh, taken kids down to that skate park in Mergen. There is absolutely no toilet there. And um, we've talked about... Uh, we're talking about toilets here. At some point, there's, go there's going to be a need to put a toilet in that skate park because the it's growing. There's more like there's barbecue areas there, and 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 they're actually going across and trying to use the council toilets or anything that they can. So I just wanted to flag that. I know that these are the priorities, but I just wanted to put it out there that at some point we're going to need to address putting a toilet of some description in that skate park area in Mergen. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Duly noted. Councillor Schumacher. Um, thank you. I certainly just wanted to acknowledge the staff and the team for the work they've done in relation to this report. It's an enormous undertaking to actually go and manually inspect every one of our toilet facilities. And to be honest, I'm really grateful for the report because I didn't realise I knew we had had a lot of them, but I didn't actually realise just how many um, until I read over this report. It's quite alarming to see so many are actually almost at their end of life or have been recognised um, as high priority facilities that are needing um, investment. It's also alarming to see that there's only two facilities with compliant shower facilities for people with disabilities being both the Narkin and Wondai. I found that quite interesting. Um, it's just a reminder, I guess, to council how, how much work really is needed to be done in this space. I know over the past 12 months we've invested in some facilities in Wondai, um, which I did go and visit on the weekend that are looking beautiful, so thank you to the team for that. Um, but I know that there's clearly much more work to be done. Just in relation to, on page 157, there's one, two, three, four, five, six um, uh, bathroom facilities there that are requiring, that are registering on your condition rating seven and above. And you've put some preliminary prices there in terms of, um, I just wanted to understand, are they to actually refurb or renew those facilities um, 
that have been listed, General Manager, I know. Yeah, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, a, a mixture um, there. So, it, but generally they are at um, pretty well end of life. So, something like say four hundred thousand is is basically a complete um, yeah, rebuild. Just... One's a butter factory park. They are a modular unit sort of thing, so that that they would come in. So, yeah, most of those are, um, and, and like the cemetery ones are only only small small units. So, yeah, these these are basically for. I would think most of those ones are basically replacement or, or substantial refurbishment, like the one in Kingaroy Lions Park is, is, yeah. And just with the map that you've put put there on page... Yeah, sorry. I'm trying so hard to go digital, trying to save the trees, but it's, it's a learning for me. Um, just you've got some numbers there. I didn't quite understand like little people symbols with like 39, 38, 31. Are, are they the numbers, the, the facility number? Or, or is, yeah, is that relevant to the number of people who are visiting? Yeah, I just wanted to understand that map. Uh, you had the different, all of the facilities listed on page 159 and then... It had like little people symbols and little numbers next to them, and I just wanted to confirm: is that is that daily? Sorry, if I no, I think, missed it. Three, oh. Mr. Chair. I think think that's just a register. So they were all just, just numbered at each. They just have the cemetery ones have registered. Like, so there's one to five in the cemeteries, and then one to to um, forty eight. So it's just a number to yeah, to cool. allocate them. It doesn't. I thought that yeah. might have been the case, but I wanted to confirm because I was thinking far out. Um, <laughs> Some of these facilities really do get... Yeah, essentially, just a legend yeah. to yeah, identify. it's just yeah. a legend. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the report. I think it's really valuable information that informs future decisions about what to fund and look forward to the um, funding, the renewal of these assets, recognise how important they are to our community. And certainly from the feedback in Wandai, uh, we've learned firsthand how important these facilities are to our community. They take great pride in the way they look and the way our region's presented. So thank you for the work on this. I think it puts us in a good place to make some decisions about capital funding um, into the future. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. Councillor Erkins. Thank you, through you, um, Chairman. Just looking at the, um, the numbers, I'm looking at Nanango, Scott's car park, because that's a toilet that I've been in a number of times, and I see it's rated four, and I see then that the Lions, the Kingaroy Lions Park is rated seven. And I can tell you I know which one of them, in my opinion, is a much more pleasant toilet to go into, and it's not the Scots Car Park one, which is not really that older a, a toilet. But you know, if you look at the doors starting to rust, like it's not it's not in good condition. And a lot of those toilets that come in in I don't know if they come in packs or whatever, but they're pretty cheap toilets. It, well, cheap looking toilets. They're not cheap in in um, uh, what's name. And I personally think that people. Stopping at public toilets, one of the things that is most important is that they are clean. And I do know that the, the, the better they're painted, the easier they are to keep clean. Um, if they've got something on the floor, it's easier to keep that clean. You know, like the toilet in Nanango, the Scots one that I'm particularly talking about, has a concrete floor that's very, very stained when you go in there. You know, you've got to be very careful that you don't drop anything onto the floor. And, you know, but that is that is true, you know. So I just don't know. We're, look, we're quick to say, you know, replace some of these toilets, but they honestly are. They've got a little bit of character about them, which are much, much better than those prefab bloody things you stick in. And they're awful. It's like going into a jail when you go into those little things with the walls and the concrete. You know, why don't we look at the ones that we've got? Why don't we look at what we can do to them 
to make them, you know, we're an old area. Why don't we look at doing them up and making them something that are, that are clean and, you know, nice to stop at? Not all exactly the same toilet as everywhere you go. And they're pretty, um, well, awful. Just Thank my, you, Councillor. Councillor Schumacher. I just had one question, um, just in relation to future management of these and, and the cost. You know, 53 facilities, when you think about daily operational, when we're cleaning and maintaining 53 facilities across the south of the net, that, that must come, you know, I look forward to digging into that a little bit further through the budget process. Um, probably a question to you, General Manager O'May. Has there ever been any discussion, dare I ask, about rationalising some of these facilities or actually considering whether they are best placed, whether they are used, whether we are better off actually reinvesting in, you know, rather than having four facilities in the town, having two really great facilities? And I know that comes, you know, with a number of conversations that have to be had around that, but... The reality is it must be costing our ratepayers an absolute packet to clean and maintain 53 toilet facilities across the south of the net. Did you have any advice in that regard? Well, oh, yeah, through, through the chair, so I'd have to say, yeah, there probably hasn't been a serious discussion around rationalisation of that, and that's probably, a, um, to be fair, direction from council. There's just never been an appetite to, to go into that and... and um, Yes, it, it does cost, and we we'll certainly can go through that with, with the budget on, on the cost of it. Um, and but yeah, it it, it really is, um, you know, yeah, it, it's like your parks discussion or anything. But yeah, there, there really hasn't been a strong appetite to, to dig in and, and seriously look at, at reducing those. And yeah, would would welcome if that was council was was keen to look at that. Then there there would be some cost savings, but obviously your service level reduces. No, I understand that. It would certainly will be better to understand that through the budget process. I can just see, you know, we're constantly as a council put under pressure around can we save costs, can we save our ratepayers' funding um, whilst this is a very difficult decision. Perhaps when we go through the service level catalogue, you know, these are some things that might need to be considered, um, particularly when you think about the fact we are currently registering a deficit over $5 million. If we're serious about cost cutting, these are some of the hard decisions that may need to be considered um, going forward. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. And then we've had this discussion before in the likes of some of these facilities where they might only be 10 kilometres from a town, uh, either side, north or south or east or west of them. So, yeah, conversation. Further comments, questions? No? Happy to go to the vote. All those in favour? Unanimous, thank you very much. 14.2 on page 162, the Tingura Sports Ground Toilet Upgrades. The summary is installation of a new distribution board and two weatherproof lights and an increased supply of water to the Tingura Sports Ground Toilets as part of the sports ground and the officer's recommendation is that the committee recommend to council that one, Electricity upgrades to the distribution board and two weatherproof lights be installed under Council's operational budget. And two, Tingadura Cricket Club to seek sponsorship or funding to cart and supply water to the facility in the short term and to investigate funding a permanent supply of water to the facility long term. Do we have a mover? Councillor Potter, thank you. Second to Councillor Erkins. Speakers? Councillor Jones. Yeah, just trying to keep myself awake, Chair. I just, um, this uh, breakdown here costs into the HDD cost for 63 millimetre. Are we referring to a bore there or what, what are we referring to there? You no, my understanding, Councillor Jones, that will be, and correct me if I'm wrong, managers, that'll be heavy duty pipe, a 63 millimetre. Um, I think you'll find that might be OD, HOD, heavy uh, outside diameter. 63 millimetre pipe for a cost of 73. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, managers, but I assume that's what that is. Yeah, that's pipe break. That's for the water. 
Councillor Jones, you're right there. So that obviously, uh, are we going, are we trying to get a water supply somewhere from across the other side of the road or yeah, what, where are we going to plug into there? I just no, as, as the recommendation states that Tingura Club seek sponsorship or funding to cart water supply to the facility in the short term and to investigate funding a permanent supply of water to the facility long term. I think you'll find those figures there as a report which our staff have done that that would be the cost of pipe to get it uh, across the highway, I'm led to believe. And then the metering assembly, traffic control, contingency. Um, pretty self-explanatory if you've laid pipe before. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair, for the update. I'm very happy with that uh, response. Thank you. Further comments, Councillor Shoemaker? Um, I certainly understand. I've read the report. Um, I've had a look at the toilet facilities when we went to the Vikings cricket game, and I can see, you know, they were there. I can see the issues. I know Councillor Duff had actually hired a portable toilet for the event because um, there wasn't enough water in the facility. And I read in the report that we've installed the pressure pump to try to lessen the filling time. But to be honest, it's a council-owned facility. I'm, I'm very, and I know how hard the Tingura Vikings have worked to restore the pitch and everything in the area. By all means, you know, I think the work around the electricity upgrade um, is great. But I personally am probably a bit nervous about going to the Vikings Club and asking them to seek sponsorship or funding to supply water to, to fill our toilets. Am I reading this right or am I on the uh, page? Are we asking the Manager, am I or, or CEO, they, or I'm assuming Tingura, uh, do they have an arrangement and they lease that? Do they pay a fee there uh, on that sports ground as, as we do with many other entities? Yeah, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so the the recommendation, so the water is the, the toilets are locked and basically only available for the, for the those on the cricket use. And so, so I suppose that was just an opportunity if there was something to, because um, council is currently supplying the water to the um, to the facilities just for the cricket. So if there was an option for the the club to contribute or get funding or, or for that, then we'd certainly welcome that. But essentially, otherwise, it does fall back on council to provide the the water. In terms of how much water we've been providing at that facility, like I see it's about $300 a load in this report. I'm, yeah, probably just curious. Like, I imagine if it's only open for cricket days and in the cricket days that I've attended, there's only, you know, a small group of people that, that attend, you know, they're not hundreds of thousands of people. Um, is that sort of an operational cost that just we didn't cater for or, you know, by all means I think we can always encourage cricket clubs and any sporting club to seek funding to help improve sporting facilities, but I'm just not sure around the actual operational, the burden of trying to provide water for the toilet facilities is, um, it's probably not something that I'd support I, I, at this stage. Yeah, through through the chair, and um, yeah, I suppose so. We it, the trouble area is only a small tank, sort of two thousand litres. They they essentially use what's supplied um, there over the over the afternoon because with the pressure pump, it is refilling. It is they are going through it. But I would suggest we are getting coming to the end of the cricket season, um, and and even that option two of the like we wouldn't be carting water. Um, Weekly because they only have sort of every second home home game. So yeah, I, I think it probably is something that we like. Yeah, we definitely want to do the upgrades to the electricity and um, probably investigate uh, a more permanent supply of water. But in the interim, I think it probably is council can would be able to continue to supply the water for those games, noting that cricket will finish up yeah. shortly, um, and then we can look at it when we into in the start of the new season. Um, um, yeah, thank you, General Manager. I, mean, I, I think just 
removed the Tingara Cricket Club to seek sponsorship or funding to cut and supply water to the facility in the short term and maybe just, you know, leave that council continue investigating what options there might be to for a permanent water supply into the longer term. But that's my view. I think the club's already doing everything they can to raise as much funding as they can to support their initiative and it's having a big impact in the small town of Tingura. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. One of the best things that's happened in Tingura is for the Vikings to start that club up because once they close, and we're still trying to find out the history of it, it's a long time ago, but uh, manager oh, May, the cricket season has finished. The grand final was played some weeks ago and, and Tingura were just unfortunate in an absolute cracking game to only be beaten right at the death. So congratulations to the Tingura Cricket Club and they've done some wonderful work down there in a short time to get up, in, get a club formed and guys on the paddock and get to a final in their first year back after some, we're not sure, 50, 60, 70 years or something. So, yeah. Um, Mayor Otto? Oh, Councillor Erkin, sorry. Um, I'd be more inclined to look at whether Tingura Cricket Club could get sponsorship or funding to buy a bigger water tank. Because to deliver water, you know, a 1,500, I can't even talk in gallons, 1,500 gallon water tank, I think you're probably looking at about $250 to fill that. And if it's just being for a toilet um, during cricket, that, you know, that wouldn't be, you wouldn't be filling that very often. So, um, you know, and I think it's possible that they could get sponsorship if they went to a, a plumbing tank makers or something, they would probably get a, a good price on one. And if they could get um, some sponsorship, that would be probably better for them and better for um, us. So I'd like to encourage that they seek funding or get a suggestion that they seek funding for a bigger water tank. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Lakers. Mayor Otto. Thanks, Mr Chair. I'd actually like to see us leave item two in and just tweak it. I know in discussions I've had with the committee down there, um, one of the things that they're keen to do is access funding and trying to identify a bore site, put in a bore pump and run some poly pipe and actually have a, be in the position to be able to irrigate around the field so that they can keep a fairly good grass surface there. They've got plans to obviously make that a reasonably good facility in time to come. Um, I was just thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could find some bore water um, get a bore in, get some water up for the irrigation, and at the same time have water that could also supply a bigger tank. So I just wonder with the gambling community funds and things coming around now, there's another round out now, I think, uh, where you can get up to $35,000. Could we actually try and, um, I use the terms work with loosely, but work with or give some, some advice and guidance to the Vikings as to how they might be able to access some funding? to actually put in some water infrastructure down there uh, through some sort of a grant program. And they might be able to supplement, as Councillor Erkin said, with some sponsorship. Might be some businesses that want to sponsor and put their name on the tank or something. So I'd like to see us maybe just change that, um, that, that council support thing here at the Cricket Club to seek sponsorship and funding to improve water infrastructure, water access and infrastructure on the site. Um, to me, it just goes back to, you know, um, teach a man to fish. You know, if we can set them up with their own water, they can look after the facility and, uh, and keep it nice and it'll be great for everybody. So um, probably like to put that to the group. Uh, to yeah, thanks, anyway. Mayor Otto. That's certainly a, a great suggestion. There's a, there is a historical bore in Tingura that um, the water quality of it has, has tested is about two and a half to three times what um, our council water is. So I'd be cautious uh, to be, and so long as they're aware that in the event of putting a bore down that the water there is is usable to be able to irrigate or maintain a field. Uh, I know it's going to toilet facilities, be non-potable, and I'll make the comment that in the event of putting a toilet there that's serviced or used by the Tingura Vikings, which is a great thing, and it'll be seasonal, that I'm sure there will be pressure put on to open those toilets to passerbyers on that rail trail. 
uh, even though there is a toilet facility across the road. If there's a toilet block, and I've had that asked of me for the past three years as to why it's not operational, if there's a water tank there uh, and a facility there, there will be some pushback for that to be a community facility. Just putting that out there. I'm fully supportive of the Tsinguru Vikings Club and I'd love to see water and certainly the power there, electricity upgrades. Um, and there's point two states, Council supports Tsinguru Cricket Club to seek sponsorship or, or funding to improve water access and infrastructure on the site. Councillor Potter, Councillor Erkins is mover and second. Are you happy with that? Yep. Yep. Any other comments? Councillor Jones. Yeah, well, I guess short term. What happens if they run out of water at the toilets? Are we asking the uh, cricket club to put the bill for that? Um, yeah, the initial thing was to come in and ask for water uh, for the use of the toilet. So 200, or what is it, 2,500 litres, like they said, will last a little while. But uh, if we don't have, if they're not successful with grant funding or anything like that, uh, they've got no other water, so who's going to foot the bill for um, for filling up the tank to yeah, uh, keep the water there? Good question, Councillor Jones. And as we go to the financial and resource implications on option two, and and manager uh, May weekly delivery of non-potable water of a total of twelve thousand dollars per annum. Is that weekly fifty-two weeks? Because the cricket season only runs for approximately twenty. No, that's 40, 40 weeks. That that's just just a calculation based on yeah, forty weeks. You wouldn't be delivering every every week. No, I... Councillor Erkins, I really think that um, <coughs> supplying a cricket club with water is not really our role. Other, you know, I mean, other clubs they have their ground, and it's up to them then to put their facilities on and do things. I just don't think. You know, we can support them in it. I'm happy to do the, for us to do the lighting. But, you know, the, as I said, I think they can look to do some fundraising and get a grant to put a bigger tank in. And then a tank load of water should last them a fair time. And I just don't think it's up to us to be supplying water. The other places that we go to, they pay for their water. The, um, we went to the um, rugby league at... Wandai, was it? Is it Wandai? Yeah, they do. You know, the um, you know other other places have to pay for their own water. I I just don't think that we should. We can help them put in for grants, but I don't think that. Um, well, Councillor Erkins, at, at the recommendation as it stands out at the moment, and the change has been made to number two, the council supports Tingaroo Cricket Club to seek sponsorship or funding to improve water access and infrastructure on the site. That's the recommendation in front of us there at the moment. Um, in the in the interim, and there will be no crick cricket until approximately September, October. Um, hence, I wouldn't suggest there need to be any water there until then. Councillor Duff? Uh, thank you. I, I support the, the recommendation as, as is there because um, it's just, Megan... Um, Sports Association, they had were having issues with water and they got a, a Jippers gambling benefit grant for 30000 They They've got water now from Baramba Creek. The um, Mergen Bowls Club were having issues with water, so they got funding for, to get some more tanks. So I, I'm really keen to support the Tingura Cricket Club. I, I think they do an amazing job, but certainly to support them to get long a long-term outcome. Thank you, Councillor yeah, Jones. Yes, uh, Chair. Um, totally agree, Councillor Duff, but just remember that uh, the Mergen Sports Association and all that sort of stuff had a lot of issues until they got that, and Council supported them, if you remember correctly. And all I'm asking, if no one's happy to support us purchasing, and I don't think it's going to be anywhere near the $12,000 per annum that's going to be required, but if no one's willing to support the, until these guys get the money, through a grant or whatever to improve their infrastructure, put a bigger tank in or whatever, I'll pay it out of my own discretionary funds. Because it's a council-owned facility for a start. We're only asking the toilets to be open on cricket days. Two and a half, half thousand litre tank should last them a considerable amount of time, like the ladies have said. It's only for toilet use. 
So until this group are actually able to source funding through Jupiter's grant or whatever, I would like to see this council support them because we've done it to every other community organisation in this. And the difference in the Wandai Sporting Club, they have water on tap technically and they just go and flick a switch. It's coming out of the re um, recycled water. Tingura haven't got that option. So I'd like to see that we just put in there to a limit, if you want to put a limit on it, $2,000 a year, that's three or four loads. That's, you know, ten, let's say 10,000 litres. That's 2,500 or 4,000 gallons or whatever it is. So I'd like to see us consider that or put that in there that we, we support them until they get the grants or whatever in the fact to a reasonable amount and I'd be guided by Mal or Pete or someone like that for a conversation because I... They're not asking for much and, you yeah. know, like, I'll pay for it out of my discretionary funds. I'll give them 500 bucks or whatever if I've got it. So I'm happy to do that, but just, just putting it out there. Thank you, Councillor Jones. That being said, do you want to add something to that recommendation? Uh, do you want to put a limit? Do you want to put a quantity on it? Um, and, and I appreciate, yes, this is a club that started and has come back from extinction which you don't see too much of in this day and age. Chair, so, could, I, could I make a suggestion? And, and certainly, without, um, without changing the intent of the Mayor's um, proposed, possible, well, proposed accepted amendment, the original, uh, Lanella, I don't know if you've got it, but the original read, Tingura Cricket Club to seek sponsorship or funding to cart water and supply and da-da-da-da-da. Why couldn't we, and just given the conversation, the council partners with Tingura Cricket Club to seek sponsorship or funding and to cart water and to supply the facility in the short term? So it's a partnership between council and the club and um, whether, we, yeah, and again, we'll end up in this space of helping them out, whichever mechanism we use. But if we just went back to council partners with the Tingura uh, to seek sponsorship opportunities and for funding to cart water. Does that that didn't covers everyone's base, and so because they'll be able to access money we can't, so it'd be really good to help them, and we might be able to access programs that they can't. Thank yeah. Uh, okay. Can, yeah. I, can I play with that, Mr. CEO? Yeah. I guess I didn't want to make the focus here just about toilet water. I want to try and make the focus here a long-term water solution for infrastructure on the site. So I just wonder whether we could actually say council partners with your club to speak to seek uh, sponsorship um, opportunities and external funding to develop water infrastructure water access and infrastructure on the site and to yeah and then and for the supply of water to the facility so i guess there's two things we'd do there we'd partner with them for long term water infrastructure solutions um, to try and find funding for that, as well as um, work with them, because as you're saying, Mr. CEO, just to keep the short-term water supply up until that can happen. Seems to be that's what the committee's looking to do. Yeah, does that sound all right, Mr. CEO? All right, so we have it there. The second point's been changed. The council partners with Thingura Cricket Club to seek sponsorship opportunities and external funding to develop water access and infrastructure on the site and for the supply of water to the facility in the short term and to investigate funding a permanent supply of water to the facility long term. Councillor Potter and Councillor Erkins is the mover and seconder. Are you happy with that? Yep. Any no further comments? Councillor Duff. I'll just um, be 
thinking the wording just needs tweaking to say that we supply the water in the short term rather than seeking partners with them. It's that way it's clear that we supply water in the short term and in the long term we work with them to seek the funding. I just think the wording needs to be tweaked. It's well, I think Councillor Duff, it starts with that, that council partners with Ningua Cricket Club. So um, that's stating that council's partnering with them and that's the supply of the water. So does that mean we pay for it in the short term? That's Because that's that. the intention. Yep. Everybody happy with that? Yep. No further comments. Take it to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you. Carried unanimously. All right. We're on questions or notice at 15.1 on page 169. It's there for everyone to read. The question on notice. Uh, infrastructure Department received the below questions. Question one, what chemical does council council contractors use and at what rate? Uh, that was question one. And question two, in regards to stage one of the Wondor Industrial Estate spend, did any of the users contribute? Question three was, is there remaining available budget within the KTP to provide furniture for the remaining alfresco structures if they are unoccupied? Question four was, when was the last increase and do we expect any further increases? Question five, how many roads are not in the flood assessment program that would be in maintenance program only? And A, do we plan to patrol grade these roads that have already been repaired from flood damage? And B, how many roads are still to be assessed and what is the timeline? The responses are there on the background. Has everybody read their responses? Yep, and everybody's happy with the responses. Questions on notice be accepted. We have a mover. Councillor Duff and a second to Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you. No further commentary. All those in favour? Thank you. Councillor Potter is not here with us just at the moment. That's thank you. That being said, we go to the confidential section. Uh, we don't have anyone in the in the gallery. And we move I move that we go into the confidential section. We have a seconder for that. Councillor Jones, thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Let me give one a minute. Uh, it will be noted that the report be received. Uh, all those in favour? Oh, sorry, mover, sorry. Councillor Jones, second to Councillor Shoemaker, or are you just checking your nose? Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. Moved by Councillor Jones, seconded by Councillor Shoemaker. All those in favour? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. We move on to 16.1 with the installation of signage at Coomba Falls Maidenwell and the officer's recommendation that the committee recommend to Council that install signage to Coomba Falls to ensure members of the public are alerted to the dangers of swimming in the rivers, creeks and waterholes. We have a mover, Councillor Jones, seconded Councillor Potter. All those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you very much. And just before I call a close to the meeting, which is we've, we're 5.58, I take this opportunity to wish all my colleagues, uh, councillors, staff members, managers, a very happy Easter and travel very safely uh, and enjoy your time with family and loved ones. So call the meeting to a close at uh, 5.58. Thank you very much.